quite a haul, Watson. Uh, congratulations. Uh, does it? Dr. Watson, you're under arrest. But, 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 this, this, this is preposterous. It's outrageous. Holmes, don't just stand there like a ninny. For heaven's sake, do something. What is there to do, my dear Watson? Uh, better go quietly. Yes, as things stand, I think jail may be the safest place for you. Holmes! <laughs> Inspector Lestrade, up and about early, aren't you, after last night's festivities? Uh, Patty was in excellent voice, didn't you think? I didn't listen. I was busy seeing no more jewels were stolen. Even with Dr. Watson safely under lock and key? As a matter of fact, Holmes, oh, several other pieces did turn up missing. The Duchess of Wentworth's Tiana and Lady Mulder's diamond stomacher. Oh? Uh, look here, Holmes. You don't think it's possible those jewels were planted on Dr. Watson? Lestrade... You astonish me. Every now and then you show signs of intelligence. Uh, By the way, I had a further communication from Professor Moriarty this morning. Like me to read it to you? I don't suppose I could stop you. Quite. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, yesterday's exploits were so successful in spite of my advance warning, I think I shall let you in on my further plans. I rather enjoy watching your feeble attempts to prevent my activities. That's a wrap at you too, you know, Lestrade. Uh, go on. I shall arise betimes, but this morning I shall rob the Sailors and Merchants Bank. At nine, the Merchants Guild will receive my attention. At 11.15, I shall relieve Lily Langtree of her sapphires. I shall then take two hours off for lunch. The music at the Savoy is so refreshing, you know. At two, Baroness Traphagen's famous cameos will be missing. At four, Mortimer Brewster, the American millionaire, will find it convenient to pay me £100,000 to cover up a few little irregularities in his shipping business. Then I shall go home for a bit of a nap, a late dinner, and then the grand finale. Well, what's he got up his sleeve for this evening, the blighter? I shall spend the evening at Buckingham Palace, where Her Majesty is giving a ball. All the best people will be there. I do hope you can manage to come, my dear Holmes, for at twelve midnight I shall blow the whole place to kingdom come. Until then, au revoir. Signed, Moriarty. He's joking, of course. He must be joking. Blow up the palace. Good Lord, it's unthinkable. It's, 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 it's a nightmare. It's worse than that, Lestrade. It could very well be the twilight of the gods of the British Empire. You're joking, Holmes. I was never more serious in my entire life. Come in. Inspector Lestrade, sir. Scotland Yard sent me. They thought you ought to know, They're sir. They're what, Albert? And straighten your tunic. Yes, sir. The Sailors and Merchants Bank, sir, has been robbed, and the Merchants Guild all has been set afire, sir. You can't very well blame Watson for those calamities, Lestrade. Maybe we should have locked you up, too, Holmes. Uh, but there's something else, sir. What's that, Albert? Uh, Mr. Pomfret, sir. Mr. Hector Pomfret was found tied up this flat when his charlady come to work this morning, sir. Good Lord. The city says he's been tied up since he went home to dress for the concert last night, sir. But he was at the concert. I saw him with my own two eyes. No, Lestrade. You saw someone who impersonated Hector Pomfret. The same man who earlier impersonated Dr. Watson, I suspect. I was pretty sure it wasn't Pomfret himself. When he arrived so promptly, he hadn't had time to change, you know. And then, when I saw his ears, I was certain. His ears? What's that got to do with it? A good makeup can disguise any feature except ears. The ears on the man who escorted Mrs. Tecumseh Jones were not the ears I'd noticed on Mr. Pomfret earlier in the day. Whose ears were they, do you suppose? I rather imagine they belonged to Professor Moriarty. I'm convinced he spent the last few years studying the art of disguise. But then we wouldn't know him if we ran into him. I would, Lestrade. I should be looking for his ears tonight at the ball at Buckingham Palace. Uh, do you think you could manage to release Watson in time to accompany me? I hate to carry my own revolver. It destroys the fit of one's evening clothes, don't you know? You've seen clothes whose very appearance breathes fine quality. Graceful tailoring, perfect fit, rich, long-wearing materials. But unless you've worn Clippercraft clothes, you've never seen that kind of suit at only $40 and $45, or that kind of top coat or overcoat at only $40. The quality so evident in Clippercraft clothes is made possible by the sensational Clippercraft plan. It concentrates the buying power of 924 leading independent stores across the nation, bringing you the savings that result from this group buying. Yes, even clothing experts are amazed at these remarkable Clippercraft values. Clothes that are truly fine in every way at the price of ordinary clothes. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores 
is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. like a ball at Buckingham Palace. Brings out the flower of the empire, I always say. Quite a contrast to Bow Street Jail. Yes, I shall forgive you for that in a hurry, Holmes. <laughs> oh, here comes the straw, looking like a mother hen whose ducks have taken to water. Look here, Holmes. I can't help worrying that someone sneaked in that confounded bomb in an opera cloak or a, or a bustle. My dear Lestrade, I told you I'd taken care of that. Shinwell Johnson has provided us with the best pickpockets in the business. They're acting as coat room attendants. I promise you, every guest at this party has been thoroughly, if unobtrusively, gone over. Not a pocket handkerchief has been overlooked. And I made my men frisk the staff. The great danger, of course, is the refreshments. Well, I've ordered supper served in tents at the opposite end of the grounds, like you suggested. If it's too far for the guests to walk, so much the better. They'll have to get along in the punch and champagne. And very nice champagne, too, I must say. Yes, the old widow of Windsor keeps an excellent cellar, God bless her. And keep her from harm. Amen. There's your Albert, Lestrade. What's he carrying in that basket? Hey, Albert! Come here, lad. What's that you've got in the basket? I'm taking in a chicken and a bottle of wine to the boys, sir. There's to be no refreshment served here, and the boys are uncommon hungry. So we, Albert. Suppose you give us that basket. Very good, sir. Holmes, you're not going to have a picnic lunch here. A nice, plump chicken, Albert. And rather heavy. Wait a minute, where are you going? Uh, get another chicken for the boys, sir. Oh, no, Albert. Stay here and share this one with us. Holmes! That chicken, it's sticking. Yes, Watson, it contains a very ingenious time bomb. When is it set to go off, Professor Moriarty? <laughs> At 12 o'clock, which is in exactly 30 seconds. You, you're not, Albert. Quite. Right, hang on to him, Lestrade. I'll take care of the bomb. There's no time. 30 seconds. Holmes, throw that chicken out of the window. It'll blow him to bits. Ah! <laughs> the fool. Why didn't he throw the bomb? Why did he have to run with it? Because you can only throw it about 50 feet. The explosion would be too close. It would start a panic. On the other hand, it's remarkable how far you can run if you've been a sprinter in your youth like home. Will it never be 12 o'clock? It's the longest 30 seconds of my entire life. If you... Calm yourself, madam. It's just a signal to start the fireworks. Yes, there goes the first Roman candle. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's Elms. so beautiful. Elms, where did you get rid of that bomb? I tossed it into the lake. Created quite a splash, but the water deadened the explosion. Well, one more question, Elms. How in thunder did you know it wasn't Albert? By his ears. Albert's ears are what you might call outstanding. By Jove, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Well, Dr. Watson, that was certainly a case of never a dull moment with Sherlock Holmes. So that was the end of Professor Moriarty. <laughs> on the contrary, he managed to give Lestrade the slip on the way to prison... Secretly, I believe Holmes was so glad to have the scoundrel back, he was both relieved and delighted. And now, Dr. Watson, I wonder if you'd like to give us a hint about next week's story. Next week, I think I'll tell you about a friend of mine who married a beautiful young South American lady he had only known a few weeks. It wasn't long after he brought her home to England that his household began to suspect she was a vampire. A vampire? Good Lord, is there such a thing, Dr. Watson? Well, suppose you wait till next week, Mr. Harris, and find out, hmm? The 
makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockren with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Help save lives by buying Christmas seals. These seals support the fight against tuberculosis. Buy and use Christmas seals and mail your packages early. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Sussex Vampire. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations with a mutual broadcasting system. From New York, the makers of Clippercraft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Winter's certainly here, Dr. Watson. There are snowdrifts three to four feet high piled outside your door. Uh, let me take your galoshes, Mr. Harris, while you warm your feet by the fire. Mm, boy, this feels good. I think I'll just dig in here for the winter, Doctor. Well, why don't you? And here is Sherlock Holmes' adventure every evening. Say, come to think of it, that, that won't have the good old Arabian Nights beat all hollow. Thank you, Mr. Harris. A very neat compliment, indeed. Well, Dr. Watson, which of your many Sherlock Holmes adventures have you decided to tell us this evening? Well, to tell the truth, I was... Uh, in a quandary as to where to begin until I received a communication by this afternoon's post. Oh, here it is. Thank you. Oh. Wedding announcement. Gloria Waverly Pembroke to Juan Fernando Ferguson. So that's a strange combination of names. Juan Fernando Ferguson, Dr. Yes, uh, Juan Fernando Ferguson was the victim in the case of the Sussex Vampire, although he was hardly a year old at the time. The case of the Sussex Vampire. That sounds promising. Just what is a vampire, Dr. Watson? That's the exact same question that Holmes put to me at the beginning of this case. Oh, oh, but before we go into the subject, suppose you say a few well-chosen words on another subject, a subject we're very pleased to hear about on this program. I thank you, Dr. Watson. A few words that give you the whole story in a nutshell are these. Clippercraft clothes are the best values in suits, top coats, and overcoats you've ever seen. Now, you have every right to say to me, how do you explain that, Mr. Harris? Tell us what makes it so. Well, explaining Clippercraft's great values is simple as ABC. They're planned values. They take advantage of all the ingenuity their makers can bring to bear. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across the nation, making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. You get the savings this brilliant plan makes possible. What's more... You get them at your own local independent store, at the store you can trust. Until you see them, you wouldn't believe such beautifully tailored suits were possible at only $40 and $45. Such handsome top coats and overcoats at only $40. Clippercraft values are so downright remarkable. We urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more.
And now, Dr. Watson, to return to the case of the Sussex vampire. It was a blustery afternoon, Mr. Harris, uh, early in November in the year... Uh, let me see, somewhere early in the 1900s. Well, at any rate, I had returned to our rooms in Baker Street to find Holmes standing before the huge reference books he had compiled for himself. The volume V in his hands and a critical look on his face. Ah, there you are, Watson. You look a trifle windblown. Well, it doesn't take any brilliant deduction on your part to ascertain that fact, my dear Holmes. What a gale. It fairly tears the coat off your back. I had to chase my hat almost the entire length of Kensington Gardens. Oh, I'm completely exhausted. Oh, nonsense. A little strenuous exercise is good for you. Oh, yes? Then why don't you indulge in it more frequently? I don't need to. My waistline isn't becoming unmanageable. Well, there's nothing, nothing matter with my waistline. A, a bit more substantial than yours, perhaps, but it's... Watson, no. Watson, stop your spluttering. I haven't time to listen. We have something more serious on hand. Oh, I say, uh, a new case? I haven't decided. Watson, in your own invaluable opinion, just what is a vampire? Oh, I thought you didn't have time for any tittle-tattle. I haven't. My question's entirely serious. A vampire? Oh, well, a vampire's supposed to be a sort of walking corpse that lives by sucking human blood and can only be held in its grave by a, a stake driven through its heart. It's a purely legendary figure like uh, werewolves and uh, sea serpents. Exactly, a childish bugaboo, pure rubbish. Yes, just the result of a lot of ignorant peasants frightening each other. Their imaginations run away with them. <laughs> Hocus pocus like that could never become current in England. No? Superstition's a difficult thing to stamp out. Read this letter. Oh, what is it? Uh, the hysterical ravings of some neurotic female? On the contrary, it's a business letter from Morrison, Morrison and Dodd, one of the oldest and most reputable law firms in the city. Read it. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, in Re Vampires. Sir, our client, Mr. Robert Ferguson of Ferguson and Muirhead, tea brokers of Mincing Lane, has made some inquiry from us concerning vampires. As our firm specializes upon the assessment of machinery... <laughs> The matter hardly comes within our purview, and we have therefore recommended Mr. Ferguson to lay the matter before you. Hmm. The question now is, does it come within our purview either? Well, we seem to have been switched into Grimm's fairy tale. We may as well expect a witch on a broomstick to come flying down the chimney. Eh? Oh, well, anything's better than stagnation, eh, Watson? Besides, stamping out superstitions, one of my hobbies. Well, now what? Come in, come in. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Hudson. A letter for you, sir. Came by the light post. Hmm. From Mr. Robert Ferguson, Cheeseman's, Lamberley. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson, thank you. I don't mention it, sir. Well, this Mr. Ferguson, he doesn't seem to have lost any time in getting in touch with you, Holmes. Well, the matter must be fairly urgent. Cheeseman's, Lamberley. Where is Lamberley, Watson? Uh, uh, in Sussex, south of Horsham. Hmm. Read the letter, there's a good fellow. Oh, really, Holmes? You're becoming more indolent every day. Rubbish. Just because I sit here relaxed with my eyes closed doesn't mean I'm not mentally alert. But get on with the letter, get on with it. Well, wait a minute, can't you? Wait till I get it out of the envelope. There we are. My dear Mr. Holmes, I have been recommended to you by my lawyers, but the matter is so delicate I, I hardly know how to explain it to you. Some five years ago, I married a South American lady, the daughter of a Peruvian merchant. She's very beautiful and a most loving wife. But I cannot help feeling that there are sides of her character which I can never explore or understand. A few months ago, she began to show some curious traits quite alien to her ordinarily sweet and gentle disposition. This is my second marriage. I have one son by my first wife, charming and affectionate but a cripple. Twice my wife was caught in the act of assaulting this poor lad in the most brutal and unprovoked way. That was a small matter, however, compared with her conduct to her own child, a beautiful boy just under one year of age. The story, if true, is almost too horrible to mention. One day, one afternoon last week, I, I heard my older boy screaming upstairs. Almost immediately, the baby's nurse burst into the room and begged me to follow her as my wife was in one of her spells. Let me go! Let me go! You're hurting me! Oh! Oh, Mr. 
Mr. Ferguson, sir, come quick. It's your wife. She's took bad again. What? She's beating the boy. Oh, hurry, sir. She'll kill him. Good heavens, this is dreadful. Come along, nurse. You're twisting my arm. Oh, oh stop hitting me. Stop. I'm coming, Jackie. I'm coming. Tina. Tina, let the boy go. I say, let the boy go. Father, look. Father, she hit me. Look there. Why, you've raised a great wealth on his arm. This is too much, Tina. Are you going crazy? I hate him. I hate him, the little beast. After all, Tina, he is my son and a cripple. How can you be so inhuman? It is because I love you. Don't you understand? I would sacrifice myself rather than break your heart. You must believe me. You must trust me. Yes, but what do you want me to believe? I, I cannot tell, but you must trust me. After all, actions speak louder than words. How can I believe you love me when I see you torturing my son? I hate him. Take him away. I will kill him next time. Stop it. You're delirious, that's it. You're delirious. Don't you think so, nurse? It's worse than that, sir. She's possessed of the devil. She and Dolores, that black-haired maid of hers. Dolores practices strange rites up in her room. She's a voodoo, I tell you. Oh, nonsense. This is going too far. Has the whole house turned into bedlam? Really, nurse, Dolores is from Latin America. Just because she does things you don't understand doesn't make her a witch. It's all quite easily explained. There's something going on in this house you can't explain so easy, no matter how you try. What do you mean? What I saw in the nursery this afternoon, just before she started into beating Jackie. Oh, don't tell. You promise not to. Oh, for the love of heaven, don't tell. Tina, be quiet. What did you find, nurse? I was out in the back hall, warming the baby's bottle, when all of a sudden I heard a loud cry, like he was in pain. I ran in to find out what the matter was. And there she was, leaning over the baby. I screamed. She looked up, and there was blood on her face. She's a vampire. That's what she is, a vampire. Hmm. Thoroughly unsavory, Watson. Go on with the letter. Ever since then, the nurse has guarded the child day and night. And day and night, the silent, watchful mother seems to be lying in wait as a wolf for a lamb. For the rest, she confines herself to her own room and will see none of us. I know this will all sound most fantastic to you, Mr. Holmes. Vampirism in the heart of Sussex. And yet I beg of you to take it seriously. If you would only come down and investigate the matter... A child's life and a man's sanity may depend upon it. Yours faithfully, Robert Ferguson. Well, Watson, what do you make of it? Well, it all sounds like a nightmare to me. Maybe the man himself is demented. Possibly, Watson. Possibly. Suppose we visit Lamberley tomorrow afternoon to see if we can get to the bottom of this strange case. I've always wanted to meet a vampire. <laughs> Yes, that must be our client, Mr. Ferguson, waiting at the other end of the platform. You mean the long, slab-sided man with loose limbs and a splendid back? But he looks prematurely aged. An experience like this would add years to any man's looks. Ah, Mr. Robert Ferguson, I believe. Uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. I received your telegram. I can't begin to express my gratitude. Quite, and this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, sir? I uh, believe we've met before, Dr. Watson. Oh, really? I... Aren't you the same, Watson, who played rugby for Blackheath while I was uh, three-quarter for Richmond? Bobby Ferguson, why, of course. Yes. I'm delighted to see you again, old fellow. <laughs> i never forget the day you threw me over the ropes and into the crowd at Old Deer Park. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, time has changed us both. Yeah. Whoever would have thought we would meet again under such tragic circumstances. Uh, but come, uh, the carriage is waiting over here. So, Watson, you played rugby, eh? No, indeed he did. And a splendid athlete he was, too. And see that. You're full of surprises, Watson. There are unexplored possibilities about you. Oh, now you're pulling my leg, Holmes. Ah, here's the carriage. Uh, will you get in first, Mr. Holmes? Thank you. Now, Watson. Right, uh, That's right. And uh, tuck this rug in around your knees, will you? Uh, the wind is getting rather brisk. Looks as though we'd have a storm before night. All right, Wilson. Let's get along. Now, 
Now then, Mr. Ferguson, if you don't object to a few personal questions... No, 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 anything, anything. What can I do? Uh, I can't go to the police with such a story, and yet I must protect the children. Is it madness? Is it something in the blood? H have you ever had a similar case? Oh, for the love of heaven, give me some advice I'm at my wit's end. Gently, Mr. Ferguson, gently. Now, just pull yourself together and give me a few clear answers. I can assure you that I am very far from being at my wit's end. First of all, have you spoken to your wife since the, uh, the discovery? No. No, Mr. Holmes. She refuses to see me. Her maid, Dolores, who's been with her since she was a child, is the only person she will see. I gather that you did not know your wife well at the time of your marriage. Only a few weeks. Then your wife's character would be better known to her maid than to you. I suppose so. This unhappy lady has appeared to assault both the children, her own baby and your son? Yes. She attacked Jackie again just day before yesterday. But the assaults take different forms, do they not? She has beaten your own son. Once with a stick and once very savagely with her hands. Is the lady jealous by nature? Well, she is a Latin American. She has a fiery, tropical nature. Quite. But the crippled boy, he's 15, I understand, and probably very bright mentally since his body isn't as active as other boys. Did he give any explanation of these assaults? No, he declared there was no reason. Were they good friends at other times? Mm, no. No, there was never any love between them. And yet you claim he's affectionate. Well, I've never seen a more devoted son. He's absorbed in everything I say or do. Hmm. Most interesting. Were the attacks on the baby and your son at the same period? In the uh, first case, yes. It was as if she were seized by some frenzy and had vented her rage on both. Hmm. In the second, it was only Jackie who suffered. And possibly because N Nurse kept a strict watch over the baby. I see. Ah, but here we are, Mr. Holmes. Cheesemans. The old houses in this part of the country are still named after their original builders. Yes, I see a rebus of a cheese and a man on the ancient tiles that line the porch. The middle section of your house is very old, Mr. Ferguson. Yes, uh, the wings are newer. Very interesting building with its towering Tudor chimneys and its lichen-spotted roofs. If you will come in, sir, I can offer you some refreshment. That will be most welcome. My bones are chilled. The wind's rising. That storm can't be far off. Look at those clouds. Well, it reminds one of the right of the Valkyries, eh, Ferguson? Oh, come in, Watson. Come in and shut the door. All right, all right. That's yeah, better. Now, if you'll just... Oh. Oh, Dolores. Si, senor. Dolores, uh, bring some sandwiches, will you? And uh, have the windows shuttered. It looks as though we're in for a storm. Si, senor. I shut them at I order sandwiches. That is your wife's maid, I take it? Yes. Handsome girl, but a bit primitive, eh? Ah, I see your iron fire screen is dated 1670. Oh, yes, yes. We've got a great mixture of dates in this room. The uh, half-paneled walls may well have belonged to the original yeoman of the 17th century. And the watercolors hung along the lower part are obviously modern. And the collection of weapons and utensils nailed against the yellow plaster. Ah, uh, those are the oldest of the lot. Inca Indian relics, I believe. Uh, no one knows how old they really are. I see. My wife brought them from Peru. This uh, quiver, for instance. Most enlightening. Most enlightening. Hello. <laughs> Hello, here comes Carlo. Well, 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 how's the boy? Come here, boy. Come nice on. looking spaniel, Ferguson. <laughs> Hello. What's the matter with the dog's hind legs? Oh, that's what's puzzled the vet. It seems to be a sort of paralysis. Spinal meningitis, he thought. Come here, boy. Come on, come on. Ah, oh, it seems to be passing off. He'll be all right soon, won't you, Carlo? Won't you, old boy? Won't you, boy? He knows we're talking about him. <laughs> Look at him thump his tail. Uh, Did this uh, paralysis come on suddenly? In a single night. How long ago? Several months. Very remarkable. Very suggestive. What do you see in it, Mr. Holmes? The confirmation of my suspicions. What are your suspicions, Mr. Holmes? It's just an intellectual puzzle to you, but it's life and death to me. My wife's a victim of some terrible curse. My child is in danger. Oh, don't play with me, Mr. Holmes. It's all too horrible. Calm yourself, my dear fellow. Keep a stiff upper lip. You may have to bear still greater pain, I fear, but I'll try to spare you as much as possible. I hope to have a solution before I leave this house tonight. Yeah, the storm has broken at last. I say, listen to the rain. Yes. I got the shutters closed just in time. Thunder, by Jove, at this time of the year. It's a thoroughly bad night. Sandwiches, senor. Oh, yes. Uh, come in, Dolores, and uh, uh, put them there on the table. <laughs> careful, careful. 
Why, you almost dropped the tray. What's the matter, Dolores? Why, you look as if you'd seen a ghost. I... I frightened. Listen. You hear that storm? It the great dogs of death howling round this house. My mistress, she very sick. She not take food. I frightened to stay with her without doctor. Well, I should be glad if I could be of service. Would your mistress see Dr. Watson? I take him. I not ask leave. She need doctor. Oh, then I'll come at once. You're sure you're not afraid? My wife may be really dangerous. Oh, rubbish, Ferguson. I can take care of myself. What you've a right to expect in clothes costing many dollars more is yours in Clippercraft at just a fraction of what you'd expect to pay. You get long wear that results from fine materials and good workmanship. You get good taste. Correct styling is worn by the world's best-dressed men. And you get comfort and perfect fit from skilled designing and precision tailoring. American production genius applied to the making of clothes makes this possible. That and the unique Clippercraft plan concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. You get the savings that result from this group buying at your own local independent store, at the store you can trust. Clippercraft suits are only forty and forty-five dollars. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats are only forty dollars. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clipper Craft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clipper Craft in the label of your suit, top coat, Sports jacket and overcoat. I wish Watson would come back. He's been gone over half an hour. He's all right. If anything had gone astray, I should have heard it. I've been listening. Oh, so that's what you've been doing. You were so quiet, I thought you were dozing. Wait. There's something now. Listen. I can't hear anything but the rain. It's coming this way. Hear it? Oh, yes, yes, now I do. That's Jackie's cane, poor fellow. He's coming in here. Hmm. It's the spine that's weak, I can tell by the limb. Sight of him, too. Here he is. Oh, Father. Father, I didn't know you were back. I, I'd have been here to meet you. I thought you were out in the storm. Oh, I'm so oh, glad to gently, see you. Gently, gently, Jackie, please. Don't hug so tight. There, there, now, that's better. We have company. This is Mr. Holmes. Hello, Jackie. Sherlock Holmes, the detective? That's right. Oh, now that I've met your eldest son, Mr. Ferguson, may I make the acquaintance of the baby? Oh, I certainly, Mr. Holmes, certainly. And just wait till you see him. How anyone could have the heart to hurt him. The most beautiful baby. So that's it. Hmm. What did you say? What's the matter? Why are you looking out the window like that? What do you see? The solution of this crime. Yes, but the windows are shuttered. Quite. Well, I... I may say you gave me a start. Sorry? Oh, not at all. My nerves are a bit on edge. What with the... this situation and... and the storm. Jackie, uh, go upstairs. That's good fellow. And uh, ask Nurse to bring the baby down here, will you? Yes, Father. Oh. 
Has it ever occurred to you, Mr. Ferguson, that this, uh, this story about your wife's peculiarities might have been made up by the nurse to get revenge on her for some slight? Oh, impossible. In the first place, I saw her beat the boy with my own eyes. Yes, but the other... Oh, no, no. Unfortunately, I feel that must be the truth, too. Nurse is a good woman with plenty of common sense. She's always been very fond of my wife and the baby. I'm sure she'd never have told me if she'd not felt it were necessary to protect the child. Yes, I thought so. However, we were bound to consider every possibility. You'll never know. Help! Help! She's killing you! Hello, what's up? Hurry, Holmes! Hurry! Coming, old chap, coming. Oh, this is terrible. What's up? What's happened? Mrs. Ferguson. Her bedroom door was open. She saw the boy go into the nursery. Quick as a flash, she was out of bed and into the other room. Oh, it's awful. There was Jackie standing beside the crib playing with the baby. When she comes in, raging like a tiger, shoves him aside, snatches up the baby, and dashes into her own room before you can wink. Oh, quick. We must get the baby away from her. The door's locked. We can't get in. Break it down, then. Help me, Watson. One. Two. Three. <sighs> Get out of the way, Dolores. You know, take one step or I shoot. Tina, look at her. She's got the baby. In heaven's name, don't take the baby away from me. Please, don't take it. Stand back, you know, touch her. Go ahead and shoot. I'm going to save my baby. Easy, Ferguson, easy. Dolores, would you mind pointing that revolver in some other direction? I know your intentions are good, but your nerves are a trifle unsteady. Look at my wife, the murderess. Mr. Ferguson. It seems to me that your wife is a very good and a very ill-used woman. How can you stand there and say that? Look at her. Blood on her lips. She's killing him. Has it ever occurred to you that a wound may be sucked for some other purpose than to draw blood from it? What do you mean? To draw poison from it. Your wife has been risking her own life to save your child. Poison? Quite. The South American household has weapons on the walls. When I saw that empty quiver, I was sure... If the child were pricked by one of those arrows dipped in curare or some other devilish drug, it would mean death if the venom were not sucked out. You mean Tina's knife? I see, of course. Why, it's quite obvious. And the dog. If one were going to use such a poison, wouldn't it be wise to first try it on the dog to make sure it hadn't lost its power? Oh, yes. But who could have done it? I don't understand. If I tell you, I must wound you very deeply in another direction. Oh, no. No, you must not tell him. You must... Darling, darling, what does it matter as long as you're cleared? Don't you understand? Nothing else matters. Oh, Robert. But why? Why didn't you tell me? Your wife knew how much you loved your other son. She was afraid it would break your heart. Jackie? My Jackie. Oh, Robert, you must not be sad. He's jealous, just a child. You will get over it. Yes. Yes, we'll, we'll help him together. Oh, my darling, I'm so glad it wasn't you. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, there, there, darling. Don't, don't. Come, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Your work is finished. They no longer need you. Yes, but, uh, Holmes, uh, don't you think we ought to... And Dolores is right. Come along, Watson. At this particular moment, we're decidedly de troll. That's a pretty harrowing story, Dr. Watson. Did Jackie recover his mental balance? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Harris. They sent him around the world with a good tutor. See, yeah, marvelous for adolescent nerves. Yes, Doctor, but how did Holmes know it was the boy? You remember his saying he saw the solution of the crime in the shuttered window pane? Well, Mr. Harris, what he really saw was the reflection of the boy's face when his father affectionately mentioned the baby. Holmes caught a glimpse of such jealousy and cruel hatred as one seldom sees on a human face. Well, Dr. Watson, that certainly is a thrilling story, and you certainly know how to tell it. To paraphrase my friend Sherlock Holmes, elementary, my dear Mr. Harris, <laughs> elementary. <laughs> and what story are we to have next week, Dr. Watson? Well, next week I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I spent the Christmas holidays at Penn's Dragon Castle and became involved with a ghostly lady in white. The honor of the Nevilles, and a Father Christmas who, quite unexpectedly, sang bass. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts, 
featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Lives are lost needlessly every year when people die of tuberculosis. You do your part to prevent tuberculosis when you buy and use Christmas seals. And be sure to do your Christmas mailing early. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Christmas Bride. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Show. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations, a mutual broadcast system. clothes for men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are, about to enter Dr. Watson's familiar study. Hello, what's this? We find the good doctor hanging up his Christmas holly. Not forgetting a sprig of mistletoe, Mr. Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Hope springs eternal, as they say. But here, help me down from this chair. My old legs aren't as agile as they were. In the days when I followed Holmes through the dungeons and up the tower stairs of old Pensdagon Castle. Here we are. Oh, thanks. That sounds suspiciously like the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes yarn, Dr. Watson. It is, Mr. Harris, it is. Holmes always called it the adventure of the Christmas bride. It concerns a ghostly lady in white who was supposed to have disappeared centuries ago. The honor of a noble family and a certain Father Christmas who suddenly sang bass. And now, while I fix us both a yuletide tolly, suppose you'll tell our friends and listeners about a gift every man in our audience would welcome from Father Christmas, or as you Americans call him, Santa Claus. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. And not only from Santa Claus. A thrifty man can give himself a worthwhile gift any time if he insists on Clippercraft. For Clippercraft clothes keep on giving for a long, long time. First of all, you've never seen such truly fine clothes at such really low prices. That means you pocket the savings. That's the first gift to yourself. And they also give you superb styling, perfect fit, and long wear. Clippercraft clothes give you so very much because of the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. That means tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. And yours are the savings this brilliant plan makes possible. Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats only $40. And sport jackets only $26.50. Clippercraft values are so amazing, we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, how about that Christmas bride, Dr. Watson? Her name was Ginevra. And she was the heir and only child of Lord Robert Neville, 10th Earl and 54th Baron Pensdragon of Pensdragon Castle. Yes, I shall never forget my first glimpse of that ancient and somewhat forbidding edifice. The walls grey and bleak without their summer covering of ivy. The towers square and defiant with the red or rouge dragon pennant angrily defying the winter gales. 
Well, as I was saying, a rather urgent message from Lord Neville on elegant embossed stationery had arrived at 221B Baker Street. Would Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson do him the honour of a visit to Penn's Dragon over the Christmas holidays? The visit to include the wedding of his daughter, Lady Ginevra, to the immensely wealthy but slightly middle-aged Wentworth Trimmingham, which was due to occur on the second day of the new year. Now, don't tell me the eminent Mr. Sherlock Holmes was called in to guard the wedding presents, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Hardly, Mr. Harris. At any rate, the day before Christmas found us alighting from our train at a small station in the Cumberland Hills, which, as you know, are situated in the north of England. There had been a slight fall of snow. An ancient carriage with red wheels and the Neville arms on the door was drawn up to the station platform while the anxious face of the Lord of the Manor himself, in top hat and earmuffs, peered through one of the steamy windows. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. That's right. Uh, this way, gentlemen. His lordship's expecting you in carriage. Quite a fall of snow you've had here. Aye, sir. More a coming. By rights, we should have brought the sleigh. Only his lordship loaned it to the vicar for tomorrow night. Vicar always plays fire to Christmas at the hall on Christmas Eve, I know us. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, hop in before you freeze to death. Thank you. Are you here, Mr. Holmes? Your friend opposite. Ah. And now then, Dennis, back to Penn's Dragon as fast as you can. Aye, my lord. Ah, Mr. Holmes, you are doubtless curious as to why I've invited you and Dr. Watson to share our Yuletide celebrations at Penn's Dragon. To be quite honest, Lord Neville, I didn't think it was entirely for the pleasure of our society. Although Watson is quite an asset when it comes to carol singing. Oh, Tenor? No, certainly not. Baritone. Oh, oh, that's good. The vicar who leads the Christmas singing is rather proud of his tenor voice, and I may say he's not too fond of competition. No. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I have invited you to Penn's Dragon to make sure that nothing, nothing occurs to prevent the marriage of my daughter to Mr. Wentworth Trimmingham. Why is that marriage so imperative, Lord Neville? Uh, to be brutally frank, Mr. Holmes, the Neville estates are mortgaged up to the ears. If the marriage does not go through on the second of next month, I shall be bankrupt, totally bankrupt. I see. Has anything occurred, Lord Neville, to make you fear that this marriage may not take place? Well, no. That is nothing definite. Perhaps the Lady Ginevra hasn't been able to hide her distaste for the match. Oh, no, no, no. Nothing like that. Well, I, I wouldn't say it was a passionate attachment on either side. But they, they like the same things. She laughs at all his jokes. What better foundation could one ask for a marriage, eh, Watson? Well, that's what I should have said. Well, everything was as smooth as silk until the Dowager Duchess of Turse gave the engagement dinner last month. It was at her suggestion that I sent you the invitation to Penn's Dragon. She's been decidedly edgy ever since Percy returned in the midst of the betrothal dinner two weeks ago. Percy? Yes, Percy is my cousin, although he's only seven years older than Ginevra. He's our next of kin. See. As a matter of fact, he's an orphan and lived with us at Penn's Dragon until he went off to Canada to seek his fortune two years ago. If anything should happen to your daughter before she produced an heir, would Percy Neville inherit? Yes, Dr. Watson. Both the title and the estates. Percy Neville's return was unexpected, I gather. It was. Unexpected and melodramatic, to say the least. The betrothal dinner was being held in the great hall of Penn's Dragon Castle. My daughter had just risen to return the bridegroom's toast. As she lifted her glass, a casement window was thrown violently open, and Percy walked in out of the night. And now I should like to make a toast to my future bridegroom. Percy! <laughs> What is it? Good heavens, Percy, is it really you? I'm sorry to make such an abrupt entrance, yes. Lady Terse, but I came as soon as I received news of the engagement. Percy, why didn't you let us know you were coming? Let you know? Let you know when you never bothered to answer my letters? But, Percy, we never received any letters. We, we thought you'd forgotten us. I have forgotten, as if that would have mattered. Percy, that's not true. You know how fond I... we are of you. How touching. Percy, this is Wentworth. Wentworth Trimmingham, my future bridegroom. So, this is the little man they've sold you to. Stop that. Stop it at once. I'm very fond of Wentworth. Are you, my dear Geneva? Percy, why do you look at me like that? To think you should so soon forget our family motto. Ne vile velis. The name Neville means that, you know. Ne vile velis. <laughs> Nay, 
Vile Velis. Latin, I take it, eh, Holmes? Quite. It means stoop to nothing base, in case you've forgotten your Ovid, Watson. Oh, teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Tell me, Lord Neville, what happened after Percy quoted the family motto to your daughter? Uh, he stamped off to his old rooms in the tower and hasn't been out of them since. How does the Lady Ginevra react to this unfriendly behavior? Oh, she says let him sulk. It's no concern of hers. Lady Terse, on the other hand, is thoroughly unnerved by Percy's return. Oh? Yes, she feels sure he'll do something outrageous the day of the wedding. Poor Wentworth is as edgy as a hen on a hot griddle. And, of course, that may be due to his encounter with the White Lady. White Lady? Who's she? The ghost of the first Ginevra, you know. The bride who played hide-and-seek on her wedding night and was never seen alive again. Years later, her skeleton was found in her great dower chest, still dressed in her wedding gown. She'd hidden in there, and somehow the hasp must have fallen down, and she was locked in and smothered to death. Seems to me I remember a rather famous poem on the subject. Oh, yes. So all the Ginevras and the Neville family have been named after her. She's supposed to walk through the halls of the castle whenever a misfortune is due to occur. Oh, cheerful damsel, eh, Holmes? When and how did Wentworth Trimmingham meet the lady? Well, Mr. Holmes, it seems it's his habit to knock on my daughter's door on his way to bed to wish her good night. Last night, the wind was rather high and he couldn't seem to make my daughter hear. Suddenly, he heard a strange creaking noise down the corridor behind him. Looking round, he saw the lid of the dower chest rise, slowly. Ginevra. Ginevra, my dear, it's I, Wentworth. I've come to bid you good night. Ginevra, are you there? Ginevra! Who calls me? What was that? Good Lord, the... The lid of the chest is rising. There's something... A woman in white. She's rising out of the chest. Who... Who who are you? The first Ginevra. You call to me. So I have come to warn you. Go away. Go away before it is too late. Then what happened, Lord Neville? Oh, nothing, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the white figure glided past my daughter's fiancé and disappeared up the tower stairs. Hmm. What did the lady look like? Blonde, brunette? Uh, Wentworth says her features were hidden by the bridal veil. Yes, interesting. I suppose anyone in the house would have access to that tower chest. On the contrary, Mr. Holmes. Too many people are possessed of insatiable curiosity. I keep the silly thing safely padlocked, I promise you. How many keys are there to that padlock? One which I keep by me, here, on my key ring. A very wise precaution. I say, Holmes, your bed is even larger than the one in my room. The butler tells me Queen Victoria slept there when she paid a visit in 1846. Don't look so superior, Watson. Queen Elizabeth, I'm told, slept here quite a few years before that. Oh. Come in. Oh, Lady Tuss, beautiful and charming as ever. Stop the nonsense. Glad to see you, both of you. Something's going on here. Don't like it. What sort of something are you referring to, Lady Tuss? Don't know. If I did, shouldn't have sent for you. Ginevra looks as if butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. Bad sign. Percy looks like a thundercloud. That's worse. I thought Percy had locked himself in his rooms and refused to see anyone. I'd like to see anyone refuse to see me. Oh, but I'm Gavin. Uh, you will want to view the premises. Yes. First of all, I'd like to inspect that dour chest. It might be interesting to investigate how a lady in white can emerge from a carefully padlocked coffer. Then you don't think it was a ghost. Neither do I. Well, what was she up to? We shall be able to answer those questions better, Lady Terse, after you've had a look inside that box. I wonder if you could persuade Lord Neville to lend us the key. Here's the key, Mr. Holmes. Lord Neville insists I bring it back the moment you've finished with it. Suspicious old boy, eh, Holmes? Not suspicious, Dr. Watson. Fussy. Well, Mr. Holmes, why the delay? Open the silly chest. Let's see what's inside. So fast, Lady Terse, not so fast. First, let's have a look at the lock. Heavy old bit of machinery. Yes, almost impossible to pick it without showing signs. 
There are no signs. Then whoever opened it used that key. Not necessarily, Watson. But there's only one key. Lord Neville told us so. And if Robert says a thing, it's gospel. Yes. Interesting carving around the lock. The wood's very old. Mm, naturally. Open it up. I'm dying of curiosity. Very well. Lock needs oiling. It hasn't been unlocked for some time. I'll remove the padlock. Here, Watson, hold it. Now, Lady Terse, if you'll help me raise the lid. Right. Good Lord, what's that? Oh, it's Thor, Ginevra's spaniel. Goes everywhere with her. Regular shadow. Oh, yes, here she comes. Hello there. I'm Ginevra. Why, you must be Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Delighted. Don't let me stop you, Mr. Holmes. You won't. Father told me what you're up to. I'm dying to see what's in the chest, too. Go ahead, open it up. Down, good, down, boy. You see, it's a biggish box, isn't it? Yes, a woman could easily hide in there. Hmm, something uh, white and uh, satin lying on the bottom. Wonderful. It must be her wedding dress. I've always heard it was still in there. Remarkable to find it in such good condition after all these years. The remarkable thing about it, Lady Ginevra, is this dust and dirt on the hem. Watson, give me an envelope. I shall want to take a sample. But that's fascinating. I've heard simply fabulous things about you, Mr. Holmes, and now I believe them, every one. Do you? Yes, I think we've seen everything there is to be seen here. Watson, you may close the lid and lock it. Right. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his famous deductions. They told me you were coming. They? Who's they? I understood you'd let no one in here, not even the maid. You've overlooked Lady Terse. Try to keep her out of anything. I didn't mention Mr. Holmes, Percy. Or did I? Don't look so suspicious, Lady Terse. I've decided to be a good boy. I've even decided to come downstairs tonight and join in the Christmas Eve festivities. Percy, that gleam in your eye. I've known you too long. You're up to something. <laughs> If you want to know what satisfying people really means, ask any man who wears Clippercraft clothes. He'll sing their praises, with good reason, too. For values like Clippercraft amaze even clothing experts. Until you see Clippercraft clothes and try them on, you won't believe such really superb suits are possible at only $40 and $45. And such rich, long-wearing top coats and overcoats at only $40. Such very smart sport jackets at only $26.50. For just a fraction of what you'd expect to pay, you get correct styling, perfect fit, and long-wearing materials. An ingenious plan makes this all possible. The Clippercraft plan, which concentrates the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. You get the savings that result from this group buying at your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Selling inexpensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Yourself, Geneva. He'll be here. But, Percy, the snow's so deep. What if he can't get through? Now, don't worry. The sleigh is light, and he has Vixen, the best horse in the county. Nothing can pass her, you know. Oh, dear, I hope so. The snow fell down. What ails the dog? He may prove to be a bit of a problem, don't you think? Goodness, I hope not. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I didn't see you behind that chair. An ancient wing chair often provides a good listening post, my dear. Now, look here, you meddling busybody. Percy, please, you promised. Suppose you allow me to solve the problem of the dog, Lady Ginevra. Would you? I mean, listen, sleigh bells. The vicar's driving up. He's here. Father Christmas has arrived. Open the door, Paddleford. Now then, everyone. Good King Wenceslas looked down on the feast of Stephen. 
say that, so I prepared this jug full of grog. Keep it well wrapped. It'll keep you warm. It's a long, cold drive to Gretna Green. But, what, Mr. Holmes? No time to waste. On your way, Father Christmas. Think of me when you drink the grog. We will. Wassel. Wassel. Merry Christmas. And a happy new year. Hello, what's this? A vicar off so soon? Uh, yes, Lord Neville. He seemed in a hurry to get home. Oh, can't blame him. It's a cold night. Let us get inside before we freeze to death. Good idea. Oh, I say, they're ready to start the dancing. Uh, Wentworth's trying to find Ginevra so they can lead the dancers. Help! Help! Someone. Oh, who's that calling? Oh, good heavens, what what's is that? It? Get me out! I locked it! Oh, someone's got himself locked in the dungeon. This way, the entrance is through the dining room. I was hoping for more of a head start. What's that? Nothing, nothing at all. Ah, this is the door to the dungeon. Let me out! Let me out, I say! Oh, dear, the door is bolted. Just a moment. Ah. Get me out of here! Good Lord! It's the vicar down there in his underwear and trussed up like a New Year's goose. This is an outrage! Get me out of here! But if the vicar is here, who drove off in the sleigh? Presumably an imposter who stole the vicar's clothes. I thought it might be, you know, when I heard Father Christmas sing bass. Say, Holmes! Holmes, where are you? Lady Ginevra, her fiancé can't find her anywhere. She's disappeared, vanished into thin air. Hey, Scott, someone get the vicar out of the dungeon. I've got to find my daughter. Oh, Mr. Holmes, come quickly. Ginevra's disappeared. Her dog is crouched in front of the dower chest, howling. Oh, hurry, gentlemen. The same scoundrel that locked the vicar in the dungeon has undoubtedly put Ginevra in the dower chest. I only hope we're not too late, eh, Holmes? Wentworth's <laughs> tried to break the chest open, but the dog won't let him near. There, you see. Easy, 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 thought good boy. Yes, 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 I know, I know what you're trying to say. We'll get her out. Oh, confounded the key. 
Lady Tess, what did you do with the key? But I gave it back to you. No, you didn't. Oh, yes, you did too. Quite all right, you know. No key needed. The wood's so old and the staple's so loose, it's quite possible to lift the lock right out, like this. That's it, I'll raise the lid. Oh, great Scott, there's nothing in there but a roast of beef. Yes. Thor's made off with it, I'm afraid. That explains his interest in the chest. But if Ginevra isn't here, where is she? With Father Christmas, I imagine. They're heading for the Scottish border in the sleigh. You'll never catch them, I'm afraid. Oh, of course. She's eloped with Percy. So she did talk him round. Good for her. <laughs> so that's why she trailed off up the tower steps in that old bridal gown. I suspected as much when I discovered some of Percy's ashes on its hem. Ah, oh, but this is dreadful. I should be ruined. We'll have to return all the wedding presents. fiddle dee -de. Personally, I'll make mine a much handsomer contribution. Ginevra shall have the tiara and my emeralds as well. They're worth a king's ransom. Lady Terse, you are an astounding female. All women are. Oh, but we're keeping the dancers waiting. You shall lead the dancers with me, Robert. Come along. Say, Holmes, you old fraud. I believe you knew you, what was going on all the time. I suspected, Watson. I suspected. But when I saw the Lady Ginevra raise her ball gown and display a pair of travelling boots, I was sure... But uh, come along, Watson. We shall have to go down to the kitchen and make peace with the cook. Oh, why that? For making off with Sunday's roast of beef. Something had to be done to keep the dog interested, or he'd have given the show away. Well, that certainly was a Christmas story with all the trimmings, Dr. Watson. I'm glad you liked it, Mr. Harris. And now, while I fill up our glasses... So we can drink a Christmas toast to our listeners and our sponsors. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, Dr. Watson. Ah, here's your glass, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And here's to our radio friends, young and old. Merry, merry Christmas and happiness, prosperity and peace in the new year. Indeed, Dr. Watson. And warm greetings to all the makers of Clippercraft clothes. And now, Dr. Watson, how about just a small hint about next week's story? Next week, I think I should tell you how Holmes and I spent New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. <laughs> New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles? That sounds amusing, Doctor. Hair-raising is the word, Mr. Harris. We were aboard the luxury liner Gigantic, expecting that any minute she would burst into flames. There's nothing more terrifying, we know, than a fire at sea. <laughs> Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clipper Craft dealer, write Clipper Craft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Christmas seals support the fight to prevent the spread of tuberculosis in this community. Buy and use Christmas seals on all your holiday mail, and be sure to mail your packages now. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes, this is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are once again on the threshold of Dr. Watson's study. 
we find Mr. Holmes, genial biographer, strutting up and down in front of his fireplace. Evening, Doctor. You look fit. The Christmas festivities don't seem to have got you down. I am fit, Mr. Harris. Very fit. Better than that, I am rather well fitted. A great Scott man, where are your eyes? <laughs> why, Dr. Watson, don't tell me Santa Claus brought you a clipper crap suit. Well, why not? Just because I'm a wee bit uh, venerable doesn't mean I'm antique. I still enjoy making a good impression, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, in that suit, it'll be the girls that go... When you walk down the street, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Seriously now, Doctor, suppose you tell us what tonight's story is to be about. Well, tonight I thought I'd relate how Holmes and I spent New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. The Silly Isles? That sounds appropriate, Doctor. The name of these particular islands is spelled S-C-I-L-L-Y. They are located roughly a hundred miles southwest of Land's End, Mr. Harris. Oh, what in the world were you doing there on New Year's Eve? Trying to prevent a great maritime catastrophe. You remember what happened to the Titanic? You know what happened to the Lusitania? Well, the lives of those on the ocean line are gigantic were in even greater danger when Holmes and I went over the side on New Year's Eve in the year 1912. Oh, but good heavens. (laughs) There I go getting ahead of myself again. Suppose I fix us a Tom and Jerry while you tell our listeners how to start the year right in a clipper craft clothes. Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Millions of men, like you, will start the new year in a smart new Clippercraft suit and overcoat. Yes, today more men than ever before wear Clippercraft clothes, for we've sold more Clippercraft clothes than ever before in our entire history. There's a reason, of course. The wise old American public, with its eye for value, has pronounced Clippercraft the most remarkable clothing buys they've ever seen. The reason for these amazing values is the sensational Clippercraft plan. Concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast, it accounts for tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. That's why truly fine Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Why Clippercraft top coats and overcoats are only $40, and sport jackets only $26.50. Clippercraft values are downright amazing. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to return to the New Year's Eve, you and Sherlock Holmes celebrated on the good ship Gigantic. Mm, yes. Uh, oh, here's your Tom and Jerry, Mr. Harris. Thank oh, you, Doctor. careful. Don't burn yourself. Yes, it was probably the most hectic New Year's Eve I've ever experienced. Nothing is as terrifying to a seafaring man as the thought of fire aboard ship, the panic, the isolation. Oh, but that's neither here nor there. Yes, now, let me see. It was the last day of the year, 1912. Its inception was sufficiently placid, I must say. A light snow was falling as Holmes and I seated ourselves on either side of a well-filled breakfast table. The flames of our sea coal fire reflected themselves cheerfully in the generous coffee pot. The whole house was filled with the pleasant aroma of the stuffing Mrs. Hudson was preparing for our New Year's goose. Suddenly there came a frantic jangle at the front door bell. No, definitely no. No what, Holmes? Whoever it is that's pulling our front doorbell out by the roots and whatever his problem is, I'm definitely not interested. Yes, Watson, being the world's greatest consulting detective has its disadvantages. People always manage to get into difficulties at the most inopportune moments. Yes, you should try being a doctor, Holmes. No female since Eve has ever decided to become a mother at a convenient time. Oh, come in, confounded. Mr. Holmes? Mr. Sherlock Holmes? (laughs) Naturally. Whatever your problem is, I warn you, it'll have to wait till after the holidays. But it can't wait, Mr. Holmes. Close to 2,000 lives are at stake. I pray to heaven you'll be able to reach them before it's too late. Reach whom? Where? And what is this disaster you anticipate with such trepidation? The steamship gigantic, Mr. Holmes. She should be somewhere off the Silly Isles by midnight. We've been reliably informed that an attempt will be made to set fire to her at that time. If successful, it'll be the greatest disaster in all maritime history. Yes, in that case, I suppose I shall have to forego the little celebration I'd planned for this evening. Have to? Well, really, Holmes, you are a cold-blooded fish. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't believe you've met my colleague, Dr. Watson, Mr... Uh... Uh, Pembroke, Reginald Pembroke. How do you do, sir? I'm chairman of the board of Floyd's, the famous insurance company. Oh, then your desire to prevent this uh, disaster isn't entirely humanitarian. Not entirely, but neither is it altogether mercenary. There's more at stake than the lives of the passengers on board the gigantic. 
If she goes down, the financial stability of the British Empire goes with her. Interesting, eh, Watson? Continue, Mr. Pembroke. You may not be aware, Mr. Holmes, that during this past year, there have been a terrifying number of marine catastrophes. Uh, Holmes knows everything, Mr. Pembroke. I'm quite cognizant of the fact that quite a few of the newest and fastest British liners have been destroyed at sea by fire, storm, and uh, accident. Ah, they weren't accidents, Mr. Holmes, I assure you. Quite. The Egyptian star was destroyed by fire in the Persian Gulf. 800 lives lost. The Lord Nelson disappeared in a typhoon in the Indian Ocean. No survivors. The Southern Cross exploded and sank off the coast of Brazil. 1,200 casualties. The Wellington, the Lady Jane Grey, and the El Dorado all caught fire in different parts of the Pacific. Total deaths, over 2,000. But the greatest disaster was last April, when the Titanic ran into an iceberg with a loss of over 1,500 souls. The public's becoming panicky about travelling on British ships. The ships of other nationalities are taking all our trade. Three banks and nearly ten investment concerns where large marine interests have gone to the wall. Even Floyd's is not too secure. But that is not the most serious aspect of the situation. Really? Good Lord, don't tell me there's worse to come. Much worse, Dr. Watson. Those ships disappeared in many parts of the world. They were sunk by diverse methods. One factor, however, was the same in each disaster. And that was? The cargo carried by each ship was gold. English gold. Oh, if it ever became known how much British bullion lies at the bottom of the Seven Seas, British credit would be badly crippled. As a matter of fact, the Bank of England has been forced to import a large shipment of gold from Canada. And it's on the gigantic. Good Lord, no wonder you're upset. The whole economic structure of the British Empire is at stake, Mr. Holmes. Nothing must happen to the gigantic. What makes you think anything will? A cable was sent shortly after the gigantic left Queenstown. She makes a stop in Ireland on her eastbound voyage, you know. She sailed shortly before dawn this morning. The gangplanks have been drawn in, the last line have been cast off, and the great propellers have begun to churn. Suddenly the dockmaster noticed someone sliding down the ship's side on a rope. Hi, look up there, sir. Some fool's climbed over the side. He's coming down on a rope. Go back, you fool. Go back. He'll be killed. He'll never make the dock. He'll fall in the water and be swept under the ship. No, no. He's pushing the rope away from the ship with his feet. He's swinging out. He's going to jump. He made it. Someone up on the bridge has seen him. He's calling to him. The chap's picked himself up. He's shouting back. Happy New Year to you up there. Happy New Year. In hell. Good Lord. I know the man, sir. It's Smokey Joe, the firebug. If the gigantic don't catch fire between here and Southampton, I'm a Dutchman. Smokey Joe seems to me we've heard of him before, eh, Watson? Not merely as an expert arsonist, but a dangerous pyromaniac as well. They caught him, I hope, Mr. Pembroke. No, no, Mr. Holmes. Unfortunately, he was too quick for them. He crawled down a ladder and disappeared among the pilings under the docks. So, the gigantic is headed for Southampton with a nice bit of Joe's handiwork aboard. You think it's a firebomb, eh, Holmes? Not necessarily, Watson. There are many ingenious ways of starting a fire, you know. Whoever hired Joe would prefer to have it happen well out to sea, I imagine. Our thought exactly, Mr. Holmes. We've wireless Captain Brooks to make a search, of course, but on a ship the size of the gigantic, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. You are our one hope, Mr. Holmes. If only you could get on board in time. And how do you suggest I go about that little assignment? The chairman of the Great Western Railway has placed the royal train at your disposal. All other traffic will be cleared off the tracks. Now, you should reach Land's End shortly after lunch. My yacht, the Albatross, will be waiting for you in the harbour at St. Ives. It's a very speedy little craft, and with any luck, you should sight the gigantic around 11 o'clock tonight. Yes, 11 o'clock. Was it Smokey Joe called out? Happy New Year in hell. It won't be New Year till midnight. If we reach the gigantic by 11, we may just possibly be in time. Six bells. It's 11 o'clock. Confound this fog. We've had to reduce our speed to half. Oh, we'll never catch up to the gigantic now, Holmes. Nonsense. She's had to slow down, too. I only hope we don't miss her entirely in this fog. I don't really care. You don't sound very fit, Watson. What's up? 
You have to use that unfortunate expression. <laughs> and tell me you're feeling squeamish. It's this confounded roll. I can stand a good brisk sea, but this bobbing about in a teacup. It's a pity I didn't bring the Mother Sills seasick pills. Oh, Mother Sills, bah. There's only one remedy for this sort of thing. What's that? Staying on shore. Jolly way to spend New Year's Eve, this is. <laughs> Who do you suppose is responsible for these confounded sinkings, anyway? Mr. Pembroke seems to feel it's a foreign plot. The Middle East European shipping industries benefit the most, of course. Holmes, did you hear that? I Jove, yes. Sounds like an ocean liner, right enough. Yes, we're signaling her. There she is, the gigantic looming out of the fog. Looks like a mountain coming at us. Ahoy there! Are you there, Ross? Yes, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson coming aboard. Let down a ladder. Here's the ladder, Watson. Think you can manage it? I'd climb up the Eiffel Tower on a clothesline if it would get me off this bouncing coffee shell. Quite an impressive array of instruments you have up here on the bridge, Captain Brooks. Yes, Mr. Holmes. On the gigantic, we have the latest of everything. And none of it's any real use in case of fire. I'd sooner face a typhoon or a shipwreck or a mutiny even, Dodd Ratchet, than a fire on board ship. But surely a ship this size should be fairly fireproof. That's what you might think, Dr. Watson. But there are three factors that make a fire on a luxury liner dangerous. First, there's all the confounded ornamental woodwork that's used in a passenger construction. Second, there's the fact that once a fire gets a firm hold, it's fed by drafts that rush through the ventilating system. And third, there is the element of panic. Nothing makes people behave more like wild beasts quicker than the cry of fire. In case of fire, you have, of course, an alarm system. We have the old-fashioned system of bells and also something rather recent. The Gigantic is one of the first ships to install it. You see that glass case over there, gentlemen? Uh, The one with a lot of tubes entering from below. Looks rather like a giant honeycomb, eh, Holmes? Each of those tubes leads to a separate compartment of the ship. The instant a fire breaks out anywhere... Smoke is immediately drawn up into the glass case. I've stationed a sailor to watch that case. Believe me, gentlemen, the first wisp of smoke. We shall know it. Yes, undoubtedly very helpful, Captain Brooks, in the case of an ordinary conflagration. I assure you, a fire set by Smokey Joe is not ordinary. He's a master arsonist. Ten seconds after one of his fires breaks out, you're dealing with a raging inferno. Confound it, they tell me the man deserted the ship at Queenstown. That is this morning. Well, that's more than 18 hours ago. If he'd set fire, it it seems to me that we'd be in flames by this time. Not necessarily. There are many methods by which a fire can be made to break out long after the pyromaniac has left the scene of his crime. You say you found no time bombs, no inflammable acids. No, Mr. Holmes. Ever since I received word that we were in danger, I've had my men searching high and low. They found nothing, absolutely nothing. It's been a systematic search, I promise you. Yes, but you've drawn a blank. That's what comes of using system instead of brains and initiative. Oh, And how do you propose to locate whatever it is we can't find? By using a little logic. Hmm. I shall credit Smokey Joe with having the intelligence to place his fire-starting device in the place where it'll do the most damage. The man's no amateur, Captain. He knows his business. Then I shall investigate that place and remove his handiwork. Holmes, you're bragging again. Not at all, my dear Watson. I think I may promise I shall have discovered the menace inside of half an hour. I only hope Joe's little device doesn't do its nasty job before then. Half an hour. Now, 11.30 exactly. Do you think you can solve this problem by midnight? Yes, Captain. With any luck, I think I can promise you a placid and uneventful new year. Captain Brooks. Yes, Mr. Brown. What seems to be the trouble? The wireless engineers who wish it to report that something's wrong with his apparatus. Both the sending and receiving equipment have suddenly gone out of commission. I don't like that. What does he think is the matter? Pardon me, Captain. Can you come here a minute? Excuse me a moment, gentlemen. The wheelsman is calling me. What's the trouble, Jerry? It's the compass. It's spinning like a top. I can't figure out what's got into it. Never seen a light except once in some magnetic storm. Great Scott, this is incredible. Now what? It's the engine room calling, Captain. I'll take it. Hello? Yes, Captain Brooks speaking. The blazes, you say? Well, 
Do the best you can. Seems to be the difficulty, Captain. The dynamos are slowing down. They can't figure out why. Good Lord, sir. That's why the lights are getting dim. The blazes with the lights. Without dynamos, we've no forced draft for the furnaces. We'll never keep up enough steam pressure to drive the ship. In no time at all, we'll be drifting helplessly in the Atlantic, in the middle of the reefs that surround the silly isles. Mm, jolly way to spend New Year's Eve, eh, Holmes? It could be worse, you know. How? The ship could be on fire. That's the real menace, to which these other threats are but the prelude, I fancy. Mm, for the love of heaven, what are we to do? Keep calm and use whatever intelligence the Lord has endowed us with. Captain Brooks, I suggest you and as many officers as you can spare join the holiday celebration that's undoubtedly going on in order to keep discipline in case there's any disturbance. Very good, Mr. Holmes. There's a New Year's dance going on in the large ballroom. It's on sea deck. And meanwhile, if you can spare us someone to guide Watson and myself. Oh, of course. Now, Mr. Brown here is our purser. He knows the ship as well as anyone aboard. I'm sure he does. Very well, Mr. Brown. If you'll lead the way, I think Dr. Watson and I would like to go below. And investigate the engines? No, Mr. Brown, even lower than that. What we're looking for is apt to be rather close to the furnaces, I imagine. <laughs> iron stairs that go round and round to make me dizzy. Maybe it's the heat down here. Yes, we're getting close to the furnace room. If you listen, you can hear the men stoking. Grim way to earn a living, eh, Holmes? Stop a minute. Where does that lead, Mr. Brown? That small corridor with a heavy metal door at the far end. Uh, that's the bullion room, sir, where the gold is kept. Very interesting. Suppose we take a look, eh, Watson? Yes, I've always wanted to see those gold bars you hear so much about. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Dr. Watson. Why not? Well, as you can see, the door is locked and sealed. It was done by the port authorities before we left New York. That door won't be opened until the port authorities unseal it when we reach Southampton. You mean that room in there wasn't opened when the captain ordered the ship searched for incendiary material? No, Mr. Holmes. But it's quite impossible for anyone to place a fire bomb or anything of the sort in there. As you can see, the seals are still intact. Quite. These seals are intact. But are they the ones put on in New York? I doubt it. Let's have a look. Yes, interesting. Very interesting. These are not the original seals. Oh, how can you tell, Holmes? They look intact to me. Exactly, they are intact. But here in the crack of the door sill are bits of broken seals. But these seals are not even chipped. By Jove, yes, of course. The original seals were hacked off and then replaced after someone had finished picking the lock and robbing the room inside. I doubt if robbery was the motive, Watson. Well, for what other reason would anyone want to break into a room full of gold bullion? It all depends. What lies directly below that room, Mr. Brown? Well, let me see. Well, nothing of any great importance, Mr. Holmes. Just the coal piles. The coal piles? Good Lord. I think we shall have to break the seals again, Mr. Brown. Here, Watson, help me. But the door is locked, Mr. Holmes. Even after the seals have been removed, we shall have to get the key from the captain. No time for that. Hand me my burglar tools, Watson. All right, very well. But, good heavens, you mean you could actually pick a lock with those things? If Holmes ever turned thief, Mr. Brown, even the Bank of England wouldn't be safe. Yes, that should do the trick. Now, if you'll help me draw the bars, Watson. Yes, with pleasure. Well, there you are, Holmes. Now, let's see. It's black in there, isn't it? Is there a light inside, Mr. Brown? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm afraid not. Then we shall have to prop the door open. The light from the corridor will have to do for our investigations. Come on, Watson. Holmes, that smell. Phew. Strong and acrid. Like sulfur, only with more bite. Seems to be coming from this large tin. Suppose I light a match. Oh, this village, stop! Don't be alarmed. I know better than to light a match around a tin which is leaking sulfuric acid. I only wanted to know how much you knew about Smokey Joe's incendiary device, Mr. Ludwig Brown, spelled B-R-A-U-N, if I'm not mistaken. So you recognize me? Yes, that dueling scar over your left eye. It's rather a giveaway, don't you know? So you have found how we are going to set fire to the ship by having the acid drip through a hole in the floor under the coal beneath. The first shovelful of that acid-soaked coal that goes in the furnace and the hold of a ship will be a blazing inferno. Nothing could put out that fire. Don't you mean that's how you were going to start the fire? My dear Mr. Holmes, you do not think we will let a small obstacle like the famous Sherlock Holmes stand in our way. Now listen to me. Don't you... raise your fist to me or I'll let you have it. Never argue with a Luger pistol, Watson. Well, that's the first sensible remark you've made, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry to leave, but the stokers should reach the sulfuric acid impregnated coal in about ten minutes, I believe. So I must be going. This room will be a roaring oven once it starts. 
You'll be rather badly overdone, gentlemen. Goodbye, then. So sorry I cannot say auf Wiedersehen. The door. He's bolted it. Even you can't open it now, Holmes. Shut up, Watson, and help me look for the opening. What opening, for heaven's sake? The opening that leads to the tube that ends in the captain's new fire-detecting machine. It should be somewhere near the ceiling. But, Holmes, I can't see a thing in this black hole of Calcutta. You can feel, can't you? thing, Holmes. The wall on this side of the room, it's as smooth as an egg. Confound it. If we could see for half a minute, it would... Hello, I've got something. Yes? Yes, a small grating here in the upper corner. This must be it. Now, if we can make a smudge of some sort. Watson, bring me a piece of paper. Paper? Where would I find a piece of paper? Then bring me anything I can burn. A bit of cloth, a piece of... Yes, by Jove, rope. Bring me a piece of the rope that's tied around one of the boxes that contain the bullion. Very well, if I can find a box that... Oof! Now what? I found it. Confound it. The, the knots are tied so tight the I can't... with knots. Cut the rope, Watson. Use your pocket knife. Oh, very well. Uh, uh, there you are, Holmes. It's a short length, I'm afraid. I only want enough for a smudge. Nothing like a bit of hempen rope to... Holmes, for heaven's sake, you're not going to set a match to that thing in here. There'll be an explosion. I have to take the chance, Watson. With any luck, the sulfuric acid fumes won't be too concentrated up here near the ceiling. Well, here goes. One, two. Now, if we can persuade the rope to smolder. Yes, there she goes. Certainly makes plenty of smoke, eh, Holmes? The important thing is being drawn up through the grating. How long before they come to investigate, do you suppose? It all depends on the mental acumen of the sailor who's watching that fire-detecting machine. Well, let's hope he's brighter than he looks. It may be my imagination, but it seems to me I can... Feel the metal flooring under my feet beginning to get hot. Most things in 1948 will cost you a great deal more than you've paid in other years. That's why it's sensational news to know that you can get Clippercraft suits in 1948 for only 40 and 45 dollars. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats for only forty dollars, and sport jackets for only twenty six fifty. And isn't it as good a time as any to decide to get the most for your money? You've every right to expect long wear, correct styling, good taste, comfort, and perfect fit. And you get all these to an astounding degree in Clippercraft clothes, and you get them at incredibly modest prices. It's, of course, American production genius applied to the making of fine clothes that does the trick. It's the unique Clipper Craft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading independent stores from coast to coast. You get the benefit of this plan at your own locally owned store, the store you can trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now let's <laughs> rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, locked in the smoke-filled bullion room of the gigantic. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> How long does it take for them... <laughs> to get us out of here. That smoke's suffocating. Oh, calm yourself, Watson. It can't be more than three minutes since we lit this smudge. Yes, I can hear someone running down the iron staircase. <laughs> I can't hear a blasted thing. How do you... Hello. Hello in there. Get us out. We're in here. Open the door. Oh, oh what a relief. How in thunder did you two get locked in here? <coughs> What's all the smoke? 
Oh, no time for explanations, Captain. Stop them stoking the furnaces. Flood the coal piles with water. They've been soaked with sulfuric acid. Good Lord. Ledger, Gates, stop the firing. Stop the pumps in the engine room. Well, that's that, Holmes. What do you suppose has become of that dastardly purser? We let Captain Brooks take care of him, Watson. Unless I'm very much mistaken, Mr. Brown is going to wish he'd never gone to sea. Well, come along. Let's go upstairs and join the festivities. I think we rate a bottle of champagne. Well, to blazes with the champagne, I need a double brandy. Eight bells. Let's see, that would be... Uh... Midnight, Watson. Happy New Year, old fellow. Happy New Year, Holmes, and many of them. But, uh... Don't you think you could manage to have them not quite so hair-raising? And have you getting fat and lethargic? You know, that would be unhealthy, not to say boring. Oh, so now it's for my sake we indulge in all these horrendous escapades, eh? Fine bit of logic, that is. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. But here's the ballroom. Suppose we join the party. Fine, my dear. Dr. Watson, that was an exciting way to spend New Year's Eve. It was a bit too exciting, Mr. Harris, if you ask me. Doctor, did they catch the purser? Oh, they did indeed. Mr. Brown and five of his accomplices were thrown in the brig. That was the end of the disasters in the British Maritime Service. When did Holmes first suspect the purser was the villain of the piece? When he came onto the bridge and threw his overcoat on a chair near to the compass, where, whereupon the compass went berserk. Who was immediately suspected the coat contained a powerful magnet of some sort. And was he right, Doctor? My dear Mr. Harris, was Sherlock Holmes ever wrong? But come, fill your mug and let us wish our radio friends a prosperous, happy and peaceful New Year. Indeed we do, Doctor. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to give us a hint about next week's story? Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I trapped a famous jewel thief right in our own rooms in Baker Street by the use of what was then a fabulous new invention, the gramophone. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Mazarin Stone. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, See your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris, speaking for Clippercraft Clothes for Men, wishing you a happy and prosperous new year from all of us at Clippercraft. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations. Are you sure? Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are again in Dr. Watson's study. We find him seated in the large armchair in front of a crackling fire. Good evening, Mr. Harris. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Now, don't get up. You look very comfortable right where you are. And from the redness of your cheeks, I'd say you've had a good day off in the country somewhere. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Mr. Harris. 
I've been doing museums most of the day, and it's very tiring work, especially with two small boys in tow. I should think so. But where did you collect the kindergarten, Doctor? Oh, it was a brace of nephews of mine. I was helping along with their education, you know. It's a custom in my family that the uncles must take the nephews museum visiting once a year. <laughs> I remember as a boy being dragged through miles of art galleries. But, Doctor, weren't you ever taken to the British Museum? Oh, yes, and to Madame Tussauds. But the Tower of London was my favorite. The uncle who took me there was quite a fancier of precious stones. He explained the history of every jewel in the Crown's collection. Hmm, that must have been an education in itself. They say every famous gem needs a trail of bloodshed and high adventure across the pages of history. And, by the way, isn't your story tonight about a famous jewel? Oh, yes, that is what reminded me so strongly of my boyhood visits to the Tower. The famous Mazarin stone I'm going to tell you about had a history that would make your hair curl. Dear me, I little did I think when I saw it as a boy that I would ever hold that great yellow beauty in my own hands. Great Scott, and did you, Doctor? But, oh, before I tell you that, Mr. Harris, suppose I give you a few moments to say a few words about our sponsor's most estimable product. Thank you, Dr. Watson. As you put it, sir, it is indeed an estimable product. So esteemed, may I say, that beginning in 1948, over 1,000 leading stores from coast to coast are Clipper Craft dealers. To be exact, there are 1,036 such distinguished establishments. Those leading stores across the country are, of course, the key to the amazing values so unique to Clipper Craft clothes. The 1,036 leading stores are part of the famous Clipper Craft plan. In this plan, their buying power is concentrated to affect tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Savings which are all yours. That's why truly fine Clipper Craft suits are only $40 and $45. Why Clipper Craft top coats and overcoats are only $40. And sport jackets only $26.50. Clipper Craft values are truly out of this world. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now, Dr. Watson, let's get back to the story of the Masserin Stone. Mm, yes, now, uh, let me see. Where was I? Oh, yes, I'd, I'd been married some years and had resumed my practice when one snowy winter afternoon, one of my calls took me in the neighborhood of Baker Street. <laughs> I couldn't resist the temptation to drop in and find out for myself what my colleague Sherlock Holmes was up to. As I stood there in the falling snow waiting for someone to answer the bell... I glanced up at the window of his study, and there I saw the thin nose and saturnine features of the great detective. He was apparently deeply engrossed in a book. Presently the door was opened, and there stood Mrs. Hudson. Well, bless my soul, as if it isn't the doctor. Good day to you, sir. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Why, Mrs. Hudson, you're looking as beautiful as ever. You, you don't change at all. Nor do you, sir. You and your blarney. <laughs> and how is the great man himself? Him? He's in bed asleep, I think. But I just saw him through the window. So that fooled you, too. That's not him. What do you mean? Just you be going upstairs and find out for yourself. I'm not the one to be giving secrets away. Least of all, Mr. Holmes' secret. So, he's asleep in the middle of the afternoon, eh? Yes, sir. I suppose that means a case. Yes, sir. He's hard at it now, and he's getting thinner and thinner. When will it be pleased to dine, Mr. Holmes, sir, I'll ask him. 7.30 the day after tomorrow, he'll say. You know his way when he's on a case. <laughs> yes, I seem to remember. He's a following someone. You don't say. Yes, sir. Yesterday, he was out dressed like a workman, looking for a job. Today, he was an old woman. Fair took me in, he did. And Lord knows I ought to be knowing his ways by now. You'll see his old woman's umbrella leaning up against the sofa in his study. Dear me, and what is this case all about? Well, I don't mind telling you, sir. But mind you don't let it go any farther. Cross my heart, Mrs. Hudson. Very well, then. The case of the Crown Diamond. What? The hundred thousand pound burglary? Yes, sir. And Mr. Holmes is getting it back for him. Why, would you believe it? Yesterday we had the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary sitting on Mr. Holmes' sofa, both at the same time. Oh, I hope it stood up under the strain. And uh, 
How did, uh, how did Holmes behave to such famous persons on his couch? Him? He was very nice to them and put them right at their ease. Oh, indeed. Yes, sir. Then there was old Lord Cantlemere. <laughs> oh, you know what that means. Yes. He's a stiff and if I do say so. I can get along with the Prime Minister and I've nothing against the Home Secretary. He seems an obliging sort of man with a civil tongue in his head. But I can't abide his lordship. Oh, poor fellow. Yes, sir. And neither can Mr. Holmes. You see, he don't believe in Mr. Holmes. And he's against employing him. He'd rather he failed. Does Holmes know that, do you think? Mr. Holmes knows whatever there is to know. Oh, absolutely. But I say, perhaps I had better not wake him. Well, I wish you would, sir. He has not had a bite to eat since yesterday noon. And then only a sandwich with a glass of milk. Mm. And I don't dare speak to him about it. You know what he's like, sir, when he's busy on a case. Oh, quite. Well, suppose I go up and beard the lion in his den, eh? Holmes. I say, Holmes, are you awake? Hmm. He must be asleep. Well, I'll go in anyway. Same old place and the same old litter. Scientific charts, chemicals, violin, pipes, papers, all higgledy-piggledy. Oh, there's the old boy himself snoozing in the armchair in front of the window. I thought I saw him from the street. <laughs> Just go over and tweak in the air. Watson, come away from that window. Uh, what? what? Good gracious, Holmes, you gave me a start. Come away from that window if you value your life. Well, very well, very well. But I say, Holmes, this is all very confusing. Here I see you sitting in your armchair, and suddenly you pop out of me uh, from your bedroom door. Uh, since when have you been twins? Yes, it is rather a startling likeness, isn't it? Likeness? Yes, it's a wax image of me. I'm expecting to get a bullet through its beautiful head at any moment. Would you mind drawing the blinds without exposing yourself? Oh, all right. Better? Now I can come into the room. Yes, but why all this hocus-pocus? I'm being watched from a window across the street by a gentleman with an unpleasantly efficient air gun. Yes, Watson, you come at a critical moment. Yes, so I gather. How far am I justified in allowing you to share this danger with me, I wonder? Danger? What kind of danger? Sudden death. I'm expecting something this evening. Expecting what? To be murdered, Watson. Oh, you're joking. Even my limited sense of humor could produce a better joke than that. Perhaps you'd better go while there's still time. My dear Holmes, you couldn't get me out of here now at the point of a revolver. Good. But sit down, sit down. May as well be comfortable in the meantime. <clears throat> How about a pipe and a glass of brandy? They have to take the place of food these days. But why not eat? The faculties become refined when you starve them. Oh, rubbish. What your digestion gains in the way of blood supply is so much lost to the brain. Present, I'm all brain. But uh, this danger, Holmes... His name is Silvius. Better write it down. Count Negretto Silvius. 136 Moorside Gardens, Northwest. Moorside Gardens, Northwest. Got it? Yes. Good. You can give it to Scotland Yard with my love and a parting blessing in case the murderer is successful. Look here, Holmes. I'm in on this. I I've nothing to do for a day or two. Your and I've morals don't improve, Watson. Now you've added fibbing to your other vices. You bear every sign of the busy medical man. Oh, to blazes with that. I say, God. Can't you have this fellow arrested? Yes, I can. That's why he's determined to kill me. Well, then why don't you? Because I don't know where he's hidden the confounded diamond. Oh, yes, Mrs. Hudson told me. The missing crown jewel. I've cast my net, Watson, and got my fish. But what's the use of catching them if the jewels slip through my fingers? And uh, is this Count Silvius one of your so-called fish? Yes, he's the shark. The other is Sam Merton, the boxer. He's the Count's tool. Sam's not a shark. He's a great bull-headed gudgeon. Come in, come in. Ah, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? A gentleman downstairs to see you, sir. Here's his card. Count Negretto Silvius. Well, well, so the old shark is grasping the metal, eh? Uh, <laughs> that metaphor is a trifle mixed, Holmes. Show him up, Mrs. Hudson, when I ring. If I'm not in the room, show him up all the same. Yes, sir. <laughs> Man of nerve, Watson. Mm. Possibly you've heard of his reputation as a big game hunter. What a triumphant ending to his sporting record if he succeeds in adding me to his bag. This is proof that he feels my breath uncomfortably hot on his neck. Look here, why not send for the police? Not yet. Not quite yet. 
Uh, take a glance out of the window, Watson, and see if anyone's hanging about. Yes, all right. There's one rough-looking fellow near the door. That will be Sam. Faithful but fatuous. I say, look here, Holmes, this is serious. I insist on staying with you. But you'll be in the way. In his way? No, in mine. Well, I'm not going to budge. Very well, we'll compromise. You shall stay in the bedroom within call in case I need you. Yes, but Holmes... Come along. It's essential that this room be empty when the Count enters it. He's come for his own purpose, but he may stay for mine. Hurry, I think I hear his step on the stairs. He's not in here, sir. But won't you step in? I'm sure he'll be back in a moment. Many thanks. And now you'll pardon me, sir. Certainly. So, this is his den, eh? His bottles and his papers and all the rest of his hocus pocus. <laughs> oh, softly, Sylvia, softly. There's the old vulture himself asleep in his chair. What luck, eh, Sylvia? One tap from my gold headed cane. Don't break it, Count. Don't break it. Holmes! You? Quite. I trust you weren't expecting someone else. I see you've been admiring my waxed figure. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Tavernier made it. He's almost as good at waxworks as your friend Straubenze is at air guns. Air guns? What do you mean? First, put your hat and stick on the side table. Thank you. Now, pray take a seat. Perhaps you'd like to put your revolver on the table, too. Um... No? You prefer to sit on it? Very well. This visit is most opportune. I want a few minutes' chat with you. Good. I, too, wish to have some words with you. May I ask why all these personal attentions? Because you annoy me. You have put your creatures on my track. <laughs> my creatures? I assure you, no. Nonsense. I've had them followed. Now, two can play at that game, my friend. <laughs> Yesterday, there was a sporting old gentleman. Today, it was an elderly woman. You flatter me, Count. Old Baron Dawson said the night before he was hanged that in my case, what the law had gained... The stage had lost. And now you praise my impersonations. <laughs> Dear me, it was you. You yourself? Quite. There is the old lady's umbrella you were gracious enough to hand back to me when we collided in the minories this morning. If I had only known. I would never have seen this humble home again, eh? Oh, well, we all have our neglected opportunities. You admit you have dogged me. Why? You used to shoot lions in Algeria? Well. But why? Why? The sport, the excitement... The danger? And no doubt to free the country from the pests. Exactly. Well, those are my reasons in a nutshell. What? You did. I'll show you. Sit down. Sit down at once and take your hand from your hip pocket. That's better. There's another more practical reason. I want that diamond. Fancy that. Your reason in coming here is to find out how much I know, so you may judge how far my removal is necessary. Well, I shall say from your point of view, it's quite essential. Uh... Absolutely. In short, there's only one thing I do not know. And what is the missing fact, if I may inquire? Where is the crown diamond hidden? Oh, dear me. So that's it. Suppose I don't know. You can't bluff me, Silvius. You're absolutely plate glass. I can see to the very back of your mind. Really? Well, then, of course, you see where the diamond is. You know, then. You've admitted it. I admit nothing. Oh, come. Come. Be reasonable. If not, you'll get hurt. <laughs> And you talk to me about bluff. You see this notebook? Surely. You know what I keep in it? No, I don't pretend to be a mind reader. This book is you. Me? Yes, you. Every move of your filthy, dangerous life. You know, Holmes, there are limits to my patience. It's here, all of it. The real facts in the death of Mrs. Harold left you the Blimer estate. Fabrication. The complete life history of Miss Minnie Warrender. You can't prove anything. And plenty more. Here is a robbery in the train de looks to the Riviera on February the 13th, 1892. The forged check on the Credit Lyonnais. No, you're wrong there. Then I am right about the others. Oh. Now then, Count. You're a card player. The other fellow has all the trumps. Time to throw in your hand. Well, what connection is all this with the theft of the crown jewels? Patience, my dear fellow. Patience. I have the cabman who took you to Whitehall. The one who drove you away. I have the commissionaire who saw you near the case. That proves nothing. I have Ike Sanders. Ike? Yes, Ike Sanders, who refused to cut it up for you. Ike has peached... I guess. Oh, wait till I get if my... that is the hand I play from, only one card is missing. The ace of diamonds. You'll never get it. No? Consider, you're going to be locked up for 20 years, you and Sam, perhaps longer. What good will the diamond be to you then? None in the world. Now, we don't want you and we don't want Sam. We want the diamond. Give it up and as far as we're concerned, you're free if you behave yourself in the future. My commission is to get the stone. Not you. 
And if I refuse? Then it will be you, and not the stone. I think it might be as well to have your friend Sam at this conference. He's waiting outside in the street. Suppose you tap on the window and motion him to come up. Oh, Mrs. Hudson will let, let him in. She's quite used to my receiving curious characters. Very well. He's coming. Now, what are you going to do? I have a shark and a gudgeon in my net. Now I'm drawing it. And up they come together. You will never die in your bed, Holmes. Does it matter very much? It's no use fingering your pistol, my friend. You wouldn't dare to use it, even if I gave you time to draw. Mighty things, revolvers. Better stick to air guns. But listen, isn't that the fairy footstep of your friend, Mr. Merton? Come in, Sam. Come in. Rather dull waiting in the street, isn't it? What's up, Governor? It's all up, Sam. Put it in the nutshell. What's this cove trying to do? Be funny? I'm not in a funny mood myself. No, I expect not. And I can promise you that you'll feel even less humorous as the evening progresses. Now, look here, Silvius, I can't waste time. I'm going into that bedroom. I shall play on my violin for five minutes. At the end of that time, I shall return for your decision. Do we take you, or do we get the stone? Now, where did I put my violin? I said this. Five minutes, remember. Clippercraft has a great reputation for fine quality. That's what you go by when you choose your first Clippercraft suit. And once you've worn Clippercraft, you learn how marvelously it stands up to hard wear, how very comfortable you feel in it. The long wear comes from fine materials and precision workmanship. Your comfort comes from excellent fit, resulting from skilled designing. What will amaze you is how so much is possible for so very little. Remember, Clippercraft suits are only forty and forty-five dollars. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats are only forty dollars, and sport jackets only twenty-six fifty. These are modest prices indeed for clothes obviously worth much more. The great Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1036 leading stores across the nation, makes these remarkable values possible. In your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now let's return to 221B Baker Street, where Count Silvius and his henchman Sam are discussing their dilemma, while Sherlock Holmes' violin can still be heard in the next room. <laughs> Play pretty, don't he? Oh, shut up, Sam. Look here, does this mean that he knows about the stone? He knows too much about it. I'm not sure he doesn't know everything. Good Lord. Ike Sanders has split. Oh, he has, has he? Oh, I'll do him a thicker for that. See if I do That won't know. help us now. To make up our minds. Hey, Arthur Mo. He's a leery cove. What if he's listening? How can he be with that violin squeaking like oh, this? Oh, sir, there he is, sitting right in that chair. Rot, it's only a dummy. Oh, fate, eh? Hey? Well, oh, strike me, madam, to swords, ain't it? It was a living spit of him, dressing down and all. Oh, shut up. You're wasting our time, and there isn't any too much. He can jail us over the stone. That juicy can. But he'll let us go if we tell him where the stone is. What? Give up a hundred thousand quid? It's one or the other. He's in there alone. Let's do him in. He's armed and ready. 
No, it's too noisy. We'll never get away. Besides, it's likely the police have whatever evidence he's collected. What, what was that? I'd have sworn I heard something move over there in the window. Uh, something in the street, most likely. Now, oh, look here, Governor. You've got the brains. If slugging's no good, it's up to you. Yes. I fool better men than he. The stone is here in my secret pocket. I can get out of England tonight, cut it into four pieces in Amsterdam before Sunday. He knows nothing about Nanceda. But the false bottom ain't ready. We must chance it as it is. Not a moment to lose. As for Holmes, the fool won't arrest us if he can get the stone. We'll put him on the wrong track. And before he discovers it is wrong, it'll be in Holland. And we'll be out of the country. Sounds good to me. I wonder you dare carry it. Where would it be safer? Let's have a look at it. What's the idea, huh? What's up, man? You think I'm going to snatch it off you? Now, look here, mister. I'm getting fed no up with offense, you. No offense, Sam. We can't afford to quarrel. Now, here. Come over here to the window. Uh, out of the line of that keyhole. Now, there. Hold it to the light. It is a beauty, no? Thank you, gentlemen. What? Uh, Holmes. Oh, I thought you said he was a dummy. Dear me, not very flattering of you, Count. Are you scoundrel? You, you thief. Temper, temper. No violence, gentlemen, please. Consider the furniture. Police are waiting below. But how the deuce... There is a second door to my bedroom behind that window curtain. I thought the game was up when you heard me displace the dummy. You... I believe you're the devil himself. You flatter me. Ah, but here are our friends from Scotland Yard. Take them away, boys. Yes, sir. Yeah, but I say, how about the blooming fiddle? is still playing. Quite right, Sam. Remarkable invention, the gramophone. Let it play. Turn on, Ed. Oh, Come on, on, get moving. Oh. That's it. All right, Watson, you can stop that machine. I... I say, Holmes, I've lost at least five pounds in the last half hour. Very beneficial to your waistline. Oh. You're becoming disgustingly plump. Look at this. Why, it's the crown diamond. Hello, what's up now? Come in, come in. Oh, Mrs. Hudson. Lord Kenton, yes, dear. What, again? Now, do you ever let us alone? Well, show him up. He's up, sir, begging his heart. Well, I must say, Holmes, you have most unmannerly people in your household. I ran into a group of ruffians as I was coming to the door. Oh, that must have been the fellows from Scotland Yard. It's um, rather warm in here. May I take your overcoat, Lord Cantonier? No, 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 no. Quite comfortable. Quite comfortable. Furthermore, I have no intention of staying. Dr. Watson will assure you that these sudden changes of temperature are most insidious. Get your hands off my coat. I intend to keep it on. Very well. I uh, came to see how your uh, self-appointed task is getting on. It's difficult. Very difficult. Yes, I suspect that you would find it so. Every man has his limitations. Yes, I've been greatly perplexed. No doubt. Especially on one point. But perhaps you can help me. Uh, you apply for my advice rather late in the day. Still, I'm ready to give you the benefit of my opinions. You understand we can doubtless frame a case against the actual thieves. Uh, once you have caught them. Quite. But the real question is, how shall we proceed against the receiver? What would you regard as the final evidence against the receiver? The actual possession of the stone, of course. You would arrest him on that? I certainly. In that case, my dear Lord Cantlemere, I shall be under the painful necessity of advising your arrest. Oh, forget yourself, Mr. Holmes. I have no time for such childish jokes. I may tell you frankly, sir, that I have never had any belief in your powers. Good evening. One moment. Actually, to make off with a Mazarin stone would be even more serious to be found in temporary possession of it. Uh, it is intolerable. Let me pass immediately. Just put your hand in the right-hand pocket of your overcoat. What do you mean? Do as I ask. Well, I... I, I... Say, what's this? It seems to be the Mazarin stone. For shame, sir, for shame. Well, 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 well bless my soul. How and thunder. Well, I'll be... Undoubtedly. However, I really must apologize. I never could resist a dramatic situation. I took the liberty of slipping the stone into your pocket at the beginning of our interview. Well, well, well. Uh, uh, to say I am bewildered is putting it mildly. Uh, we are greatly indebted to you, sir. In spite of your uh, somewhat perverted sense of humor... And I certainly withdraw any reflection I may have made on your amazing professional part. Uh, how did you shoot? The details can wait. I trust your pleasure in relaying news of our success will be some small atonement for my practical job. Oh, yes, it will, sir. It will indeed. I can hardly wait to uh, get the good word around. Uh, good day, Mr. Holmes. Good, good day, day, Lord Cantlemere. 
Watson, will you show his lordship out? Uh, with pleasure. And uh, tell Mrs. Hudson I should be obliged if you'd send up dinner for two as soon as possible. What an extraordinary story, Dr. Watson, and what a perfect climax. Yes, Mr. Harris. Holmes always had an eye for the dramatic, which reminds me, next week's story... Did you say that next week's story is going to be particularly dramatic, Doctor? I didn't say it, Mr. Harris, because you interrupted me, but I was going to. Yes, next week I'm going to tell you how the five-year-old racehorse Blazing Star suddenly dropped dead of old age, and how my... My youth for pass in the game of rugby saved Holmes and myself from a diabolical plot of our arch enemy, Professor Moriarty. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of sudden senility. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Post. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Well, here we are once again, settled comfortably in front of Dr. Watson's cheerful fireplace. Outside, the winter wind wails like, like, well, let's see, what does the wind sound like tonight, Dr. Watson? A lost soul or a baffled banshee? What would you say? To me, Mr. Harris, that wind sounds rather like bath. The ancient Egyptian cat goddess, sometimes called Eubastic. She howls, they say, if anyone disturbs the graves of those who have consecrated themselves to her. Oh, come now, Dr. Watson, you don't believe that sort of nonsense. Well, I'm not so sure, Mr. Harris, I'm not so sure. One violent autumn night, as Holmes and I crossed the windswept moors that surround King's Highlands, we heard such a cry, a strange, harsh ululation that struck a chill to our marrow bones. And, oh, good heavens, there I go again, forgetting my manners. After all, you have something rather important to say, I believe, Mr. Harris. Well, I generally have, Dr. Watson. And speaking of wind and chill, there's nothing like a Clippercraft overcoat to keep them out, you know. <laughs> right. Mr. Holmes and I weren't wearing a Clippercraft that night on Dartmoor Heath. Now, Dr. Watson, this is my part of the entertainment. Oh, sorry, old man. Proceed. Thank you. There are now 1,036 fine stores across the nation that sell Clippercraft clothes. That's a tribute to the efficiency of the Clippercraft plan. And that's a tribute also to the tremendous demand that an alert American public has built for Clippercraft. In the Clippercraft plan, you see, these 1,036 stores concentrate their buying power, effecting tremendous savings the year-round in manufacturing and distribution costs. 
These savings are all yours. And it's a mighty nice thing to be able to outfit yourself with value so exceptional at your own local independent store, where you get real service and friendly personal attention. Clippercraft suits are only forty and forty-five dollars. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats only forty dollars, and sport jackets only twenty-six fifty. Seeing is believing. To convince yourself beyond the shadow of a doubt, simply compare Clippercraft. With clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to that icy wind on the moors, Doctor Watson. Well, as a matter of fact, Mister Harris, that's not where this adventure had its inception. It was a brisk all day, rather early in the century. After a good deal of argument, I had persuaded Holmes to accompany me on a constitutional through Kensington Gardens. As our listeners doubtless know, Holmes was never a man who took exercise if he could avoid it. Lethargic sort of fellow, eh, Dr. Watson? Well, not necessarily. Needless to say, when we returned to Baker Street somewhere around five, I was the one who was puffing like a grampus, while Holmes bounded up the steps as easy as a greyhound. We were met at the front door by Mrs. Hudson, the chatelaine and general factotum of our bachelor domain. Mrs. Hudson, what's up? It's way past your tea time, Mr. Holmes. Oh, to blazes of tea, madam. Give us an early supper. What's more, a gentleman was here. Waited upstairs half an hour, he did. Stamping up and down on my ceiling till I thought the chandelier would come loose. Hmm. Sounds like a client, eh, Watson? Well, we could do with a case, Holmes. The exchequer is getting a bit low. Bother the exchequer. Oh, for heaven's sake, Holmes. Relax. We're home, you know. He said it'd be best. If it's a case... See that he pays. Looks like he has money. Yes, yes, Mrs. Hudson, correct. Our late visitor undoubtedly had money. Pity he got away. But uh, what makes you think the blighter was affluent? Oh, can't you smell it? He smoked the very best tobacco. Uh -huh. The matter he came to consult us about must have been urgent. He's left his pipe here on the table. A nice briar with a longish stem of what the tobacconists fondly call amber. Yes, he must have been thoroughly disturbed to leave behind a pipe he values so highly. Oh, bore dash. How can you possibly know how he values his silly pipe? Elementary, my dear Watson, elementary. The pipe has been twice mended, once in the wooden stem and once in the amber, each time with a silver band costing more than the pipe did originally. What's more, he's been here before because, having run out of his own mixture, he's helped himself to a pipeful from the Persian slipper on the mantelpiece. No casual stranger would know that's where I keep my tobacco. Oh, but here's his step on the stairs. Come in, come in. Confound it, man. Why don't you stay at home where you belong? Holmes, it's Colonel Ross. Yes. Obviously, my dear Watson. Oh, uh, bring our visitor a chair and a, a slight sedative of some sort, say a brandy and soda. I don't need a brandy. Yes, I do. Confound it, a double brandy. Well, don't tell me you had another disaster on the moors at King's Pylon. We have that, Mr. Holmes, but this time it's not a man that's been murdered. It's a horse. Worse. Much worse. Uh, let me tell you there aren't many men the equal of Blazing Star. Good Lord! Blazing Star! Isn't that your entry for the Wessex Cup, sir? It was, Dr. Watson, it was. Aha. Uh -huh. Blazing Star. Watson was reading me an item about it just the other day. I believe he's the son of the famous Silver Blaze out of Lady Luck. Uh, you were able to rescue his sire for me, Mr. Holmes? In time to win the Wessex Cup. What a race that was, eh, Holmes? But it's too late to do anything for poor Blazing Star. But by the Lord Harry, I mean to catch up with the scoundrel that killed her. And when I do... I've I... always contended there's a special reservation in the lowest hell for any man who mistreats animals. Yes, quite. But tell me exactly what happened at King's Pylon, Colonel Ross. Uh, you remember Ned Hunter, Mr. Holmes? He was in charge of the stable at the time Silver Blaze was abducted. Yes, fine fellow, reliable and trustworthy. He's been promoted to the post of trainer since you last saw him. But he still sleeps in the stable, doesn't trust anyone else to do it. Blazing Star, like his sire before him, was the favorite for the Wessex Cup, I believe. Uh, that's right, Mr. Holmes. So Ned was being extra particular. None of the stable boys were allowed to go near the horse. Ned groomed and exercised him himself. No one else laid a hand on the animal. Can't take too many precautions with a winner, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. Well, uh, yesterday afternoon I went down to the stables myself to watch Blazing Star work out. <laughs> I wish you could have seen him. The sunshine glinting on his chestnut coat. Like a fiery streak he was coming down the stretch. Never went better in his life. Well, I went into supper and uh, cleared a place off the mantel. The same place we kept the Wessex Cup when Silver Blaze won it. Then I went to bed and slept the sleep of the just... <laughs> But along about two o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by Ned Hunter. 
As I lit the lamp, I could see his face, white as a sheet, and his hand shook as though he had the palsy. What's up? What's the matter, man? It's the staff, sir. He's took bad. I'd better go for the vet. Good Lord. What happened? He seemed in great shape this afternoon. I can't explain it, sir. Unless it was that cat upset him. You know how he always hated cats. Oh, what cat? We don't keep any cats. Or oh, a black cat it was, sir. Can't say I've ever seen it before. But when I was taking in his bunch of carrots I always gives him before I tucks him in for the night, a black cat comes out of nowhere and slips into the store between my legs. Good Lord. Well, sir... You know how the star is about cats. He started stamping and winning like he was possessed. Hey, you to me, go! I'll get this cat out here before she's killed. Oh, easy, star. She swiped the star on the flank. She's drawn blood. Easy, boy. Easy. Hey, Timmy, bring the ointment. The star's hurt. Well, Mr. Holmes, Ned Hunter swapped down the scratch and tried to quiet the horse. But the star was restless. Long about midnight, Ned noticed his breathing was getting heavy and labored. He worked up quite a sweat. Ned rubbed him down again. But he kept getting worse instead of better. So I went for the vet. He's a new man in the district and supposed to know all there is to know about animals. When I brought him back with me, Ned looked like he'd seen a ghost. Ned, this is Mr. Peebles, the new veterinary surgeon. He'll bring the star around for us. I'm afraid the star's passed out, sir. I've never seen the like. Just seemed to collapse in front of me eyes. His back sort of sagged and his knees gave way. Pretty soon he, he couldn't stand up no more. He's, he's lying in there on the straw, pretty near gone. You'd uh, you better take Mr. Peebles right in, Ned. Yes, sir. This way, sir. Confound it. If anything happens to that horse, he was so fit this afternoon. Lord, it's quiet around here. If I could just hear the old boy breathing. Three o'clock. Where do you suppose that blasted cat came from? Ah, oh, rubbish. No one dies from a cat scratch. I've had any cats around here for years. Certainly not any black cats. Well, Mr. Peebles, how is he? What's the verdict? I'm sorry, Colonel Ross. He's gone, sir. Died very quietly of old age. Say the vet pronounced Blazing Star dead of old age, Colonel Ross. But that's impossible, Holmes. The West's Cup is a race for a five-year-old. Exactly. Blazing Star was five-year-old last month. Yet when I went in to look at his body as it lay there in his stall, I'd have sworn he was the oldest horse I'd ever seen. Temples caved in, coats dry and grayish, hip bones protruding. You don't think anyone could have switched horses while Ned Hunter came to inform you the horse was taken sick? No, Mr. Holmes, I know Blazing Star anywhere. The star on the forehead, he'd inherited from his father. The white off forefoot and a long scar on his left hind leg where he cut himself on a bit of wire when he was a two-year-old. That horse was star, foaled five years ago last month. He couldn't have died of old age. Fantastic and macabre story, Holmes. Huh? Quite. Many people, of course, will profit by his death. Have there been any strangers in the neighborhood of King's Pylon these last few weeks, Colonel Ross? Well, uh, uh, there has been a band of wandering gypsies camping on the moors. Of course. Gypsies have many curious and little-known poisons. They'd be quite apt to keep a black cat, what's more. If its claws had been dipped in some obscure venom... They... Possibly, Watson. Possibly. Tell me, Colonel Ross, what's become of your erstwhile neighbor and rival, Lord Backwater, who owned the Mapleton stables? That blackguard! Haven't seen him since the affair of Silver Blaze. He was ruled off the turf after that, you know, and forced to sell his horses. Serves him jolly well right. Mapleton has been unoccupied until recently. About a month ago, I understand it was leased to a professor, an Egyptologist, I believe. He's a recluse. Spends most of his time in a laboratory, fixed up for himself in the old study. 
Matty Baxter, our maid sister, keeps house for him. Says he's a, a queer sort of a chap. Works behind locked doors all night and sleeps all day. Unhealthy sort of life, eh, Holmes? Yes, there are several factors around King's Pylon that don't sound healthy to me. Colonel Ross, I suggest that Watson and I take the morning train for Exeter to investigate the situation. I hoped you'd say that, Mr. Holmes. I've told Ned not to dispose of Starr's body until you arrive. Splendid. I, uh... I suppose you want me to take my revolver, eh, Holmes? Your revolver and that little black satchel that contains your medical kit. This, unless I'm very much mistaken, is a case in which we should be prepared for anything. Well, Watson, now that you've finished a thorough examination of the cadaver, what's your verdict? The bet was right, Holmes. The horse obviously died of old age. But I tell you, that's impossible. Blazing Star was only a little over five years old. Ned here will bear me out. That's right, gentlemen. The horse doesn't die of old age at five years. And it looks like Blazing Star ain't going to be the only one, neither. Good Lord. Don't tell me another one of the horses has caught the malady. It's not one of the horses, sir. It's the sheep. Huh? I noticed it when I went out to the paddock after you left this morning. They stood there all huddled together, shivering. Then gradually... All day long, they kept getting older and older. You could fair see them do it. Their eyes are roomy, and their voice is weak. And, oh, some of them can hardly keep on their feet. But those sheep were young. Most of them were dropped in this year's lambing season. Uh, what do you make of it, Dr. Watson? Have you ever heard of old age being contagious? No, there have been isolated cases, Colonel Ross, where young and healthy individuals have developed a wasting way that rather resembled the appearance of age. Well, I'd hardly think it possible. Hold on, who's this running across the moors in the sunset? Looks like a woman, her hair flying loose, her shawl flapping in the wind. And she's staggering as if she were drunk. It's Matty, Colonel Rots, her that works over at Mapleton. She's not suffering from the effects of alcohol. It's fright that's upset her. It's sheer terror. Colonel Ross, Colonel Ross, will you take me in this night? I'm never going back. I'm never going back to that house again. I knew he was evil the minute I laid eyes on the man, and now I've seen him. He's a butcher here. He's a ghoul. Oh, who is Matty? The master. He was at least Mapleton. It filled the house full of heathen statues. The lower part man and the upper part beast. Those would be the statues of the ancient Egyptian gods. Ra, the hawk, and Nubis, the dog, and Bast, the cat, I think. Bast, that's what he calls her. The black cat that rides everywhere with him on his shoulder. That eyes are alike. Him and the cat, both green. And they both can look at you without even blinking. Only his head moves from side to side while he stares at you. What's that? I said his head. It don't never hold still. He's a ghoul, that's what he is. They've been bringing in boxes for weeks now. Six boxes, big like coffins. A lorry drives up in the dead of night and they carry the box into his study. And he locks the door behind it. That's the last anyone ever seen of them boxes, or what's in them. You've never seen any traces when you go in to clean the study? I've never been allowed in, sir. No one's ever been allowed in that study except the man what brings the boxes, and then only for a minute while he puts them down. Today, the men come with another big box, only they brought it before it was dark. The master fell in a rage when he saw him drive off. When they brought the box in and set it down in the study, he was that worked up, there were flecks of foam on his lips. You idiots! How often have I told you not to come here by daylight? Have a heart, Governor. The sun's about down and there's a storm coming up. Me and me partner have a long way to drive back to town. We don't like to be caught in the moors in a storm at night. Oh, you don't? Well, this is the last time you need come here. People who work for me obey my order. Hey, but Governor... Get your pay! Now, get out. We'll be going. Never fear. Here. He needn't have done that. Oh, he's a terror when he gets in one of his rages. Oh, there. You work here. I? I'm the housemaid. I uh, know what it is he's got in them boxes we bring him. Haven't a notion. That room's always kept locked. Uh, he never so much as looked through keyhole. Oh, I'd never do that. It's not right. Maybe not. But I bet it'd be interesting. Aye. Come along there, Chris, or we'll be caught on the moors out of guard. Aye. Lit the lamp in there. It shows through the keyhole. He's taking the lid off the box. I can hear the nails squeak. 
I would sort of like to know what's in it. One peek wouldn't hurt, I guess. Hello. There's another box inside of the first one. It's got a painted face and hands. Now he's taking that lid off, too. There's something lying inside. It's got a face, too, and hands. Oh! It's a woman. She's dead. It's a woman's body. Great Scott. A woman's body? Then the man is a gore, a body snatcher, or worse. Unless I'm very much mistaken, he's much worse, Colonel Ross. As for the body, I imagine it's been dead a long, long time. Yes, I think Watson and I will take a stroll over to Mapleton later this evening. I'd like to take a look at the contents of that box myself. What a night to go stalking about the Moors, Holmes. I'm soaked to the skin. Yes, the equinoctial rain seemed to be especially vigorous this year, Watson. Mm, vigorous, I can hardly say. Good Lord, what was that? That, I imagine, is a member of the feline or cat family. That was half wild, eh, Holmes? Yes, it's unusual for a cat to be out in this weather. Seems to be getting closer. Handle the lantern over here. Yes, there it is, in that tree to the left. Good Lord. Its eyes shine like fire. Maybe she's caught up there and can't get down. Here, pussy. Nice kitty. What's the one of my head and don't get near that cat? Why not? Because... One scratch from her claws, and you would decline and die of old age. You? Professor Moriarty? <laughs> you look surprised to see me, Dr. Watson. I heard you were expected at King's Pile and Holmes, and when that stupid serving girl ran screaming out of my house this evening, I rather expected it wouldn't be long before you came over to Mapleton to pay your respects to the Princess Hatshepna. Princess Hatshepna? So that's who you have in your latest money case, Moriarty. Yes, in the most perfect state of preservation. But of absolutely no use to me, unfortunately. Why not? She was still slender when she died. The artisans who unbound her didn't need to age the body to prepare it for burial. Age the body? Have you ever seen a fat mummy, Dr. Watson? Oh, come to think of it, can't say I have. In ancient Egypt, it took upward of 70 days to prepare the body of a mummy. Rare gums, resins, and spices were used. And if the deceased was fat, a fluid was injected which aged and shriveled the body after death. And it's your theory, no doubt, Moriarty, that that same fluid extracted from those mummies would, if injected into human beings, produce premature old age and death. Uh, so far, Mr. Holmes, I have only experimented with animals. But I believe the process has been sufficiently perfected so that I may now indulge in a few human experiments. How fortunate that you and Dr. Watson should have decided to drop in this evening. Holmes, let's get out of here. <laughs> Not so fast, Dr. Watson. My servant, Akbar, has had you covered for some time. He's an expert shot, I promise you. Bluff. Pure bluff. Can't see a soul. Akbar is rather dark. He doesn't show up very well at night, but to prove to you he is present, I shall have him destroy the cat up there. No, no, don't bother. But it's no trouble at all. We came out here for that purpose. Unfortunately, yesterday I spilled some of the liquid I'm experimenting with, and the cat walked in it. It's no longer safe to have it at large. You saw the results when she scratched Colonel Ross's horse last night. You see, I don't want to kill people. I shall be satisfied just to make them senile. Why, you blackguard. <laughs> don't excite yourself, Dr. Watson. Akbar, the cat. <laughs> Such a pity. I was rather fond of the beast. Now, gentlemen, if you will accompany me. When you're in your favorite clothing store these winter days and hear someone say, how do they do it? He's probably trying on a Clippercraft suit or overcoat. Because in this era of higher prices, it's really startling to see so much truly fine quality in clothes for such a modest amount. For Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45, 
Clippercraft top coats are only forty dollars, and sport jackets are only twenty-six fifty. The fabrics are really long-wearing. Style and fit is superb because Clippercraft clothes are expertly designed. Now you may ask how all this is possible. Well, the answer is real manufacturing genius and a plan. The famous Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of ten hundred thirty-six of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Thus, you get the amazing advantages of the group buying at your own local independent store, at the store you can trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Turn to Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes. We find them in Moriarty's laboratory. Sorry I'm forced to have Akbar tie your hands to the back of your chairs, gentlemen. Akbar, if you will remove Dr. Watson's revolver from his right-hand pocket. That's it. No, no, no. You needn't take his satchel off his knees. I know how lost the doctor feels without his little black bag. Very generous of you, Moriarty. Not at all. That will be all, Akbar. You may leave the room and lock the door. And now for the lady Hatshepnot. She's in the mummy case here. I thought you might enjoy the sight of a charming female while I give you the injection that will uh, deprive you of your youth and vigor. Now look here, you no, Dr. Watson. Is that by any chance, Professor Moriarty, the mummy case in which the Princess Hatshepnot was entombed? I believe so. She was removed from the tombs of the royal mummies at Dar el Bahari. By those famous grave robbers, the brothers Abdel Rasul, whose exploits finally led the British archaeologists to the left bank of the Nile opposite Karnak. But how clever of you, Mr. Holmes, to be so well informed on Egyptian mummies. Holmes knows everything. Or didn't you know? Uh, Watson, on the other hand, while no mental mastodon, has hidden possibilities. Uh, did you know, Professor, he once played rugby for Blackheath? Fascinating. I, um, I gather from the fact that the mummy case has the hands carved in relief that it dates from the 7th Theban dynasty. You are absolutely correct, Mr. Holmes. Wait. I will raise the lid and permit you to see the lady herself. Good Lord. She looks as if she had died yesterday. Yes, Dr. Watson. The mummies of Memphis are black, dry, and brittle. But those of Thebes are yellowish, flexible, and so elastic that the flesh yields to the touch, and the limbs may be moved. So, without breaking. Yes, it's remarkable. I should have liked to be present when they discovered the tomb at Dar el Bahari. Imagine, Watson, there were 36 mummies, uh, 20 of them kings and queens. Suppose we dispense with any further lectures on antiquity, Mr. Holmes. I think the substance I have here in this little glass vial may prove even more fascinating. How? Now, this is the liquid I've distilled from five previous mummies. The ones who have been, uh, shall we say, aged. One small scratch with a pin dipped in this fluid should, if my calculations are correct, turn you both into old men. What would be the uh, object of that, may I ask? Well, in the first place, it would render you no longer able to interrupt my activities. And in the second place, if my experiment is successful, I flatter myself I can change the course of history. Interesting. Think what would happen if I were to make certain men senile. The Kaiser, for instance, and that new American president, uh, Roosevelt, Mr. Theodore Roosevelt. And there's a man over in France, Monsieur Grumonceau. And a young man right here in England, his name is Winston Churchill. I think history might be quite different if he suddenly became old and feeble-minded. Let me see. My tie pin should do very nicely. 
It's a very interesting hypothesis, Professor Moriarty, but um, that file is so small, I... Is that all the fluid you have? It will suffice, Mr. Holmes. I shall prick only the key, man. Now then, I'll dip in the pin. So, and... Oh, Doc! Confound you! You've broken the file! <laughs> Bravo, Watson. A perfectly placed dropkick. I wondered if it would occur to you to use your little black bag for a football. Well, that was a narrow squeak, Dr. Watson. It was indeed, Mr. Harris. But even then, you were still tied to those chairs. Just how did you and Sherlock Holmes get away from the professor, Doctor? Oh. At that point, Mr. Harris, Colonel Roth and uh, Ned Hunter broke in and rescued us. We'd left them on the moors with instructions to come in and get us if we didn't return in half an hour. Why did you think Holmes became so chatty about Egyptian history? You don't mean he was stalling. Well, what do you think, Mr. Harris? What do you think? Well, what could I think, Doctor? And now, Dr. Watson, how about giving us a hint about next week's story? Hmm. Yes, next week I think I shall tell the case of the lucky shilling. In it, Holmes prevented the death of a certain reckless young nobleman and acquired the money to pay for a much-needed operation. It was done with the not-too-honest racetrack device which Holmes called the trick of the lucky shilling. of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. dealer. Write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the lucky shilling. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer. He'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are once again, about to lift the knocker of Dr. Watson's familiar front door. Whew, it's covered with icicles. Come in, Mr. Harris. Come in before you congeal. <laughs> Evening, Dr. Watson. What a night. A real January sleet storm. You must be chilled to the bone. On the contrary. In my new Clippercraft overcoat, I'm as snug as a bug in a rug. And as fashionable as Bo Brummel himself. <laughs> but come along. Take it off now. You're as bad as my youngest godchild. Give him a new toy or hat or shoes and he has to take him to bed with him. <laughs> You don't sleep in your clipper crafts, I hope, Mr. Harris. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I don't go quite that far, Doctor. But what Sherlock Holmes coup de say are we have tonight? Coup de say, dear me, we are elegant tonight, Mr. Harris. As a matter of fact, that is a rather apt description of tonight's adventure. It concerns a, a coup or stroke of chance with a certain lucky shilling. Holmes was not in the ordinary sense of the word a gambling man 
Although the chances he took were sometimes too long for comfort. Consequently, you can imagine my surprise when he suggested we take on two of the crack whist players of the Bagatella Club at stakes that were considerably over our heads. Mm, yes, actually the stakes we were playing for were a young man's honor, possibly his life. But, but don't you think uh, this would be a good place to mention a certain investment that is never a gamble? You wouldn't mean the purchase of a clipper crack suit or overcoat, Dr. Watson. Touché, Mr. Harris. As you would say, <laughs> touché. Well, despite these unusual times, Clippercraft clothes still sell for prices exceedingly low for such truly fine quality. From their custom-like appearance, you never guess just how modestly priced they really are. You're assured of fine materials, exceptional workmanship, and comfortable fit in Clippercraft. Suits are only $40 and $45. Top coats and overcoats but $40, and sport jackets but $26.50. You get these amazing values because of the unique Clipper Craft plan that today concentrates the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution result from this great plan, and the savings are all yours. See these sensational Clipper Craft values at your own local independent store. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Doctor, to get back to your game of whist at the Bagatelle Club. Yes, uh, this was the adventure Holmes always referred to as the case of the lucky shilling. As a matter of accuracy, it was more than sheer luck that enabled Holmes to win with that particular coin. Oh, uh, but to begin at the beginning, it was a lazy spring morning in the late 90s. I emerged from my bedroom with a well-developed case of spring fever. <laughs> Which Holmes jolted you out of. <laughs> <laughs> he did indeed. Before I had time to down my morning coffee, he bustled me into a handsome cab, my revolver in my pocket, and the scent of adventure in my nostrils. Holmes was cold and stern and silent. His brows knit in thought and his thin lips drawn into a sardonic smile. A sure sign that we were on the prowl in the dark jungle of criminal London. Holmes, do you have to look so sinister? After all, it's a beautiful spring morning. The buds are budding, the birds are singing. And one of our well-known young men of our town has unaccountably disappeared with a not inconsiderable sum of money, Watson. His mother sent me a frantic summons early this morning. Turn in here, driver. Park Lane. Number is 427. 427 Park Lane. That, that sounds vaguely familiar, Holmes. Yes, we've been there before. This is the house, driver. Here you are. Keep the change. By Jove, of course. It's the establishment of Lady Menu, wife of the Earl of Menu. It was through that window up there that her second son, the Honorable Ronald Adair, was shot by Colonel Moran's famous air gun. This time it's her oldest son, Lord Robert, who's missing. Is it any wonder the letter she sent me verges on hysteria? But you don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Robert is a most devoted son. He'd never leave me in my condition without some sort of explanation. Your condition, Lady Maynooth? As you know, Mr. Holmes, I left my husband, who was governor of one of the Australian colonies, the year before last, to return home to England for an operation for cataract of the right eye. My second son and my daughter accompanied me. Uh, that operation, I believe, was a complete success. It was, Mr. Holmes. But my son's tragic death and the knowledge that my left eye was also affected and in due time would have to be operated on left me in a horrible state of nervous depression. Understandable, eh, Holmes? Yes, quite. Uh, so, as the time for my second operation approached, my husband insisted that our oldest son, Robert, should be here with me. How long has he been in London, Lady Menuth? Less than a week. Hardly time for him to get into any scrape with the usual bad company. Oh, it couldn't be anything of that sort, Dr. Watson. Robert is too shy and, well... Perhaps fastidious is the word. He much preferred to spend an afternoon in the British Museum or the National Gallery than galloping up and down Rotten Row 
Or winking at pretty nursemaids in Kensington Gardens. Hmm, pity. A certain amount of kicking up of the heels in the young Lady Maynooth is healthy. It prepares them for life. They learn what to beware of later on. Mr. Holmes, you terrify me. You, you don't suppose Robert has fallen into the clutches of one of those theatrical hussies at the Gaiety who are always marrying young men with titles? Now, calm yourself, Lady Maynooth. Granted your son will inherit a title, I hardly think enough coin of the realm goes along with it to interest one of the Gaiety girls. Am I right? Unfortunately, yes. That's why I'm so particularly worried about Robert. He's never had the handling of a large sum of money before. Before what? Before yesterday. I... Well, I feel I must have no secrets from you, Mr. Holmes, if you're to find Robert. I need money. Desperately. My second operation for cataract is to be performed by the famous eye surgeon, Sir Lionel Tupper. Oh, brilliant ophthalmologist. Best in the field. Don't interrupt, Watson. He is brilliant, Dr. Watson, but also frightfully expensive. His fee for my last operation was 500 guineas. Why, it's outrageous. But he's worth it. Every penny. Well, to make a long story short, I had no cash in hand. No possible way of raising any in the immediate future. So I gave Robert my pearls to pawn. It was yesterday afternoon... That was the last any of us saw of him. Hmm. Uh, pardon the question, Lady Minuth. They were valuable pearls? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. They were worth many times the 500 guineas I hoped to raise on them. I see. But, uh, pardon me, I see Parker the butler is motioning me from the front hall. I, uh, I think he has something to tell me. Another case of a scion of the upper classes gone wrong, eh, Holmes? Not necessarily, Watson, but quiet is coming back. Mr. Holmes, I'm so relieved. Parker tells me that Robert has just come in the back way and gone up to his room. Oh. I'm so sorry to have brought you out on a wild goose chase, but you can see there's no further need for you. On the contrary, Lady Maynooth, unless I'm very much mistaken, this is the moment when there's the greatest need for me. Which is your son's room? First door left at the top of the stairs. Come along, Watson, up we go. What's wrong, Holmes? What do you think is up? I may be wrong, but... No, the door's locked. You hear that, Holmes? Yes, Watson, it's not the first time we've heard that devil's tattoo. In heaven's name, what is it? The sound of heels beating against a closet door, Lady Maynooth. Your son has hanged himself. Oh, confound the explanations, Holmes. Help me break down the door. <laughs> He'll do. Phew, that was a narrow squeak, old man. Don't do it again. Oh, Robert, Robert, how could you? I'm sorry, Mother. I, I guess I'm just no good. I lost the money, Mother. The money they gave me for pawning your pearls. There's nothing to pay for your operation. What does it matter? Nothing. Nothing counts but having you safe and sound again. How did you lose the money? At, at cards, Mr. Holmes. I guess I'm not as good a whist player as I thought I was. You young scoundrel. You mean you took the money for your mother's operation and gambled it away? But I had to believe me. It was the only way. At Sartorius and Fletcher's, the, the, the money lenders, where I went to pawn the pearls, I was ushered into the office of Mr. Juan Sartorius himself when they found out it was the minute necklace I had in my pocket. Well, when I entered the door, the old boy was friendliness itself. He, he stood back at his desk, bowing and wringing his fat little hands, when I pulled the pearls out of my pocket, he almost snatched at them. I, his hand fairly shook as he adjusted his jeweler's eyeglass to one shiny black eye. Mm, beautiful. But yes, they are beautiful. And so perfectly matched. Tell the Lady Maynooth I shall be very generous. To her, I shall offer 7,000 guineas for her pearls. But, but uh, Mr. Sartorius, I'm afraid you don't understand. No? The pearls are not for sale. I couldn't sell them if I wanted to. You see, they are part of the estate, and as such are entailed. In that case, I'm not interested. But surely a slight loan. It's only for a short time. Until the rents from our Lancaster properties are due... My mother must have that operation. Tell her to wait till the rents are paid. But she can't, don't you understand? A delay may leave her blind. 
Oh, please, can't you let me have the money? It's only 500 guineas. I'll pay any rate of interest. Young man, you touch my heart. I give you 200 at 15%. 200? But I need five. I must have it. 300, then. But that's the last word. 300? Why, what good is 300 in my position? You are a man of the world, I believe. You belong to clubs, no? Seems to me I hear you're a good whist player as your brother before you. All the men who's have what is called the card sense, no? Yes. Well, that is, I suppose so. I, I always manage to win a bit. But I never played for high stakes. Why not, you idiot? A young man with a 300-guinea nest egg who understands cards can do very well for himself, No. didn't go to one of those whist clubs. Yes, Mother. Uh, I chose the Bagatelle. The Bagatelle? Merciful heavens! That's where your brother met that dreadful Colonel Moran, who caused his death. But, Mother, that was an unfortunate exception. Why, the Bagatelle is a gentleman's club. They're famous for having the most brilliant, but most honest games in all London. And besides, you know the old saying, lightning never strikes twice in the same place. But in your case, it did, Lord Robert. <laughs> well, yes, I... I'm afraid so. You had a particularly bad run of cards? No, I can't even claim that. Then there was no crooked dealing? Oh, good Lord, no. It was just that, well, nothing seemed to work out for me. While your opponent's hands dovetail perfectly? Eh? That's about the size of it, Mr. Holmes. You played a set game? Oh, no, sir. We cut for partners after every rubber. And who was the big winner? Well, it was a, a Mr. Horatio Webster... If he'd been able to see straight through the cards, he couldn't have had better luck. Oh, yes, Mr. Horatio Webster. Double or nothing, Webster. He'd rather gamble than eat, I understand. So would I if I had his luck. I wonder if it's all luck. No one's luck can be as good as Mr. Webster's unless he's sold his soul to the devil. That uh, wouldn't be a metaphor for suggesting the gentleman isn't entirely honest. Go to the head of the class, Watson. But we can't prove anything. What can I do? Just this. See that Watson and I are presented with visitors' cards to the Bagatelle. I rather think we'd enjoy an evening at the tables. Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? You haven't played whist for over a year. Even so, my dear Watson, I fancy I may be able to teach Mr. Double or Nothing Webster a trick or two. After all, Holmes... Why I have to crawl into this into this high collar and a stiff shirt and just to spend the evening playing cards is more than I can... Oh, stop spluttering, Watson. The Bagatelle is a very elegant establishment. We must live up to the tradition. Bother that. What's more, I, I can't say I look forward to having you as a partner for the entire evening. Come now, Watson. My method of playing whist may be unorthodox, but uh, it is rather brilliant. Possibly, but it's enough to give your partner nervous prostration. You play every game as if it were poker. Now, please, Holmes, promise that tonight you won't bluff. I'll try to control myself, Watson. Now, where did I put my lucky shilling? Yes, and just remember, we've drawn every cent we have in the world out of the bank in order to have this fling. Don't be so conservative, Watson. We may lose a bit of our nest egg during the course of the evening, but don't let it upset you. Before the game's over, we shall have won back not only our losses, but enough to pay for Lady Maynooth's operation as well. What makes you so sure of that? This shilling. My lucky shilling. I can't possibly lose with that on my side. Pretty, isn't it? Hmm. Where did you get that silly thing? You never carried a pocket piece before. Never needed one before. Then how do you know it's so lucky? I've been working on it all afternoon. Gin and tonic for Dr. Watson, Pomfret. Scotch and soda for Lord Beavers, and another for me. And a brandy for Mr. Holmes. Double brandy, Pomfret. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome you to the Bagatelle Club, Mr. Holmes. I've heard so much about your mental prowess, I admit I'm prepared to spend a very unprofitable evening. Uh, shall we cut for deal? Your own reputation is fairly colourful, Mr. Webster. They say you've cornered the market on fortuity. <laughs> uh, Watson has an ace. Uh, in this club, the ace is low. Dr. Watson gets the deal. Uh, if you will each uh, shuffle the cards, gentlemen. Mr. Holmes first. 
You next, Lord Beavers. Well, poor old Beavers is quite deaf, you know. Fortunately, it doesn't affect his card sense. Oh, now my shuffle. And now the dealer. Ah, oh, here are drinks. Your cut, Mr. Webster. Oh, yes, with pleasure. There, deal them out. May the best team win. Uh, shall we play a set game, gentlemen, or shall we cut or rotate after every rubber? Oh, by all means, let's stay where we are. I'm not the athletic type myself. I loathe a lot of bobbing about. Too much like playing musical chairs. <laughs> ah, spades or trumps. Lead, please. <laughs> That gives us three tricks, which means game and rubber. Uh, not to mention a four on a count. Hmm, that's, uh, let me see. Yes, you each lose another two pounds, eleven and sixpence, gentlemen. Hmm, dear me, so we do, eh, Watson? Oh, settle up, old chap, that's a good fellow. What? I'm afraid all I have in my pocket's my lucky shilling. Doesn't seem to have brought you much luck so far, Holmes. Give it time, Watson. Give it time. Uh, Pomfret, Mr. Holmes's glass is empty. Thank you, Pomfret. Uh, cut, please, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. I hope you don't mind the way old Pomfret hangs around the table. He's been a waiter here for 40 years. The game still fascinates him. Yes, so it seems. Ever try a hand at it himself? Good Lord, no. He doesn't know one card from another. Ah, clubs are trumped this time, gentlemen. <laughs> More points for our side. Well, I'm afraid that's another rubber for us. You better throw away that lucky shilling, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's that, Pompert? Uh, the same all round. Uh, Pompert has indicated the bar is about to close. Great Scott, is it that late? You sure you wouldn't like to quit, Mr. Webster? Not me, as long as my luck holds out, Mr. Holmes. Of course, if you've had enough. Oh, not at all. We haven't even started to warm up. Eh, Watson? Warm up? Really, Holmes, the way you're playing tonight. Twice you've tumped a good trick of mine. And that last lead, what in heaven's name was that? My dear Watson, don't tell me you didn't recognize it. That's the new American lead. Fourth from your longest and strongest suit. Oh. Very ably explained in the little treatise by Mr. Nicholas Browse Trist of New Orleans, USA. Oh, to blazes with Mr. Trist. That gives us another game in rubber. It's getting to be positively monotonous, eh, Watson? Holmes, have you any idea how much we've lost during the night? Vaguely, Watson, oh, vaguely. Con confound that flash. Go away! Yes, it's getting to be daylight. Even the flies are waking up. Uh, sure you don't want to call it quits? Uh, just one more rubber. One more loss and we'll be cleaned out, Holmes. Oh, very well, Watson. Before that happens, I'll make you a little side bet. Uh, put a shilling on the table in your corner. Now, I'll put my lucky shilling here in mine. I'll bet you a guinea that fly lights on my shilling before he does on yours. Now, oh, there he goes again over in my corner. That's a good chap. <laughs> mm, that makes ten guineas I owe you, Watson. Yes. Hello, here comes another fly to get in the game. Perhaps he'll bring me luck. I doubt it, but let's get on with the rubber. It's my deal, I believe. <laughs> it's funny how the last rubber is always the longest. I say, Mr. Holmes, I wonder if I could enter a shilling on your sweepstakes. Why, certainly, Mr. Webster. But in that case, I think I'll turn my coin over, just for luck. Your shuffle, I believe, Mr. Webster. Yeah. <laughs> Coy little beggar, that fly. Nearly had him on my coin that time. No, oh, by Jove, he's lit on yours, Mr. Holmes. Hmm, perhaps my luck has changed at last. His five guineas says it hasn't. Fair enough. I'm out. That's too steep for me. Cut, Mr. Webster. Thank you. By Jove, look at the silly little buzzer. Oh, you win again, Mr. Holmes. How about another go at it? Same stakes. 
Delighted, Mr. Webster. Have you ever thought this to yourself? How can I get the advantages of group buying and still trade at the local independent store I trust? Well, the answer is really a very simple one, for through the amazing Clippercraft plan, we've made it our business to bring you remarkable values in clothes at the local store of your choice. It took real planning to accomplish this, and here's what happened. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 stores from coast to coast, bringing you beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits at only 40 and 45 dollars, top coats and overcoats at only 40 dollars and sport jackets at only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now, let's return to the Bagatelle Club, where Holmes is trying to lure a fly with his lucky shilling. Confound it. You win again, Mr. Holmes. That makes 200 guineas you owe me, Mr. Webster. Shall we say double or nothing? Sold. Oh, gentlemen, let's not forget there's a whist game going on. That's right, you are. Ah, hearts are trump. Your lucky suit, I believe, Watson. By the way, did you know that the original name for Trumps is Triumphs? Ah, there's the little beast on my coin again. It makes 400 guineas you owe me, Mr. Webster. I'll double the bet, Mr. Holmes, if you like. Holmes, are you out of your mind? You've nearly won back our losses. As I was saying, Trumps were once called Triumphs. That's what Shakespeare's alluding to in Anthony and Cleopatra when he says, She, Eros, has packed cards with Caesar and false played my glory unto an enemy's triumph. Act 4, scene 12. Found it, Holmes. The fly has chosen your coin again. That's 800 you owe me. Uh, the usual, Mr. Webster? Double or nothing? Holmes, are you out of your senses? Suits me, Mr. Holmes. I figure the law of averages must break in my direction for a change. Nice little fly. Careful now. There's 1,600 guineas riding on you, old chap. Careful, Watson, don't revoke. Oh, confounded, Holmes. How can I keep my mind on the game with a 1,600 guinea bet on the table? Just follow suit, Watson. Just follow suit. Oh, confounded. Will that fly never light? Patience, Mr. Webster, patience. The history of the game called whist is rather colorful, you know. The earliest form was called rough and honors. Holmes, did anyone ever tell you the word whist means hush or shut up? Pray do so. Sorry, Watson. Confounded, Holmes. The fly has chosen your shilling. And I take the final trick which makes game and rubber. The evening is finished, gentlemen. One moment, Mr. Holmes. Before I settle up, I'd like one look at that shilling of yours. With pleasure, Mr. Webster. Be careful of your fingers, though. It's slightly sticky. Sticky, by the Lord Harry. And sweet to the taste. I have been robbed. Holmes, you're a cheat and a thief. I refuse to pay my losses. But a Welsh on your debts, eh? I wouldn't advise it, you know. Really, I wouldn't. Or I shall be forced to report to the governors of this club that the Webster luck at cards is largely due to old Pomfret, the waiter. He stands behind your opponent's chair with his silver serving tray, angled in such a way that from where you sit, it mirrors every card in your opponent's hand. was a neat little trick on Holmes' part, Dr. Watson. Did Mr. Webster pay his debt? Oh, naturally. There was more than enough to cover Lady Maynard's operation and recoup our losses. But tell me, what was it Holmes had on his lucky shilling to attract the fly? A mixture of rum and sugar. 
Absolutely invisible, you know. It's an old trick invented by two famous racetrack touts in the 90s. When they had a particularly bad day at the track, they always managed to get into the same railway carriage with a heavy winner. Needless to say, by the time they'd reached London, the winner generally had empty pockets. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to tell us what story you have in store for us for next week? Mm, now, let me see. Well, next week, I think I'll tell you a story that began with a young man in a gory bandage who collapsed on my waiting room floor, and which ended with Holmes finding himself in the tightest spot, literally as well as figuratively, of his entire career. Sounds promising, Dr. Watson. What do you call the story? The Adventure of the Engineer's Thumb. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockren with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. If you'd like to serve with America's foremost military organization and yet remain at home as a civilian, Sign up as a citizen Marine with the organized Marine Corps Reserve. Inquire at your local Marine Corps recruiting office tomorrow. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Case of the Engineer's Thumb. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. In just 25 seconds, you'll hear 15 minutes of news reported by Melvin Elliott. Fly Eastern Airlines, new type constellations, nonstop to West Palm Beach in only three hours and 53 minutes. For reservations, simply call Eastern Airlines or your travel agent. The Bamberger Broadcasting Service, WOR, New York. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are as usual, toasting our hands in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fireplace. Mm, feels awfully good. Say, I thought my right hand would drop off. It got so cold tonight holding my hat coming down the street, Doctor. Mm, let's see, Mr. Harris. Yes, slightly nipped, perhaps, but uh, no real signs of frostbite. Oh, yes, reminds me of a patient I once had. Now, his hand was in a really bad way. Not from the cold, mind you, but from an encounter with a heavy and not too blunt instrument. Holmes always called it the adventure of the engineer's thumb. <laughs> I thought you were leading up to a story, Dr. Watson. The adventure of the engineer's thumb sounds sufficiently bizarre. Oh, it was, Mr. Harris, it was. Strange in its inception and dramatic in its details. Yes, I don't think I can do better than tell you that one. It began with one of the goriest patients any doctor ever had collapsed in his waiting room. And it ended with Holmes getting himself in the tightest spot he was ever called upon to get... Oh, but uh, hadn't you better say a few words first? Thank you, Doctor. 
You'll go far and wide, and you won't find quality clothes so modestly priced as Clippercraft. Because even in the face of rising markets, Clippercraft has kept its prices down. This has been possible for just one reason, a big reason. The famous Clippercraft plan. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution. Cost of production is cut way down, and you are the gainer. That's why you pay less for Clippercraft. Only $40 and $45 for a Clippercraft suit. Only $40 for a top coat or overcoat. And only $26.50 for sport jackets. What's more, they're available at your own local independent store, where you get friendly, personal attention. See for yourself. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, will you go on with your story? It was in the summer of 89, Mr. Harris, some little time after my marriage. After that important event, you remember, I abandoned Holmes and our Baker Street rooms and returned to civil practice. Oh, I still dropped in on him, of course, and now and then I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian surroundings and come and partake of a respectable Sunday dinner with Mary and me. And how did he and Mrs. Watson get along? Splendidly. She adored him, Mr. Harris. Well, uh, I had settled down and become a respectable married man. Practice steadily increasing and all that. My house was no great distance from Paddington Station, and I had a few patients from among the officials. One morning, a little before seven, I was awakened by the maid rapping frantically at my door. Dr. Watson! Oh, Dr. Watson, sir! Oh, uh, hello, yes, come in, come in. Oh, Dr. Watson, come quick. Oh, what's up, Millie? What's happened? An accident, sir, a nasty accident. Here's his card. Hmm. Mr. Victor Haverley, hydraulic engineer, 16A, Victoria Street, SW. Yes, sir. Walked over from the station, he did. I let him in. He's downstairs now in the consulting room. Looks like death, he does. Well, it can't be too serious if he had the strength to walk over from the station by himself. Looks like he's in pain, sir. It's his end, his left end. Bandaged up with handkerchief, it is. And it's all a dripping with blood, sir. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Sounds more serious than I suspected. Millie, you might go and heat some water. I'll go, go right down to him. Yes, sir. Hmm, severe hemorrhage. Wonder what the accident was. Oh, Mr. Victor Hatherley. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm sorry to wake you up so early. I had a serious accident during the night. I came in by train this morning. They told me at the station that you were a good doctor. I came here. A night journey. Hmm, that in itself is a rather tiring and monotonous affair. You couldn't call my night Monotonous? Monotonous? Never had a less monotonous night. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Pull yourself together. I, I, I'm I, sorry. I have been making a fool of myself. The, the relief, you understand. I, I apologize. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. Often happens in a case of shock. Here, take a swig of this brandy. <clears throat> that, that's better. Uh, now let's have a look at your hand. It's my thumb, Dr. Watson, or rather what used to be my thumb. Here, take a look. Good heavens, this is a terrible injury. Flesh badly mangled. Will it have to be amputated? No, 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 I think we can save it. Mm. Unpleasant wound. Must have bled considerably. Yes, it did. I, I guess I fainted when it happened. When I came to, I was still bleeding, so I tied one end of a handkerchief very tightly around the wrist and braced it with a twig. Excellent. You should have been a surgeon. Well, just a question from hydraulics, Dr. Watson, and well within my own province. Hmm. Must have been done by a very sharp and heavy instrument. Uh, a cleaver, Dr. Watson. Accident? No, an attack. A murderous attack. Dear, dear, that sounds serious. Yes, I, I shall have to tell my story to the police, I suppose, but between you and me, I doubt if they'll believe my statement. A problem, eh? <sighs> well, if it's anything of that nature you want solved, I strongly recommend my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I, I've heard of him, of course. Do you think he'd be interested? Could you, could you give me an introduction? Oh, I'll do better than that. I'll take you around to him myself. But uh, first, let's attend to this thumb. Then we'll call a cab and drop in on Holmes for a bit of breakfast. Another bit of Mrs. Hudson's omelette, Mr. Hatherley. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I feel a new man since Dr. Watson banished my hand and your excellent breakfast has completed the cure. Good. 
Now you can tell us your story if you're sure you feel strong enough. Well, I'll take up as little of your valuable time as possible. To begin with, I must tell you that I'm an orphan and a bachelor residing alone in lodgings here in London. By profession, uh, a hydraulic engineer, I had seven years' experience with the firm of Venner and Matheson before I decided to go into business for myself. Well, <clears throat> the start of any new firm is always rather slack, I suppose. Uh, so far, I've had uh, three consultations and one small job. Not what you'd call a rushing business. Well, uh, no, not exactly. Every day from nine till four, I waited in my little den until at last my heart began to sink and I began to feel I should never have any practice at all. Uh, well, I know that feeling. Yes. <laughs> Would you believe it? The first two months after I resumed my medical practice, I hardly Watson, knew Watson, I... Watson, don't interrupt. Oh, sorry. Go on, Mr. Heavily. It all began yesterday, just as I was thinking of closing up for the day. My clerk came in to say that there was a gentleman waiting to see me on business. His card gave me the name of Colonel Lysander Stark. Well, I told the clerk to show him in by all means. Hmm. Colonel Lysander Stark. Picturesque name, eh, Watson? Uh, what sort of man did he turn out to be? Slightly over middle height and exceedingly thin. I don't think I've ever seen a thinner man. His whole face sharpened away into nose and chin, and the skin was drawn tightly over his protruding cheekbones. Hmm. An invalid? No, Mr. Holmes. I should say just naturally uh, emaciated. His, his eye was bright. A trifle too bright, I thought. His step brisk and his bearing assured. He spoke with a slight German accent. I have the honor. This is Mr. Victor Hathaway, nicht wahr? Uh, why, yes, Colonel Stark. Uh, won't you sit down? Danke. You are recommended to me, sir, for a young man who is clever... And also discreet. Well, uh, oh, thank you. Not at all. I know also that you are an orphan, bachelor, and you live alone. Quite correct, but I, I don't see why that can possibly concern you. I understood that, that it was on a professional matter that you wanted to see me. Yeah, Gavis, I have a professional commission, but I must insist on secrecy, absolute secrecy. And that is easier from a man what has no family. If I promise to keep a secret, Colonel Stark, you may depend on my doing so. You promise, then? I promise. Good. Now we can get down to business. Uh, one moment, please. Yes, it is as it should be. These clerks, you know, sometimes they are so interested in the affairs of the master. Uh, bring your chair close to mine. Huh? Mm, uh, very well. Yeah. Now we can talk with safety. Uh, but if you don't mind, Colonel, my... My time is valuable. So? To whom, then? I know how much work you have done lately, my young friend. Oh. <laughs> you do not fool me. How does 50 guineas for a night's work strike you? Why, uh, well, that's very generous, Colonel Stark. I have said a night's work, an hour's work would be more correct. Your opinion is all we ask. Okay. I have a hydraulic press. It is in bad order. You show us what is wrong, we fix it ourselves. You will do that, huh? Why, uh, of course. Good. You will come tonight by the last train? Where to? Airford. That is in Berkshire. Your train arrives at 11.15. A carriage will come to meet you. Oh, your place is out in the country? Yeah, a good seven miles from the station. There's no train back. You will spend the night. Yes, but couldn't I come at a more convenient hour? Tomorrow in the daytime? Impossible. It is for your inconvenience that we pay the 50 guineas. And for the secrecy. Well, of course, but perhaps if you could explain the reason for all this, uh, this caution. Very uh, well, I explain. You know, do you not, that Fuller's Earth is a very valuable product and is to be found only in two places in England? Uh, my, yes, I believe I have heard something to that effect. Some uh, time ago I have bought a place, a very small place, you understand, and one day I am so fortunate I discover a small deposit of Fuller's Earth in my backyard. Congratulations. I investigate. I find it is a link between two so much larger deposits, but in the property which belongs to my neighbors. <laughs> These people, they do not know the value of their land. So you bought it up? No, Mr. Hatherley. I am not a rich man. I have not the money. So I speak to some of my friends, and we work our little deposit in secret, so we can earn the money to buy the land near us. Yes, but I don't understand what use you can make of a hydraulic press in excavating Fuller's earth. We, we compress the earth into bricks so we can remove them without showing what they are. That is a detail, a mere detail. So, I have 
taking you into my confidence. I expect you tonight, Mr. Hathaway. I shall be there, Colonel Stark. Good. Not a word to a soul. It is best you do not even tell anyone that you are going away. Very well, if you wish it. I not only wish, I insist. Ah, here is twenty guineas in advance. Well, are we the same, Mr. Hatterley? Sounds fishy to me, eh, Holmes? Fifty guineas is a suspiciously large fee for a small job like that. Quite, Watson, quite. Hydraulic presses, eh? Hmm. Did this emaciated German colonel have a scar on his forehead? Uh, what? Why, why, yes, now you mention it, I believe he did. Ha, I thought so. Then you know who he is, Holmes? I can guess. I can guess. But uh, go on with your story, Mr. Hatherley. You reached Erford at 11.15? Yes, Mr. Holmes. As I passed through the station gate, I found Colonel Stark waiting for me. Without a word, he hurried me into a carriage which was waiting for us both. We got in. He drew up the windows on both sides, tapped on the glass, and away we went as fast as the horse could go. One horse or two? Only one, Mr. Holmes. Did you observe the color? Yes, I saw it by the carriage lamps as I was getting it. It was a chestnut. Tired looking or fresh? Oh, fresh, fresh and glossy. Mm. Well, we drove for the better part of an hour. And from the rate at which we were going, I should say the distance we covered was nearly twelve and seven miles. Yes, interesting. What did the countryside look like? It was a dark night, Mr. Holmes. I saw nothing. Moreover, the carriage windows were made of, of frosted glass. Sounds funny to me, eh, Holmes? Mm. The roads, were they smooth or bumpy? Decidedly bumpy, Mr. Holmes. We lurched and jolted terribly. Moreover, we seemed to be going continually up and down hill. Well, finally, the bumpy road was exchanged for the crisp smoothness of a gravel drive. The carriage came to a standstill, and I got out. Can you describe the front of the house? No, I'm afraid I can't, Mr. Holmes. I was whisked into the front door so fast I could see nothing. The instant I crossed the threshold, the door slammed behind us, and I heard the rattle of the wheels as the carriage drove away. <laughs> Minna, Yeah, you've come, ma. Bring a lamp. Ah, that is better. It is not nice to keep our guests standing in the dark. So, that is good common. Yes, take the lamp into my study. Now, Mr. Hatterley, if you will be so good, come with me. Minna, you can go now. Yeah, I guess. My sister, Mr. Hatterley, a good girl. She does what she is told. And now, you will excuse me a few minutes, please. I come right back. Of course, I... Make yourself comfortable. Gloomy-looking hole. Smells musty as though it hadn't been lived in for a long time. All the windows shuttered and barred. Confound that clock. Wish it wouldn't tick like that. It gives me the jumps. Oh, hello, I... It is only me. Please, do not call out. I must tell you something. Oh, it's all right. Please don't look so frightened. No, no, it is not all right. You must go. You must not stay here. There is no good for you to do. Yes, but I came to inspect the machine. I can't leave before. No, you must. You can do no good. The last man who came, he... Oh, this is too terrible. Nina? Nina, where are you? Quick, oh, go to villain before it is too late. Quick, this way. Nina! Nina! Down this passage and out that door. It's so dark. Nina, who are you talking to? How do you run? So, you let him go, huh? Please, you will not hurt him. Don't hurt him. Wait till I get hold of him. Wait. He's coming. Run. Run. Well, I got a glimpse of him coming after me with a cleaver, and I ran. Ran for dear life. But he ran, too. I just managed to scale the garden wall before he got to it. Even so, I wasn't quite quick enough. That cleaver came down on my left hand before I could get away. What a filthy blackguard. I crawled over to some bushes as best I could and then promptly fainted. Funny he didn't come after you and finish the job, eh, Holmes? Well, the bushes hit me, I guess, but someone must have found me sooner or later. It must have been the girl, or perhaps she bribed the coachman to help me. What makes you say that? Well, when I came to, the sun was just rising. I was lying in an angle of a hedge along the high road, and just a little lower down was a long building, the Erford Station. Well, I'm blessed. Half dazed, I went to the station. The early morning train was just pulling in. I boarded it and returned to London. What I can't understand is why I should have been lured to that lonely spot. And what reason Colonel Stark can have had for making his murderous attack on me? Yes, interesting little problem. We shall have to look into it. Oh, by the way, I have a newspaper clipping I think might interest you. Uh, Watson, hand me last year's index. That's a good fellow. Right, sir. There you are. Let me see. January, the Limehouse Plague, Lady Waterfield's Pearls, February, March. 
Ah, yes, here we are. Read this. Lost on the 9th of May, Mr. Jeremiah Haling, age 26, hydraulic engineer. I say, that's a coincidence. Left lodgings at 10 o'clock at night. Has not been heard of since. Was dressed in grey tweeds, soft hat, black boots. Yes, yes, I suspect that represents the last time the colonel's machinery needed overhauling. Then that explains what the girl was trying to tell me. Undoubtedly, your colonel is a cool and desperate man, Mr. Hatherley. He lets nothing stand in the way of his little game. And, like some of our early pirates, he believes in leaving no survivors behind from a captured ship. Good heavens. Oh, I have had a narrow escape. Quite. He'd have killed you sooner or later in any event. Well, Holmes, uh, what are you going to do? I think I shall run down and have a look at that machinery for myself. But, Holmes, that's just putting your head into the lion's mouth. Yes, I only hope the lion hasn't run away. Well, at least let me go along. Well, you can come as far as Erford Station if you like. I may need reinforcements. And I'm coming too. But your wound... Oh, better... rubbish. I feel 100% improved. After all, this is my problem, and my curiosity, if nothing else, won't let me take a, a passive part in its solution. Very well. Come along, both of you. We've barely time to catch the 10.45 train. Well, here we are, Holmes. Erford Station. Now what? First of all, we must find Colonel Stark's house. I, uh, I mentioned the name to the station agent in passing. Said he never heard of it before. Yes, it's an assumed name, of course. The gentleman in question is famous for his aliases. Well, then, how are we to find the house? I brought an ordinance map of the surrounding country. Of course. I drove ten miles at the most twelve in that carriage. All we have to do is draw a circle with a radius of twelve miles and... This station is its center, then visit all the places within that limit. Yes, rather a tiresome job. I think I can lay my finger on it without all that bother. Oh, you formed your opinion. I bet I know it's in the south. The country's more deserted there. No. I'd say east. I seem to remember driving east. Wrong again. Then it was west. There are several quiet little villages over there. No, it wasn't west. Well, then I'm for the north. There are hills there. Mr. Hatherley said he drove up and down hills. <laughs> Well, you've completely boxed the compass between you. You're both wrong. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. Not at all. This is my choice. It's here we shall find the house in the center of the circle. The starting point itself. What about the 12-mile drive? Six miles out and six miles back. Then that drive was just a hoax. And there, if I'm not mistaken, is the house. Almost across the road. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure you are. Well, that's the very same wall I vaulted last night. And, and there, further down the road, are the bushes I hid in. I thought so. Well, I'll go over and have a chat with our friend Colonel Stark. Mr. Hatherley, you and Watson stay here. Why can't we go with you? Impossible, my dear Watson. I don't want to frighten Colonel Stark off before I have a look at that machine of his. Yes, but you're not a hydraulic engineer, Mr. Holmes. You wouldn't understand it. He'll suspect you immediately. I have a fairly good knowledge of hydraulics. I think it will see me through. However, if I'm not back inside of 15 minutes, you may come and get me. I may need assistance. <laughs> Most men are loyal customers of the friendly local store in their community, the store they can trust. Therefore, it's doubly pleasing that this fine independent store, the leading establishment in town, sells Clippercraft clothes. It's nice to get all the advantages of group buying at the store of your choice. And it's mighty easy on your pocketbook, too. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1,036 stores from coast to coast, bringing you beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits. At only forty and forty-five dollars, top coats and overcoats at only forty dollars, and sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now, back to Sherlock Holmes. We find him at the door of the mysterious Colonel Stark. Confound 
but you don't suppose he's made his getaway. Who are you? What do you want? Oh, how do you do? Colonel Stark, I presume? I've come to repair your hydraulic press. You, you, how dare you? Well, you see, a friend of mine, Mr. Hatherley, told me of his experience here last night. I, I said I thought he was a fool to run away like that, that you must have mistaken him for someone else last night when you chased him in the dark. Yes, uh, yes, uh, that is so. A, a suitor of my sister, a good-for-nothing scoundrel. It was all a mistake. Just as I suspected. And when Mr. Hatherley said he wouldn't come back, and when I learned what a fine fee you'd promised him, I thought, why not come and have a look for myself? Of course, why not? You two are a hydraulic engineer? Naturally. Very well, you may come in. Ah, trunks and boxes in the front hall. You're about to leave this neighborhood? Yeah, uh, the, the English climate. It is bad for my sister's health. We go to the south of France. I wonder if I might see your sister. So sorry. She is in her room. She is not well. Oh, just for a moment. Hatherley seemed to be worried about her. Said he thought you might have mistreated her last night after he got away. Uh, ridiculous. Of course, but uh, if I could just see her, I could reassure him he, uh... Seem to want to call in the police. Uh, the foolish young man. Uh, but come, I, I let you see her. This way. She shall tell you herself that she is all right. That's very good of you, I'm sure. I wouldn't dream of troubling you myself, but you see, young Heatherly is... A... This is her room. Minna? Minna? Yes? See, Minna, I bring a gentleman who is anxious to know if you are all right. Uh, tell him how you feel, huh, Minna? I am well, thank you. I'm delighted to hear it. You see, my friend Mr. Hatherley was worried about you. Mr. Hatherley? The young gentleman I mistook for someone else last night. Oh, how is he? He's all right. Why, yes, of course. Oh, I'm so glad. Hold on a minute. Look here. Those bruises on your neck and arms. Has anyone been treating you badly? Uh, that was from falling downstairs. Um, you know? Uh, yes. I see. Well, Colonel Stark, suppose we take a look at your hydraulic press. Certainly. Of course. This way, please. Uh, goodbye, Fräulein Stark. I hope you'll enjoy the south of France. The south of France? Yes. Lovely climate. Well, goodbye. This way, the press is on this floor. Here we are. Hmm. Gigantic affair, Colonel. Yes, it is capable of exerting enormous pressure. The sides are all of iron. Yes, very impressive. I pull the lever so. The water flows into the cylinders, you hear? But there's a leakage somewhere. Yes, loss of power. Yes, that third driving rod, the rubber banding around the top, seems to have shrunk. It doesn't quite fill the socket. Of course, how stupid of me not to notice for myself. Yes, it would have saved you a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? You can stop the machine now. Let's have a look at the inside. Very well, if you wish. You can enter here. Hmm. Very impressive. Like a prison. Hello, what's this on the floor? Metallic deposit. Wasn't it Fuller's Earth you're supposed to be mining? Yes, I thought you might see that. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Great thunder, he's locked me in. Started the machine. The ceiling's coming down on me. Well, Sherlock Holmes, you let yourself in for something this time. Closer. Closer, you wouldn't think it could move so fast. In a few minutes, it'll grind me to a helpless pulp. Better not think about it. I can reach it now. Down. Down. No good trying to push it back. I find it I can't stand up any longer. Well, then, sit down, Sherlock. Lower. Lower. If I lie on my face, the weight will crack my spine. No, the other way will be less painful. Please, mister. Minna, where did you come from? Here, near the floor. A panel, it's open. By Jove, another outlet. Hurry, hurry, do not talk so much. You can get out. The opening's pretty small. Quick, quick. Yes, I... I can just squeeze through. There. God sake, thank you, I'm safe. Pretty close shave. 
Hear that? The presser has just hit the floor. Another minute in there, and I'd have been ground to a pulp. So, Minna was the good angel a second time, Doctor. Yes, the great girl, that Minna. Hatherley took quite a fancy to her. In fact, she eventually became Mrs. Hatherley. Oh, and her brother? Oh, Hatherley and I caught him on his way out as he was making his getaway. He's uh, still in prison, serving a life sentence for attempted murder and counterfeiting. What a ghastly story, Doctor. So that was what the hydraulic press was used for, counterfeiting. Yes, of course, Holmes suspected it from the first. Naturally. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to give us a hint about next week's adventure? Uh, next week, I think I shall explain why the ancient statue of Charles I, which stands in Charing Cross, holds a modern sword. I may even tell you how the original sword threatened the life of one of the premier dukes of England. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Give your child a run for your money. Join the March of Dimes. Send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Keep your kids in the running. Join the March of Dimes. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Avenging Blade. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your ticket. <laughs> Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Show. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting stations. From New York, the makers of Clippercraft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Tonight there's frost on the windows of Dr. Watson's familiar study, and an overcast sky threatens another fall of snow. But as we sit snug and warm in front of a glowing fire, our thoughts turn to Sherlock Holmes and his immortal exploits. Well, which one are we to have tonight, Dr. Watson? Tonight, Mr. Harris, I think I'll tell you the case of the avenging blade. One of the most touch-and-go, not to say hair-raising adventures, it was ever my privilege to share with the sage of Baker Street. Meaning Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I was certainly not referring to Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> yes, when I think how close that sword came to decapitating the person we both... <laughs> there I go, anticipating again. But before I become further involved in the attempted murder which occurred at the base of the equestrian statue of Charles I... Suppose you stop me long enough to say a few well-chosen words on another important subject. Hmm? I'll do my very best, Dr. Watson. You may have noticed that Clippercraft clothes are never on sale at reduced prices. There's a reason for this. It's that Clippercraft clothes are so low-priced in the first place, for such remarkable quality, that sales just aren't necessary. What makes these amazing values possible? Right in your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Well, it's the famous Clippercraft plan. The plan that concentrates the buying power of 1036 great stores across the country. 
creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. You're the gainer through the efficient Clippercraft plan. That's why you pay only $40 and $45 for a Clippercraft suit, only $40 for a top coat or overcoat, and only $26.50 for sport jackets. That's why your eyes will pop with amazement when you see the fine tailoring and the rich, long-wearing fabrics at these low prices. Yes, compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now to return to the Avenging Blade, the attempted murder and the equestrian statue, Dr. Watson. Yes, yes. The famous statue of Charles I stands in Charing Cross, which, as you know, is often called the center of London. Charing Cross, isn't that the open space to the south of Trafalgar Square, Dr. Watson? Correct, Mr. Harris. But uh, to begin at the beginning, it is one of those clear, rare days in late January which now and then surprise the city of London. The sky was a brilliant blue, and the light, powdery fall of snow reflected the dazzling sunlight outside. Holmes was lounging on the sofa in a brilliant purple dressing gown, his pipe rack within his reach, ashes scattered on the floor, and the crumpled morning papers littering the room in all directions. My dear Holmes, no one could accuse you of being a tidy man. Only in my head, Watson. My brain houses what is probably the most accurate and complete collection of information in all of England, if not in the entire world. And it's all in meticulous and precise order. Conceit. Not at all, Watson, merely accuracy. But of what use are my unequal mental abilities? For months there's been no crime worthy of my attention, no case with any originality, any imagination. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You found the Shah of Baghdad's missing emerald. You outwitted the band of nihilists who were threatening to blow up both houses of Parliament. Hmm. Commonplace. Strictly routine investigations. Oh, oh there's our front doorbell. Maybe it's a case. Well, look out of the window, Watson, and see who's on the doorstep. That's a good chap. Hmm. Pity you wouldn't bestir yourself now and then. Hmm. Polish man. Dressed in Highland regalia. Bonnet, kilts. He's even wearing a Scottish dirk in his stocking. Hmm. Rather drafty attire for a day like this. By the way, Watson, what day is it? Wednesday, of course. I mean, what day of the month? Let me see. The uh, 30th, I believe. Well, at least according to the Times, it is. Yes, I think we may grant that that is one subject on which the Times is fairly accurate. The 30th of January, of course, it's the anniversary of the beheading of Charles I. So that's why he's donned his kilts. Mrs. Hudson is slow answering the door this morning. He's looking up here. Great Scott Holmes, it's the Duke of Buckinghurst. I suspected as much. Well, for heaven's sake, don't just sit there, Holmes. Help me to tidy, him, um, um, tidy up this clutter. Well, well, what sort of an impression do you expect to make sprawl there in the midst of all this mess? My dear Watson, if his lordship has a case sufficiently important to warrant my attention, he'll be in no mood to notice trifles. If not, I'm not interested in his lordship. I'm not impressed by titles, Watson. They're so apt to due to the chance of heredity, like red hair or a Roman nose. At least you might straighten your collar. Oh, come in. Oh, Lord Buckinghurst, this is an honor. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. No, 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 no not that chair. I, I think you'll find this one more comfortable. May I uh, relieve you of your bonnet? Uh, would you like a drop of brandy? Watson, if you'll stop playing the palpitating hostess, Lord Buckinghurst might like to explain why he's called to consult me. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. It's all so fantastic, I... I really don't know where to begin. If I had received this note at any other time, I'd have put it down to some poor demented half-wit. Persons in my position, Mr. Holmes, are unfortunately the recipients of a great many curious communications. Everything from begging letters to blackmail. There's nothing fantastic about blackmail in your position, Lord Buckinghurst. Consequently, that is not the gist of the letter that brought you here. Good Lord, no. But it's so well, it's incredible. I, I hardly know how to describe it. Suppose you allow me to view the letter and judge for myself. That, that would be the most sensible procedure, I suppose. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Paper, excellent quality. An educated script. Half English, half continental. Notice the final S's, Watson. Huh? Well, yes, but uh, to blaze it with the S's, what does it say? 
You must pardon my friend's lack of restraint, Lord Buckinghurst. He will never realize that the writing paper and general appearance of the letter often give me more information about the sender than the contents of the message. I think you will agree that the contents of this letter is of no small interest, Mr. Holmes. Mm, yes. Let's see. To the late Duke of Buckinghurst. Hmm, interesting. Beware the blade of the martyr king. Brief but uh, bewildering, eh, Holmes? Not entirely. Lord Buckinghurst, you are, if I am not mistaken, descended from the Duke of Buckinghurst, who was the favorite and boon companion of the ill-fated Charles I. Correct, Mr. Holmes. As the eldest of my family, it thus evolves upon me to attend the memorial services which are held every 30th of January by the Royal Martyr Society and place a commemorative wreath on the pedestal of the statue. Designed, if I am not mistaken, by Grinling Gibbons. Really? I had no idea. It's not so old as the statue, I believe. The, the, the pedestal, I mean. Quite. Tell me, Lord Buckinghurst, does this expression, the blade of the martyr king, have any particular significance to you? Why, yes and no. I presume it refers to the ancient superstition which concerns the sword in the statue's hand. Which is? Well, it seems that after the monarchy was restored, Charles II witnessed the execution of Thomas Harrison and the other regicides at Charing Cross. After the bloody event was over and his predecessor had been avenged, he made a proclamation to his followers. <laughs> Witness the fate which befalls those who dare to turn against the crown. And so that you shall be reminded thereof, I hereby decree that on this spot shall be erected the statue of my martyred ancestor, Charles. And to his hand shall be restored the sword which he carried at Marsden Moor and Naseby, and which was taken from him by the Scottish friends who foully betrayed him to his enemies. If any man dare henceforth to plot against the crown, let him beware that sword. They say, Mr. Holmes, that when a traitor to the crown approaches the statue, the sword trembles and cries out for vengeance. How is that supposed to affect you, Lord Buckinghurst? Lest if I know. And yet, uh, someone obviously wants you to believe that if you attend this ceremony today, there'll be a catastrophe of some sort. I say, why not just send word you have a bad cold and can't attend? As a medical man, I'd be more than glad to vouch for your indisposition. Never. Whoever wrote that note doesn't know me very well. If he thinks he can scare me off by any such hocus-pocus... Or he may know you very well. Tell me, Lord Buckinghurst, if you should be incapacitated on any of these occasions, who would be called on to place the wreath on the pedestal? Why, uh, my heir, of course. You uh, have a son old enough to represent you? No, Doctor Watson. I allude to my brother James. I'm a bachelor and have no children. If anything should happen to me, my brother inherits the title. By any chance, Lord Buckinghurst, was your brother educated in France? Why, uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. He attended the Sorbonne. It was while he was studying in Paris that he met Claire, uh, uh, his wife. Oh, I see what you're driving at. You think James may have written that note hoping to keep me at home so he would have the limelight in today's celebration? No, no. In the first place, my brother knows me too well for that. And in the second place, he's insufferably shy. He'd die of stage fright if he had to make a public appearance of any sort. But he will attend the ceremony. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. The entire family will be there. Hmm. Should be a rather colorful affair. What do you say we accompany Lord Buckinghurst, Watson? Oh, with pleasure. And I promise you, sir, that whatever the danger is that threatens you, you'll be quite safe with Sherlock Holmes along. Don't be fatuous, Watson. <laughs> Why do you think I dropped in this morning? But uh, we'd be better be getting along. The program begins in half an hour. Oh, there's no hurry. We have plenty of time for a stirrup cup. 
Uh, scotch, I believe, would be appropriate to the occasion. I take my advice and drink it neat. Those breezes round Charing Cross are very brash this time of year. Uh, shall I get the bottle, Holmes? No, Watson. I'll do the honours. Uh, you might fetch my greatcoat, however, and your service revolver. That's a good chap. Right, oh. I don't know whether you know it, Lord Buckinghurst, but the statue of Charles I you are about to decorate has a rather ironic history. Really? It was cast in 1633 by Hubert Le Sœur, a pupil of Giovanni Bologna, that had not yet been erected when the Civil War broke out and the first Charles was deposed and beheaded. It was subsequently sold by Parliament to a brazier by the name of Rivet. Rivet? <laughs> Appropriate cognomen, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. Mr. Rivet was ordered to melt the statue down. Rank vandalism. That's the trouble with people always wanting to destroy someone else's handiwork. Calm yourself, Watson. Remember, the statue does stand in Charing Cross today. You mean old man Rivet uh, didn't destroy the silly thing? He announced that he'd done just that. And for years, he made a tidy living out of selling fragments of metal as souvenirs to both cavaliers and roundheads. However, when the restoration came along, he sold the statue back to the government at a neat profit. It was subsequently erected on the spot where it now stands. Well, the old scoundrel. I say, uh, Lord Buckinghurst, you uh, look a bit glassy-eyed. Uh, don't you feel very fit? As a fact, I, I do feel a bit squeamish. Must be the most of the handsome cab. Never had it affect me this way before. Hold tight, we're nearly there. Just turning into Trafalgar Square. Goodness for that. Yes, look, Holmes. There's the statue up ahead. Quite a group of people gathered around. Lots of them wearing kilts, and uh, there are bagpipers. <laughs> I do enjoy a Highland air on the doodle sack, you know. Oh, here we are, Lord Buckinghurst. Good. Get me out of here. I'll be all right when I get my feet on terra firma. You would never get here. They've been waiting nearly half an hour to begin the ceremony. The pipers have grown themselves practically out of breath, keeping the crowd entertained. Sorry. Claire, my dear, may I present Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Gentlemen, this is my brother James and his wife. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Quite. Oh, how delightfully exciting. But, Robert, why a detective at a time like this? Just a precaution. Precaution? Precaution against what? Do not tell me there is something of which my brother-in-law, the indomitable Duke of Buckinghurst, is afraid. Yes, you do look a bit wonky, Robert. Is uh, anything wrong? Matter of fact, I, I do feel a trifle under the weather. Oh, there, that Finn and Hattie I had for breakfast must have upset me. James, if I should have to retire suddenly... You take over when it comes time to place the wreath. Oh, but I, 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 I couldn't. I, I couldn't really. Why not? Uh, everyone would be looking at me. I, I wouldn't know what to do. You don't do anything but carry the wreath, escorted on either side by bagpipers playing a dirge. But I... when you reach the statue, you place the wreath at its feet, and the pipers break into a Scottish battle song. That's all there is to it. Am I right, Lord Buckinghurst? That's all. Uh, James, no, I... no, I can't let him do it. James is just out of his sick bed. He would have to remove his overcoat. And in those kilts in this icy wind, it would probably kill him. The wind, Lady Clare? I say, look, the ceremony is nearly ready to begin. The minister's about to read the benediction. Uh, you'll, you'll have to excuse oh, me. Oh, Robert, you, you can't leave now. I have to, James. I, I, I think I'm going to be sick. I know I'm going to be sick. Holmes, what did you put in that scotch you gave to Lord Buckinghurst?
Here come the bagpipers with the wreath. Well, Lord Buckinghurst hasn't come back. Looks as though you'd have to carry on, Sir James. Oh, dear, dear, I... I, I do wish Robert would come back. I, I'm not at all good at this sort of thing. James, not... I forbid you to do it. You can't take off your overcoat. Let someone else place the wreath. Let Mr. Holmes do it. Uh, thank you, madam, but it's an honor to which I'm afraid I cannot aspire. My ancestors were mostly roundheads, you know. I'm afraid King Charles wouldn't approve. I wouldn't want to come within striking distance of that famous sword. Oh, you are joking. Such an amusing man. Am I? Oh, dear. Yes, they, they've noticed Robert is missing. They're bringing the wreath to me. Here, somebody hold my coat. Oh, no, James, no. Sorry, madam. You know the expression, noblesse oblige. Carry on, Sir James. Yes, I... I, I suppose I shall have to. Oh, dear, I... I wish I'd stayed in bed. James, you fool, you idiot. Not a very impressive figure, the cadet branch of the House of Buckinghurst, eh, Holmes? No man with not knee should wear kilts in public. Still, there are all kinds of courage, Watson. James, if he's reached the statue, he's... He's kneeling to place the wreath. Watson, quick, hand me your revolver. Yes, but what will you... I don't like the angle of a statue sword over his head. Oh, Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? You shall know when they start to play the battle cry. Yes, the pipers are filling their lungs. Here they go. You hit it in midair. You've broken it to bits. I prevented it from impaling Sir James's body. No, no, this is too much. It's killed him. He's lying on the ground. He's dead. Calm yourself, madam. Your husband's only fainted. The sword missed him completely. Oh. Watson, you go and revive Sir James. I'll attend to her ladyship here. Oh, very well, Holmes. Now, madam. Now what, Mr. Holmes? Why did you attempt to kill your husband's brother? You knew the vibrations of the wild Stuart battle cry on the bagpipes would dislodge the loosened sword in the statue's hand. You knew it would probably pierce the back of anyone kneeling below. You screamed to warn your husband before the sword fell. <laughs> mon cher monsieur Holmes, you are almost as clever as people say you are. I will not bother to deny your accusations. Why should I? There is nothing you can prove. What have I to be afraid of? The man you hired to loosen the sword in the statue's hand. With my sources of information, it shouldn't take me more than 24 hours to find him. With my powers of persuasion, it shouldn't take me more than 24 minutes to make him talk. What is that expression they teach the children in this country, Mr. Holmes? Do not count the chickens until they are hatched? <laughs> It's no trick to make ordinary clothes at low prices, but it takes real manufacturing genius to produce really fine clothes that not only look far above, but are far above the modest price you pay for them. That's why we say try on a Clippercraft tomorrow. It'll be hard to believe you're getting so very much for so very little. 
such expert tailoring, smart styling, and superb long-wearing fabrics. This tremendous feat is accomplished through the renowned Clipper Craft Plan, which concentrates the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. It brings you Clipper Craft suits at only $40 and $45, top coats and overcoats at only $40, and sport jackets at only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clipper Craft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. We find them standing in the dim light of a street lamp which marks the entrance to a crooked lane in Soto. Large flakes of falling snow intensify the expectant silence of the winter night. How much longer do we have to wait out here in this confounded snow, Holmes? It's up to midnight. We shall wait here, Watson, until the Lady Claire arrives to pay a visit to the artisan who loosened the sword for her. You see, I was better than my promise. I tracked him down in less than 24 hours. What makes you so sure she'll come? She must, Watson. As long as Andre Bogard is alive, he's a threat to her safety. You think she'll try to finish him off? My dear Watson, a woman who's capable of attempting to murder her husband's brother so that he may inherit, is capable of anything. Holmes, uh, when did you first suspect the Dixon? From the beginning. The letter of warning had to be written either by James or his wife. They were the only two who'd benefit by the death of Lord Buckinghurst. They were the only two who knew him well enough to know the effect the letter would be bound to have on him. You mean he'd attend the ceremony come hell or high water? Exactly. James didn't duck when the bagpipes burst into that violent squalling. Claire, however, screamed to warn him. Hence, she was the guilty party. QED. Here comes a four-wheeler. Yes, it's turning down this alleyway. Down behind these barrels, Watson. Stopped in front of Bogard's shop. I see she's... She's not getting out. No. She's seen Andre's shadow on the blind. Yes, she's lowering the cab window. A woman's hand comes out of the window. It's holding a revolver. Very well, Lestrade, you have your proof. You may come down from the driver's seat and arrest the lady. You... Sherlock Holmes. Yes, better you use handcuffs on her, Lestrade. By the way, madam, this should teach you, never, when on a secret mission, never take the first cab that presents itself. You never know who the coachman is. Oh, and uh, thank you so much for your display of marksmanship. I think it will persuade Andre to tell us all we wish to know. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I never miss. It is too late for Andre to tell anyone anything. I'm so sorry to disillusion you, but... It was, wasn't Andre's head your bullet hit. What? Merely a cleverly arranged silhouette of the man. I cut it out of cardboard myself only an hour ago. Oh. You see, Lady Claire, I have artistic blood in my veins. Or didn't you know? You. I think you are the devil himself. No, madam, only his second cousin. <laughs> All right, Lestrade, you may take it away. was a touch-and-go adventure, Dr. Watson, just as you promised. But tell me, what did Holmes put in the Duke of Buckinghurst's scotch? Something out of my medical kit, I'm afraid. Something called Epicac. It's a well-known emetic. You see, Holmes had to be sure the Duke of Buckinghurst would not be able to perform his part of the ceremony. Oh, I see. And now, Dr. Watson, what's the theme of next week's story? Well, next week, I'm going to take you back to Hurlstone, Mr. Harris. Hurlstone? Wasn't that the ancient manor house that was the scene of the Musgrave ritual? Right. 
Next week's story is a different one, however. It concerns a gruesome family ghost story told by Reginald Musgrave's newly acquired wife and how Mr. Plunkett, the pickle king, insisted on sleeping in the room where Charles I had slept and how the ghost story was reenacted with more accuracy than anyone had believed possible. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockram, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the sanguinary specter. like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting system. Be sure to hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest headline news, which follows in just a moment. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type constellation with 300 million passenger miles of dependability. Fly Eastern Airlines. Remember, there's no finer way to travel. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's adventure, The Case of the Sanguinary Specter. Well, here we are, Dr. Watson. This time it's a sleet storm we've waited through to reach your cheerful fireside. And the Sherlock Holmes adventure, Mr. Harris. Let's not forget that's the real lodestone that brings you on these periodic pilgrimages. Right, Doctor. Nor sleet, nor snow, nor dark of night can keep this Sherlock Holmes addict from his weekly story, believe me, to paraphrase a much more famous quotation. Very flattering, I'm sure, Mr. Harris. Well, what's tonight's adventure about, Doctor? Well, tonight I think I'll tell you how Holmes revisited the ancient manor called Hurlstone. And how the lady of the manor told a ghostly story which turned out to be more authentic than even she anticipated. What with the blood that drips slowly out of the wainscoting. But, dear me, speaking of authenticity and the like, reminds me that you have a word or so to say about one of the few genuine bargains still left in this world of soaring prices and disappearing values. Oh, you wouldn't by any chance be alluding to clippercraft toes, Dr. Watson. What else, Mr. Harris? What else? Well, it doesn't take the American public long to recognize a fine product. No, true merit always gets a real spotlight. And clippercraft clothes have that kind of merit. Clippercraft's out-of-this-world values are recognized across the country. And for just one reason are these values superior... That reason, of course, is the famous Clippercraft plan. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. Not only do you pay less for Clippercraft, but they're sold by your own local independent store where you get friendly personal attention. Think of it, truly fine Clippercraft suits 
for only $40 and $45. Beautifully tailored top coats and overcoats for only $40 and sport jackets for only $26.50. Simply compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to the ghost of Hurlston Manor, Dr. Watson. Hurlston. Say, wasn't that the ancient country home of the Musgraves where Holmes discovered the crown of the Stuart King? Correct, Mr. Harris. Absolutely correct. But uh, this is another story. Uh, to begin at the beginning, Holmes, as you know, in his uh, cerebral processes, was the neatest and most methodical individual. But in his personal habits, he was the untidiest man that ever drove a fellow lodger to distraction. <laughs> Not that I'm what you'd call painfully tidy myself. Oh, now, Dr. Watson, you're always neat as a pin. With clipper crafts, that's easy. But uh, don't interrupt me. Where was I? Oh, yes, yes. I'm certainly not what you'd call prissy, but when I find a man who keeps his cigars in the coal scuttle, his tobacco in the toe of a Persian slipper, and his unanswered correspondence transfixed by a jackknife in, in the very center of the mantelpiece, I... <laughs> Then I begin to give myself virtue of <laughs> I don't wonder, Doctor. Imagine then my surprise when on returning one afternoon from making my medical rounds, I found Holmes in a stiff collar and wearing his Prince Albert. Furthermore, he was tidying up his chemical table and kicking his notebooks, papers, and other impedimenta out of sight under the sofa. <laughs> I'm to be queen of the May, mother, for I'm to be queen of the May. Holmes, what in heaven's name is the... Watson, your overshoes. Kindly leave them outside. Can't have you tracking mud about. Uh, Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? Aren't you feeling well? Certainly I'm feeling well. Never felt better. But don't stand there with your mouth open like a ninny. Help me clear this liver off the sofa. But what here, what... here, take this gasogene and the morning papers. And, and here's the microscope and your top hat. Oh, good Lord, there she is now. Who? Mrs. Reginald Musgrave, of course. She's coming to pay us a call. Well, well don't just stand there with that stuff. Put it away somewhere. Oh, where, for the love of heaven? Behind the curtains or, or, or the door. No, wait. Chuck it here in the umbrella stand. Oh. Hurry. All right, all right. There. Ah. All neat and ship Not a thing out of place. Except your back hair, Watson. Do slap it down. There's a good chap. Oh, go to blazes. Well, well, open the door for Mrs. Musgrave. Open the door. Oh, Holmes, you are the most exasperate. Waiting man, the most... How do you do, well, Dr. Watson? Won't you come in, Mrs. Musgrave? Why, it's not Mrs. Musgrave at all. It's the Honorable Alice Adair, Lady Maynooth's charming sister-in-law. I was Alice Adair, Dr. Watson, until Mr. Holmes introduced me to his old classmate, Reginald Musgrave, some months ago. It was one weekend last spring when he escorted Lady Maynooth and myself down to Sussex to view the, Sus the Stuart crowd. Right then and there, I fell in love with Hurlston and determined to become its mistress. Of course, I had to marry Reggie to accomplish my purpose. Hmm. Had a meeting out of her hand inside of 20 minutes. One flutter of her eyelid and Reggie was a goner. And I never knew you even met the blighter. Sherlock, you mean you didn't tell him about the wedding? Now, really, that's too bad of you. Mr. Holmes was best man, Dr. Watson. Oh. Reggie and I were married in the registry office. You know how skittery middle-aged bachelors are about a big wedding. Well, my dear Alice, how are things at Hurlstone? Dreadful. I'm so annoyed with Reggie, I'm hardly speaking to him. If he goes through with it, I shall divorce him, whether I have grounds or not. Goes through with what? He's threatening to sell the estate. Oh, good Lord, no. Why, the Musgraves have always lived at Hurlstone. That's what I keep telling him. Well, besides, it's famous. It's the oldest inhabited building in the county. That's what he keeps telling me. He says it's too old to be inhabited any longer. He has absolutely no feeling for all those darling old mullioned windows and the beautiful old mantelpieces and paneling. Keeps on telling me it's damp and drafty. It's his rheumatism, of course, that makes him so unreasonable. That and that wretched Stuart crown you discovered for him, Sherlock. Did you have to do that? But, my dear Alice, he was delighted when we found the royal diadem. If I'd handed him a million pounds, he couldn't have been more excited. Well, it's turned out to be a regular Frankenstein's monster. People come from all over to see the stupid thing. They come in droves, by carriage and charabar and lorry. They come and bring their lunches. We haven't a moment's privacy. Hmm. Why doesn't he send it off to a museum where it belongs? Because that's what the government wanted him to do in the first place. Well, things have been going from bad to worse. All those trippers tramping through the shrubbery were bad enough. 
But that dreadful boy yesterday afternoon, that's what really put the pant... Uh, the, the petticoats on the queen. What uh, boy are you referring to, Alice? That horrible little urchin we found in the tea garden, pulling up Reggie's prized petunia by the roots. Here, here, I say. What's this? What's this? Oh, it's Alfie, Governor. Picking wildflowers, he is. <laughs> How he do love nature. Well, tell him to stop. Those are not wild flowers. Those are my best imported French petunias. French, eh? Well, what do you know? Here, that's enough, Alfie. Now, uh, that's enough posies. And uh, now we'll go and see the pretty crown. I don't want to see no crown. I want a big posy. Now, stop it, I say. Put that plant back where you found it. <laughs> I do like the old man tells you, Alfie. <laughs> and wipe your nose. <laughs> Oh, tell him to stop that infernal racket, or I shan't permit you to see the crown at all. Here now, here now, hold on there. You can't refuse to let Alfie see the crown. It's historic. He's got as much right to look at it as you have. That settles it. I'll sell the place, and the grounds, and the ruddy crown as well. I'll sell it to Plunkett, the pickle king. See if I don't. Good Lord, don't tell me old Plunkett has offered to buy Hurlston. So it seems, Sherlock. I told Reggie if he even thought of it, I'd never speak to him again. But that only made him more determined. You've no idea how obstinate he can be. Uh, pig-headed is the word, my dear Alice. Mm, well, yes, well, perhaps you're right. That's what comes of his staying a bachelor until he was pushing 40. <laughs> Hear that, Watson? That would be a lesson to you. He was probably waiting until you happened along, Mrs. Musgrave. Why, Dr. Watson, what a charming thing to say. You must make Sherlock bring you down for the weekend. Thank you. What weekend? I'm attending no elegant weekend parties at Hurlstone. Oh, yes, you are. You're responsible for this brainstorm of Reggie's. If you hadn't discovered that wretched crown, you wouldn't want to sell the place. And if it weren't for the crown, I'm sure Hennessy Plunkett wouldn't dream of buying it. Hurlstone in the possession of Hennessy Plunkett, the pickle king. It would be sacrilege. He even talks about putting out a new brand, Crown Pickles, with a picture of the Stuart Crown on the bottle. Oh, shocking bad taste, I hope. Mm. I will not have that dreadful old vulgarian strutting around the property. He'd ruin it in no time. Sherlock, you and Dr. Watson simply must come down and help me to save Hurlston from that pickle peddler. <laughs> It, but how delightful to have you here for a visit. Never buy anything before I've tried a sample of it, ma'am. Might not be able to sleep here. Get terrible insomnia sometimes in the country. Well, uh, of course, the frogs and crickets around Hurlston are rather noisy. Oh, rot. Divas, take Mr. Plunkett's things up to the blue room, next to the bar. Uh, hold on there, Musgrave. Is that the room King Charles hid out in when he was beating it up north to Scotland? No, the steward room is in the old wing, Mr. Plunkett. You wouldn't want to sleep there. There's... Uh... Uh, well, there's no plumbing in that part of the house. Oh. Look here, Miss Musgrave. I was a grown man before I even knowed there was such a thing as indoor plumbing. Besides, what's good enough for King Charles is good enough for me. Uh, yes, but uh, that is, uh, if you're a light sleeper, well, the ghost might keep you awake. Ghost? Look here, Musgrave, you didn't tell me Hurlstone had a ghost. Why, of course. The steward room has always had a ghost. Well, ridiculous. Charles didn't die there, Alice. He only hid there for a week or so. <laughs> Pay no attention to Reggie, Mr. Plunkett. He doesn't begin to know all the historical facts about this house. Now, since I came here, I've been reading up on all the old documents in the library. This house has had a frightening and gory history, Mr. Plunkett. Oh, Alice, really? Well, what do you know? <laughs> I guess those Britishers were kind of rugged in the olden days. So the place has a ghost. Uh, you know, I've always sort of had a hankering to meet a spook. Don't have any where I come from. Really? No ghosts in Pittsville? Pittsburgh. Oh. That's where I hail from, Miss Musgrave. I was born in a shack in Shantytown. Imagine if I was to end up sleeping in the bed King Charles slept in. <laughs> With a ghost beside. <laughs> it's rather an unpleasant ghost, I'm afraid. Uh, the ghost of Lady Daphne, who shot her lover in the wainscoting. You don't say uh, tell me about it. Well, it seems that Lady Daphne's husband was always going off to the wars, leaving her behind with her housekeeping and her needlework. Now, women didn't read in those days, you know, so she had no good books to divert her mind. Suddenly, one morning, a young huntsman, all in green, drove up on a chestnut stallion. Oh, nice color combination, my dear. Oh, don't interrupt, Reggie. Sorry. Uh, well, 
it, it seemed that he'd been uh, gored by a deer or something. So Lady Daphne put him in the best guest room. Uh, the one King Charles had made famous. Oh, don't be <laughs> stupid, Reggie. No. This was back in the days of the Plantagenets. The Stuarts hadn't even been heard of. Lady Daphne nursed the huntsman back to health and fell in love with him. It created quite a scandal, I guess, because pretty soon even old Lord Musgrave heard about it and came sneaking back from the wars one dark night. Very unsporting of them. Eh, Musgrave? Rather, yes. <laughs> well, of course, you couldn't really sneak very successfully in the armor they wore in those days. So the Lady Daphne and her lover heard him tiptoeing up the hall. And quick as a flash, Lady Daphne shoved her lover into a sort of cupboard in the wainscoting. And when Lord Musgrave came clattering in, she was back in bed, sound asleep. She looked so pretty there, he, he didn't have the heart to wake her. He just called a couple of his serving men, and they boarded up the closet with the lover inside. And the lady and her lover were so terrified, they never said boo. And the poor chap just sat there and quietly suffocated to death. Reggie! I thought you didn't know that story. Mm, yes, I fancy I've read that uh, manuscript at some time or other. Well, finally, after several days, the Lady Daphne couldn't stand the strain any longer. She took out her husband's revolver and fired a shot through the wainscoting. And pretty, pretty soon, a slow trickle of blood came out onto the floor. Well, that's a departure I hadn't read about. Lord Musgrave pretended not to notice, but went calmly back to the walls. The Lady Daphne's hair turned completely white, of course... And you can still see her wandering about the room, moaning and wringing her hands. So, dear Mr. Plunkett, I really don't think you should sleep in the steward room if you suffer from insomnia. Oh, don't you worry, Miss Musgrave. If anyone's going to be scared tonight, it'll be Lady Daphne, not me. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Watson, the port, Sherlock. That's a good fellow. His glass is empty. Oh, oh, oh. What's up, Reggie? Oh, just a twinge in my left knee. Must be a storm coming up. That knee's a regular barometer. Hmm. Dashed fine port you have, Musgrave. Must be old. My dear Mr. Plunkett, the port in this house was laid down by my great-grandfather. Oh, you don't say. Um, the cellar goes to the house, of course. Well, what remains of it? There are only three bottles left beside this one. I'm afraid all my forebears have been uh, heavy port drinkers. The Musgrave port has always been famous, Mr. Plunkett. Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. Nothing could persuade me to part with a place that we still had the cellar we had in my grandfather's or even my father's day. Oh, well. Sick chance at Gloria Mundi. Oh, 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 confound that knee. <laughs> it's a reliable weather prophet at any rate. Here comes the storm. Uh, can't say I like thunderstorms and never have. Got some bad ones in the Alleghenies when I was a boy. I've seen lightning bounce off of those mountains like it was the devil playing nine pin. Always crawled into my old man's feather bed when I heard it coming. Lightning can't get you if you're in a feather bed. Yeah. You wouldn't have a feather bed here at Hurlstone, would you? Why, yes, we uh, have some either down coverlets, I believe. But uh, don't you think it'll be too warm? I mean, it's only the beginning of September. It ablazes with the heat. You tell Devers to bring me a couple up to my room. I'm going to get into bed right now. Uh, Devers, uh, you can light the fire in that fireplace. Yes, sir, but if you're going to retire, now, sir... Now, don't give me an argument. Lightning has a habit of coming down chimneys. It's on account of the draft on the cold air. But if there's a fire lit and there's hot air going up, it can't get in. Dear, dear, that was a close one, wasn't it? Sounded like it hit the old oak. Lightning is always hitting the old oak, but mm. it doesn't seem to mind. <laughs> that was the oak mentioned in the ritual, you know. I've been here since the Norman invasion, they say. Well. Light that fire, Dad, blast it. Yeah, very good, sir, very good. Uh, uh, there you are, sir. Uh, here, help me off of my boots. Uh, why... You are shivering, sir, and that's a fact. I, mm. I can even hear your teeth chattering. Never mind my teeth. Hand me my nightshirt. Uh, yes, yes, very good, sir. Uh, uh, shall I bring you some water to wash and brush your teeth in? I don't brush my teeth. I hurt them out. Uh. Out of the way! I'm getting into bed. Very, very good, sir. Uh, uh, anything else, sir? Just get out and leave me to get to sleep. Uh, yes, sir. If you should want anything, I'm afraid you'll just have to yell, sir. There's no bell in this part of the house. Yell good and loud, sir, and maybe someone will hear you. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, I'll blow out the candle, huh? Mm. 
Uh, 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 good night, sir. Uh, pleasant dreams. Uh. Oh, bed's as cold as an icebox. <sighs> Storm's blowing over, thank heaven. What's that? Hmm. Mice. Must be mice. Whole place probably full of mice. Have to clean them out if I buy the house. Now what? Woodwork creaking. Always does in old houses. Lord, it's quiet. Can't even hear the storm. What's that? Sounds like a woman's skirts. There's a draft. Casement must have blown open. It's a curtain rustling. That's what it is. Old houses, full of drafts, noises. Um, maybe I should think twice before I buy the place. Still, Plunkett's crown pickles with a picture of the Stuart crown. Yeah, good advertising. It sounds just like a woman's petticoat. Confound it, that fire's dying down. Shadows. Nothing but shadows. That is a woman's petticoat. But I can't see anyone. Oh, rubbish, Plunkett. No such thing as ghosts. No such... No such... What's that? Ah, wind coming up. Wind in the chimney. Pour yourself together, Plunkett. Wonder what time it is. A light match. Look at my watch. It's half a minute to midnight. Midnight. When the ghosts and goblins. No! Match burn my fingers. Ah. Confound that creaking. I'm beginning to imagine things. Funny. I swear there was someone else in this room with me. No, don't be an idiot, Plunkett. Who could it be? Who could possibly be here? Uh, it's got a shot. A gunshot. Right here in this room. <laughs> Help! Help! Someone's shooting at me! Help! Matches. I light the candle. Gotta get out of here. Oh! Oh! Floor is icy. Floor is... Oh! Oh! There's something wet and sticky. I stepped in it. Oh, blessed. My hand's shaking so I can't light the candle. Oh, at last. Now let's have a look. There is something on the floor. It's red. It's blood. It's trickling out of the wainscoting beside the fireplace. Help! Help! Get me out of here! Get me out! What's the matter? Are you hurt, Mr. Plunkett? Yes. Shots. Musgrave. You heard the shots. That ghost came in and shot at me. Oh, nonsense. Alice only made up that story. There couldn't be... Oh, no, you don't. I know what I've been shot at. You couldn't give me this house now. Where's my pants? Oh, don't be an ass, Plunkett. No one could have shot at you. There was no one in this room but yourself. Maybe no living person. But look over there, next to the fireplace. Someone shot that hole in the woodwork. Oh, rubbish. That's a knot hole. Just a knot hole. Oh, yeah? Then what is that stuff trickling out onto the floor? Great heavens, Reggie. It's blood. Of course it's blood. Where's my coat and shoes? But it can't be blood. No one could be behind the paneling. Why, well, this is too fantastic. I'm going to rip open the woodwork. I wouldn't advise it, my dear Reggie. Not while Mr. Plunkett's here. He doesn't look as if he could stand another shock. Better not reveal the Musgrave horror before strangers, don't you know? Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. I don't want no truck with family skeletons. I've had enough. I'm getting out. I don't ever want to see any part of Hurlstone again. Wait, Mr. Plunkett, you can't go like that. A blaze as I can. Good morning. But you've forgotten your teeth. <laughs> Now, 
now, before Sherlock Holmes and Reginald Musgrave discover what lies behind the wainscoting, may I give you a suggestion? Take an expert like your wife or your best girl along with you when you go to choose your new Clippercraft suit or overcoat. See her amazement when she sees the beautiful tailoring, the clean-cut smartness, and the firm, long-wearing fabrics that are yours at such modest prices. She'll say, how do they do it? Just as everyone else does when they're face-to-face for the first time with Clippercraft. Forty and forty-five dollars for Clipper Craft suits, forty dollars for top coats and overcoats, and twenty-six fifty for sport jackets are low prices that are the result of the famous Clipper Craft plan. They'd be impossible without this wonderful idea that concentrates the buying power of ten hundred thirty-six stores across the nation. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores. Is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan? That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker's Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now to return to Hurlston Manor, where Sherlock Holmes and Reginald Musgrave are ripping away the wainscoting in the steward room. Oh, dear. I do wish you wouldn't open up that paneling, Reggie. Better let sleeping dogs lie and all that. I had no idea that ghost story I made up would turn out to be true. Stop glittering, Alice, and hand me that chisel. Oh, I wish I'd never thought up that ghost. I wish I'd never mentioned it to old Plunkett. I never dreamt there would be anything behind that paneling. Now, calm yourself, Alice. It's not as bad as you think it is. As a matter of fact, I suspect that Reggie is in for a rather pleasant surprise. But there was a shot. Two shots. I heard them distinctly. Two explosions, possibly. Shots, no. I rather imagine the heat of the fire caused them. Reggie, how long since you've had a fire in that fireplace? Well, never. At least not as long as I can remember. And no one's used this part of the house since the other wing was built during the reign of William and Mary. Oh, confound it. This paneling won't budge. Now, yeah, I finally got a wedge in. Yeah, here, help me pry it loose. One, two... Oh, Reggie, I wish you wouldn't. Three. Ah. Ah. By Jove, Holmes, there is a closet back of the paneling. But it's filled with bottles. Dozens and dozens of bottles covered with dust and cobwebs. Yes, and two of the bottles have exploded from the heat of the fire. Well, here. Let's have a look at one of them. It won't be necessary. I can tell you what's in them. Port. Excellent port. I rather suspect, my dear Reginald, that your revered grandfather had a rather special hiding place in this room. But how do you know it's port? By the aroma. My olfactory nerves are rather highly developed, you know. The moment I entered the room, I knew that the ruddy fluid Mr. Plunkett had stepped into wasn't blood but something far more interesting, a superior and venerable vintage of port wine. Good Lord, and to think I nearly sold the place to that old ruffian with all these bottles still in it. I'd never have forgiven myself. He'd never have appreciated them, never. Oh, Reggie, then you're not angry with me for spoiling your sale? I just couldn't bear to think of leaving Hurlston. Oh, there, there, my dear, I forgive you. And the next time you think up a ghost story, do try to be a bit more original. Why, Reggie, what do you mean? If old Plunkett hadn't been a complete ignoramus, he'd have recognized the incident of the lover being bricked up in the woodwork. It's one of the most famous bits of French literature, you know. By Jove, of course. No wonder I thought it sounded familiar. I don't so much mind your swiping your plots, my dear Alice. The best storytellers do, you know. Ask Dr. Watson. Now, really, Holmes. You must try to be a trifle more accurate, you know. Anachronisms are taboo, my dear, in the best literary circles. Why, Sherlock, what do you mean? No Plantagenet lady would go popping at her lover with a pistol. Why not? They hadn't been invented. Oh, I'll admit gunpowder was not unknown. Cannon were undoubtedly used at Crecy and Poitiers, but personal firearms for private homicide were quite unavailable. Oh, dear. Next time I'll say she finished him off with a bow and arrow. <laughs> well, never mind the historical inaccuracies. Uh, opening this panel has been dusty work, and I, I'm parched. Uh, what do you say we break out a bottle and see if the uh, contents of Grandfather's private vault is up to standard? An excellent idea, my dear Reggie. An excellent idea. Very well. But I warn you, this is one time the ladies do not leave the table while the port goes round. (laughs) 
Well, Dr. Watson, that certainly was an unusual Sherlock Holmes adventure, when the stain on the floor turns out to be wine instead of blood. Oh, we had our lighter moments, Mr. Harris. We had our lighter moments, but don't get too relaxed, because next week's adventure is a real old-fashioned hair razor. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I made a very sinister discovery in the ancient burial crypt at Shoscombe Old Place and how it explained the strange behavior of Lady Falder's spaniel. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Boys will be Boy Scouts, if an adult will give them a hand. Boy Scout Week now is in full swing, a time when thousands of adults ask you to join them in the game of scouting for better citizenship. Full details from the National Council, Boy Scouts of America, at 2 Park Avenue, New York, 16, New York. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the adventure of Shuscombe Old Place. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Co. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. Stay with us for the news reported by Melvin Elliott, which follows presently. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. And so once again we raise the familiar brass door knocker of Dr. John Watson. Well, well, Mr. Stark, come in, come in. This is indeed a pleasure. I've been told we'll have to get along with a substitute for Mr. Harris for a few weeks, but I had no idea he'd turn out to be an old friend. I, uh, well, I wore my Clippercraft suit, Dr. Watson, so it wouldn't seem too strange in this program. Uh, what's on the agenda for tonight? Well, it concerns the strange and slightly horrendous affair at Soscombe Old Place in which Holmes investigated the graves in an ancient burial crypt. Hmm, sounds promising. And unearthed the fact that certain bones had been disposed of in the furnace. Wow, my hair is beginning to stand up on end already. <laughs> yes, but the adventure began placidly enough one rainy morning. Holmes and I had just finished an excellent breakfast in our rooms in Baker Street. I was gazing idly through the sporting columns, trying to decide what horse to back in the forthcoming derby... And uh, Holmes? Uh, Holmes was pottering around with a a low-piled microscope, doing some sort of an experiment. Daredevil quoted his favorite, eh? Up and atom, odds ten to one. Shoskum Prince, forty to one. Wonder what's brought the odds down on that horse. Aha, clue, Watson. It's glue. Jack Horner and Break a Day. And, uh, what did you say, Holmes? I was merely telling you the phenomenal fact that the microscope showed that there's glue in this bit of dust. Glue? Hmm. What difference does it make, glue or paste or even sticking plaster? Well, can't you see I'm busy? Lucky lady, bride of Cornwall. And... The fact that there is glue in this dust is going to cost a man his life. And uh, I say, cost a man's life? 
glue. Hmm. Now you're interested, eh, Watson? Well, come over here and take a peek through this microscope. Well, it's nothing but a blur to me. Wait, let me adjust it. There, what do you see now? Some long, matted hairs. Those are infinitesimal fibers from a tweed cap, the criminal's tweed cap. The irregular gray masses are dust. These are epithelial scales on the left. Yes, but what are those shiny amber-colored crystals in the center? That is the glue. Yes, but how does a man's life depend on those? In the St. Pancras case, you may remember that a cap was found beside the dead policeman. The accused man denies it's his. The stuff under the microscope was taken from one of the seams of that cap and proves the man was lying. But how? The man is a picture frame maker who habitually handles glue. Well, that case is closed. I had a new client who was due to call at ten. He's late. By the way, Watson, you have some knowledge of horse racing, I believe. Well, I ought to. <laughs> it's cost me about half my year's pension. Good. Then you can be my handy guide to the turf, as I believe you call your racing Bible. Well, what would you like to know? Does the name Sir Robert Norberton mean anything to you? Oh, rather. He lives at Shoscombe Old Place. Yes, it's the man himself. What's he like? Tall, muscular, has a devil of a temper... He once horsewhipped Sam Brewer, the Curzon Street moneylender on Newmarket Heath. Hmm, interesting. Does he often indulge in such pastimes? Well, he has the reputation of being a dangerous man, the most daredevil rider in Europe. See, he won the Grand National a few years back. One of those men who have missed their true generation. <laughs> he would have been a buck in the days of the Regency. A boxer, a heavy gambler, a devil with the ladies, and a first-class shot. Capital Watson, a perfect thumbnail sketch. Now, can you give me some idea of Shoscombe Old Place? Well, not much, only that it's very ancient and situated in the centre of Shoscombe Park, and that the famous Shoscombe stables and training quarters are to be found there. And, and the head trainer is John Mason. I see. How did you deduce that? I didn't have to. John Mason's my most recent client. This letter asking for an appointment is from him. But uh, go on. What else is there of interest about the place? Well, there are the famous Shoscombe Spaniels. You hear of them in every dog show. Spaniels, eh? Uh, they're the special pride of the lady of Shoscombe Old Place. Sir Robert's wife? No, Sir Robert has never married. He lives with his widowed sister, Lady Beatrice Folger. You mean she lives with him? No, I, not at all. I said what I meant. The place belonged to her late husband. Lady Beatrice has only a life interest. It reverts at her debt to her husband's brother. Hmm, her husband's brother, eh? Meantime, she draws the rents every year. And Brother Robert spends them. Yes, that's about the size of it. They're always quarreling, and yet I've heard they're devoted to each other. But what's amiss at Shoscombe? That's just what I'd like to know. What the... And that, if I'm not mistaken, is the man who can tell us, the trainer, John Mason. Yes, here he comes up the stairs. Come in, come in. Ah, Mr. Mason, I am Sherlock Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. You read my note? Yes, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, Mr. John Mason. How, How do you do, sir? Please be seated. Now, Mr. Mason, what's the difficulty? Your note explained nothing. The matter's too delicate for me to put on paper. Much too complicated. I had to see you face to face. We are at your disposal. Mr. Holmes, I think my employer has gone mad. My dear Mr. Mason, this is Baker Street, not Harley Street. We do not pretend to be brain specialists. Well, gentlemen, when a man does one queer thing, or even two, but when everything he does is queer, well... I believe Shoscombe Prince and the Derby have turned his brain. Shoscombe Prince? That's the colt you're running, isn't it? Yes, sir. The best in England, if I do say so. I'll be playing with you, because I, I know you're a gentleman of honor, and it won't go beyond this room. Sir Robert has got to win the Derby. He's up to his neck in debts, and, well, it's his last chance. Everything he can raise or borrow is on that horse. If Prince fails him, he's done for. Hmm, sounds like rather a desperate gamble, but that doesn't necessarily mean the man's insane. Where does the madness come in? First of all, his looks, sir. His eyes are wild. I don't believe he sleeps at nights. He's down at the stables at all hours. Then, sir, there's, there's his conduct to his sister, Lady Beatrice. She loved the horses as much as he did. Every day she'd drive down to see him, and above all, she loved Prince. He'd trick up his ears when he heard the wheels of a carriage on the gravel, and out he'd trot to get his lump of sugar... But that's all over now. She drives by every morning without so much as a good day to you. You think there's been a quarrel? Yes. A bitter, savage one it must have been. Why else would he give away a pet spaniel that she loved as if he were a child? To whom did he give it? To old Barnes, what keeps the Green Dragon three miles away at Crindle. Hmm. Curious, eh, Watson? Yeah. Of course, with her weak heart and dropsy, you couldn't expect her to get about much with her brother. 
But Sir Robert spent two hours every evening in her room. Now he never goes near her. She's taken it to art, she has, sir. Brooding and sulky and drinking, Mr. Holmes. Drinking like a fish. Mm. Did she ever do that before this estrangement? Well, she took a glass regular every evening, but now as often as not, it's a old bottle. There's something rotten about it, Mr. Holmes. Then there's the goings-on down at the old church crypt at night. The haunted crypt, we call it. Haunted? Yes, Mr. Holmes. There's an old ruined chapel in the park. So old, nobody can fix its date. And under it, there's a crypt. A crypt where all the ancestors of Lady Beatrice's husband lie buried, including the man himself. Well, sir, that crypt has got a bad name among us. It's dark and damp enough by day with the weeds breaking through everywhere, but at night it's worse. Standing there in the moonlight, it's broken arches, gleaming like ghosts. There's not many in the countryside that have the nerve to go near it at night. But I gather you did, or there'd be no story. Yes, sir. Me and the butler Stevens. We was taking a walk in the moonlight, smoking a pipe before going to bed. When all of a sudden, we notices a light, sort of pale and unearthly-like, shining in the old chapel. There we stood, Stevens and me, quaking in the bushes like two bunny rabbits. See that, Mason? It's a light in the old chapel. Yeah. Someone's in there. Or something. I don't like the look of it. It isn't natural. What's going on in a chapel this time of night? Yeah, we'd best go and find out. Oh, for heaven's sake, no. Maybe it's something evil. Some bad spirit set its light there to lure some poor fella to his death. Uh, wait a bit, wait a bit. See that shadow moving against the far wall? It's a man's shadow, that is. Or a devil's. It looks more than life-size to me. Isn't that a tail he's switching around behind him? That nonsense. It's a piece of rope he's holding in his hand. Here. What's that? It, it's Pip, Lady Beatrice's spaniel. He's probably outside the old well house, howling at the moon. He was there all last night, howling to wake the dead. I don't say that. Maybe that's just what he's doing. Maybe that's what he's done. Waked all the corpses in the crypt and they're having a ghostly meeting. Rubbish, Stevens. You don't really believe in ghosts? Why, when you think about all this tomorrow morning, you'd be ashamed. Yeah, but that's tomorrow morning. And tonight, standing here in the moonlight, well, I ain't so sure. Well, there's one way to find out. Come on, let's have a look at who's in that chapel. You, you're not going over there, Mason. I am that can stay here alone, if you like. Stay here by myself. Well, then, go back to the house. Why? And pass by that well house and that howling dog all alone? It's only Pip. No, I'm coming with you. At least there'll be two of us. Right, start lad. Come along, then. Don't crackle the bushes any more than you can help. Confound that beast! Hello. Light's disappearing down the stairs into the crypt. Uh, see? There's no one in here in the chapel. Oh, then what's the good of us coming down? Look, look, there's a crack in the stone floor. Over there, where the streak of light's coming through, see? If we can get over to it without being heard, maybe we can see what's going on down below. I wish I was safe in my bed. Now then, we best crawl along in our stomachs. Easy, does it? <laughs> yeah, here's the crack. By George, you're right. It's two men. Uh-huh. That first one with a thin yellow face. I've never seen him before, I'd swear to that. But the big chap in the black cloak kneeling down. There's something familiar about him. If I could only see Hello. his face. No, now he's standing up. By the Lord, Harry. It's the master himself, Sir Robert. What's he up to down here in the dead of night? What's that he's got under his arm so careful? Now he's holding it up to the light. It's a head. The head of a mummy. What an eerie experience, Mr. Mason. That it was, Dr. Watson. I'd have given me notice the next day, except that, well, I 
I didn't want to leave Lady Beatrice alone at the mercy of that ruffian. I tried to see her ladyship and tell her what was going on, but she wouldn't see me. Sent out word by our maid, Carrie Evans, she wasn't feeling well enough. Not feeling well enough? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But she was well enough to go out driving all the same. How long has this maid, Carrie Evans, been with Lady Beatrice, Mr. Mason? Going on five years, sir. And she's devoted? She's devoted, all right. I won't say to whom. I can't be creating scandal. You don't have to. Sir Robert's reputation with the ladies is, shall we say, a, a trifle shady. Yes, uh, Scandal's been clear for a long time, I'm afraid. I say, Holmes, perhaps that's the cause of the quarrel between the brother and sister. Being an invalid, she has no way of enforcing her will. So the hated maid is still at Shoscombe. Lady Beatrice sulks and takes to drink. Sir Robert becomes angry and gives away her pet spaniel. That explains everything, doesn't it? Everything but the nocturnal visit to the crypt, who the yellow-faced stranger was, and why Sir Robert was holding a skull in his arms. Just a few trifling omissions, Watson. Oh, go to blazes. Quite. Now then, Mr. Mason, you say Sir Robert gave his sister's spaniel away to the proprietor of the Green Dragon. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When was that? About a week ago, sir. Day after we saw him in the crypt. The very day Sir Robert left for London. Oh, he left for London, did he? Yes, sir. And has he come back? We're expecting him back tomorrow, sir. And has Lady Beatrice been taking her morning drives the same as usual? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Eleven o'clock sharp. She and Carrie go out together. I'm not quite clear what you expect me to do in this matter, Mr. Mason. Maybe this will make it more definite, sir. Yes, I've been wondering what you had in that paper bundle. It's something Harvey. He's one of my lads. Found in the furnace up at the big house when he was raking out the cinders yesterday. Hmm. A bone. Badly charred. I see that. What is it, Watson? Your knowledge of anatomy is more accurate than mine. That's part of a femur. A human bone. Exactly. When does this lad tend to the furnace? Every night he makes it up and then leaves it. Anyone could visit it during the night? Yes, sir. You don't think Sir Robert... Watson, you forget Sir Robert's supposed to be in London. He's a deep waters, Mr. Mason. Deep and rather dirty. But I'm beginning to see to the bottom. How is the fishing in the neighborhood of Shoscombe Old Place? The... The fishing, Mr. Holmes? Yes, the doctor and I are famous fishermen, and we haven't had an opportunity to show our prowess this season, eh, Watson? Well, if it's fishing you're after, there's nothing can come up to the trout in the mill stream. Good. You may address us in future at the Green Dragon. We shall reach there tonight. And now that you have Mr. Holmes started on your fishing expedition, Dr. Watson, may I step in to say a few words? Fair enough, Mr. Stark. Clipper Craft clothes are not merely good-looking at the time you buy them. They stay good-looking. Part of the reason for this is hidden from your eyes. That's the painstaking tailoring, the hundreds of stitches inside. Yes, fine tailoring and rich, long-wearing fabrics are the reasons Clipper Craft clothes are remarkable values at their more than modest prices. Naturally, prices low as these wouldn't be possible without the unique Clipper Craft plan. This plan concentrates the buying power of 1,036 great stores across the country, creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. That's why you pay only $40 and $45 for a Clipper Craft suit, only $40 for a top coat or overcoat, and only $26.50 for sport jackets. For your own sake, compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to our story, Dr. Watson. Well, suppose we pick up after Holmes and I had settled ourselves at the Green Dragon. Mid-morning found us tramping down the road leading towards Shoscombe Old Place, carrying rods and reels and all the rest of the trout fisherman's paraphernalia. Holmes also had a shaggy black spaniel in tow. Ah, splendid weather for fishing, eh, Watson? The trout should be fairly jumping at the hook. Yes, I shall have a good opportunity to try that new fly of mine. If that confounded dog doesn't scare the fish away, what in thunder made you bring that spaniel along? You mean Pip? Yes. Down, boy, down. I saw him tied up in the front hall of the inn. Mine host says that they have to keep him on a leash or he runs straight back to his old home. Easy, Pip. Don't pull so, boy. Poor dog seemed to want to go walking, so I said I'd take him. Yes, but a dog on a fishing jog, oh, really, Holmes, you... Now, if we were going hunting, it'd be different, eh? Yes, but it's not the hunting season. You never know. We may get in a little hunting before we get to our fishing. Ah, that is the entrance gate to Shoscombe Old Place, I presume. And some old ironwork. And tightly locked, too. <laughs> Dear Sir Robert, is very jealous of his privacy, eh? You would be, too, if you had a horse you expected to win the derby. I understand he's very vicious with touts or any stranger he catches snooping around his property. I say, look, here comes a big yellow open barouche. 
Yes, Lady Beatrice returning from her morning's drive, I fancy. I thought we should have some hunting this morning. What do you mean? Pip and I are going to hide behind this hedge. When the footman gets down to unlock the gates, I want you to engage him in conversation. Yes, but I don't understand, Holmes. It... Holmes, where are you? Where did you go? Here, behind the hedge, trying to keep this confounded dog quiet. Here they come. I say the old girl must be a million years old, all bundled up in shawls and veils and things. That must be Carrie beside her, the one with the suspiciously blonde hair. They've stopped. The footman's getting down off the box. The gates are swinging open. After him, Watson, after him. Hello there. I, I say, my good man, can you tell me how to get to the mill stream? Now then, Pip, out you go, old boy. It's your mistress. After her, boy, after her. <laughs> there he goes. He leaps into the carriage onto his mistress's lap. By Jove, he's snarling. He's trying to bite the woman. Get that confounded dog out of here. Drive on, drive on. Come on, Pip. Did she try to kick you? Well, never mind, old boy. Well, Watson, that's done it. He expected to see his mistress and he found a stranger. Dogs don't make mistakes. But it was the voice of a man. Exactly. Our little hunting party was quite a success. We flushed our bird. Now, come along, Watson. The fish are waiting for us. Look here, Holmes. You're not going to give up this clue. Not exactly. But our hunting must be postponed until after dark. And then, I promise you, it will be for big game. Here, Holmes, that storm is going to break any minute now. Hadn't we better get back to the inn? Oh, rubbish. We can reach the chapel before we get too wet. Yes, but how do we get home again? By running, I suspect. We may get wet. I told the landlord to have some of the trout we caught this afternoon and a Stilton cheese, salad, and a hot toddy waiting for us. Oh, then let's get back now. I said we wouldn't be back before half past ten. But if we weren't back by then, we'll route out the local police. You, you think it's as bad as all that? I don't know. It all depends on what we find in that crypt. There, that, that must be the chapel up ahead. I saw it in the last flash of lightning. Here comes the rain. Run, Watson, run! I say, don't go so fast. Good Lord, it, it's as black as the inside of my pocket. I, uh, I've lost the chapel. No, no, there it is. Over here, Watson, over here. There's an entrance. Right. Oh, great thunder, I... I'm still to the skin. It's, it's coming down in torrents. Here, this must be the stairs leading down to the crypt. I say, Holmes, you, you have eyes like a cat. I can't see a blasted thing. Take my hand. Easy now, easy. Don't fall and break your neck. There. Now you can light the lantern. As if I can find a match that's dry enough to light. They all feel like spaghetti. There. What a sepulchral place. Look at all those vaults. I had no idea Lady Beatrice's husband had so many ancestors. Yes, some of those graves date back before the Norman invasion. Look at the Saxon names. Adalbert, Harold. And here are the Normans. Mm. Long line of Hugos and Odos and Percys. But it's this leaden coffin we're interested in, I imagine. Notice how the dust around it's been disturbed. Yeah. Hand me that Jimmy, Watson. You're not going to open it. Holmes, let's get out of here. All, all these coffins, hundreds of dead ancestors. I, I feel like a ghoul myself prying into their long-forgotten secrets. Rubbish. I'll have this lid off in no time. One. Stand back. What is it? Keep away from that coffin. Keep back, I say, or I'll blow you to bits. Well, well, if it isn't Sir Robert Norberton himself, this is a surprise. Allow me to present myself. I am Sherlock Holmes. You don't have to tell me... I heard how you tried to frighten my sister this morning. Now, clear out. Your sister? Yes, my sister. Now, what is your motive? What are you doing here? Answer me, do you hear? I, too, have some questions to ask, Sir Robert. What have you done with your sister? My sister? My sister is home in bed, of course. If your sister's home in bed, would you mind telling me whose body is inside this coffin? Throw back the lid, Watson. There, Sir Robert. Is that the body of your sister, or isn't it? It is. 
But you're not the official police. What business is it of yours, anyway? My business is that of every good citizen, to uphold the law. What? You mean you'll hand me over to the police? Good Lord, this is terrible. I know appearances are against me, but I couldn't do anything else. Now, let me explain. Your explanations must be to the police, I'm afraid. But that will ruin me, don't you understand? I've always been dependent on my sister, Lady Beatrice, for everything. I'm deeply in debt. If it were known that my sister were dead, my creditors would come down on me like vultures. Everything would be seized, my stables, my horses. Shoscombe Prince would never run the derby. Oh, Mr. Holmes, my sister did die just one week ago. She died of dropsy, which had long afflicted her. That will be for the coroner to decide. Oh, I was faced with absolute ruin. If I could only keep her death hushed up until day after tomorrow when the derby is run, I I'll make a fortune. If your horse wins. Oh, he will, he must. My good name depends on it. On the first night after my sister's death, Norlet, who is Carrie Evans' husband and an actor, helped to carry her body out to the old well house. We were followed, however, by her pet spaniel, who howled all night long. I finally had to get rid of him. And it was Norlet, the actor, who impersonated your sister this last week? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh, this last week I've lived the life of the damned. My conscience has given me no peace. Later, we buried my sister's body here, in what is still consecrated ground. One of the tombs of her husband's ancestors. After having endeavored to destroy the ancestors' bones in the furnace. What? I don't know how you know that, but it's true. And now it's for nothing. All for nothing. I'm ruined, Mr. Holmes, ruined. Not necessarily. Well, what do you mean? After all, the derby is only the day after tomorrow. Of course, we must lay the case before the local authorities, but uh, I still have a little influence here and there. Would you? Would you use it? It's not altogether impossible. And now, Dr. Watson, before you tell us Holmes' rather surprising decision in the case of Sir Robert, I'd like to make one more speech on behalf of Clippercraft. Go ahead, Mr. Stark. When you advertise anything as extensively as Clippercraft, the product's got to be good. Clippercraft clothes really have to have it, and they have. They're the most amazing clothes you've ever seen at prices so very modest. Remember, Clippercraft suits are only forty and forty-five dollars, top coats and overcoats only forty dollars, and sport jackets only twenty-six fifty. No, you won't find such smart styling and comfort, such rich, long-wearing fabrics, even at far higher prices. They're made possible by the renowned Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of ten hundred and thirty-six of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, so that these great clothes are available to you at your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, Dr. Watson, did Sherlock Holmes use his influence in Sir Robert's behalf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Stark. We went back to the inn and Holmes routed the local constable and coroner out of bed. They discussed matters over the trout and coffee and cheese. Luckily, our catch had been a fairly big one. Moreover, the creditors were all Londoners and Sir Robert was a local man. <laughs> Pride of county, you know. And besides, the constable and the coroner had both placed bets on Shoscombe Prince. And they wanted to see him win. And did he? He did, and netted his owner 80,000 pounds. Sir Robert paid his debts and bought a small plate in the neighborhood of Shoscombe, where he threatens to end his days in an honored old age. He and Holmes have become great friends. Holmes often visits him when he wants a bit of trout fishing. Well, all this uh, talk of trout and salad and cheese has given me the most tremendous appetite. <laughs> I had hoped it would. I have a special treat in store for you tonight. Just ring the bell, will you? I received two of the most beautiful trout from Sir Robert just this morning. 
I imagine my housekeeper has them in the pan by now. Frying in butter with almonds sprinkled on the top. And a fresh green salad and a Stilton cheese. But, uh, but look here. Isn't it a bit out of season for trout? <laughs> Nothing is out of season these days, Mr. Stark. Sir Robert has what is called a deep freeze, you know. <laughs> yes, I know. But, but what have you in mind to tell us next week, Dr. Watson? Well, next week, Mr. Stark, I think I'll tell you of the vicious robberies and bludgeonings that occurred in Boston Yard. The criminal, you know, was a cat named Peggy. Holmes always called it the adventure of the wooden claw. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Wooden Claw. <laughs> this is Charles Starr speaking for Clippercraft Rose. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System. In just 25 seconds, you'll hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest news. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type Constellation, tried and proven with 300 million passenger miles of dependability. Fly Eastern Airlines. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of the Wooden Claw. Well, here we are again, sitting in front of Dr. Watson's hearth. The coals have burned low, and over the rosy glow, we face our favorite medico and storyteller. Uh, what's tonight's adventure to be, Dr. Watson? I suppose I tell the one, Mr. Stark, in which Holmes suggested I present myself as the next victim of the individual called the cat. Victim of a cat? <laughs> yes, Mr. Stark. The cat was an unpleasant person who went about bashing in the skulls of bank messengers in Boston Yard. Which, as you know, gives on to Hogarth Lane, of course. Oh, naturally, naturally. Yes. A ruthless and cunning criminal, that cat, sometimes called Peggy. Aha! So it wasn't a tomcat. <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go, Mr. Stark, jumping to conclusions. Just for that, I shan't tell you any more of the story until you say a word on behalf of our sponsor. Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Clippercraft welcomes comparison. Compare the style, compare the tailoring, compare the all-round quality of Clippercraft with any clothes anywhere near their modest prices. That's why today's demand for Clippercraft's amazing value is so great. Now, Dr. Watson, will you go on with your story? With pleasure, Mr. Stark, with pleasure. It was late one Saturday evening in May. Holmes, who had been promising to get at it all day, was finally sorting out certain odds and ends of notes and papers. He sat at his desk, the lamplight shining up into his eyes, looking rather like some gigantic bird of prey. I lay on the couch enjoying my faithful briar.
Watson, you better put out your pipe if you're going to drop off to sleep. Well, well, I, I wasn't sleeping. I was thinking. I always think better with my eyes closed. And when you're snoring, I suppose. I wasn't snoring? Perhaps not, but you were getting ready to. Nothing of the sort. Some people can't endure seeing anyone else relaxed and at ease while they have a job of work to do. May I point out, my dear Holmes, that if you had got at your labors at a decent hour, as I did, well, you would be... For sake, Watson, stop being so confounded smug. Hello, what's that? Well, the doorbell, of course. Oh, don't look so hopeful, Holmes. I don't imagine it's anything that will interrupt your labors. Probably a call for Mrs. Hudson or the greengrocer to leave his weekly bill. It's not the greengrocer, Watson. He rings once and slips the bill under the door. No, that is someone for us. Ha-ha! <laughs> Whatever brought him here is sufficiently urgent to necessitate my postponing sorting these papers, thank heaven. Come in, come in. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, it's Mr. Merriweather. You remember Mr. Merriweather, the chairman of the City and Suburban Bank around the corner from saxe Coburg Square. Yeah, but the trouble isn't there, but in the Suburban branch this time, Dr. Watson. The Chiswick branch, to be exact. Chiswick? It was originally pronounced Chiswick, Watson, and it's still so spelled. It means cheese farm, I believe. However, I don't imagine Mr. Merriweather has dropped in to discuss the most frequently mispronounced of all means of communication, the English language. Good Lord, no. Uh, Mr. Holmes, something must be done to protect my bank messengers. I've had six in hospital with concussion of the brain, one a week for the last half dozen weeks. It's always on Saturday night it happens. Dear, dear, I was under the impression that Chiswick was a quiet, respectable suburb that rarely indulged in that sort of a Saturday night. No, but it doesn't. At least it never has, uh, well, up to six weeks ago. And now, every Saturday night regularly, one of my bank messengers has been attacked and robbed. Robbed of a considerable sum of money. Oh, now we come to the crux of the matter. What exactly were your bank messengers doing with large sums of money on Saturday night? Oh, carrying it from the Elephant and Castle, the famous old alehouse in Boston Yard, uh, to the bank to be deposited. Isn't that a rather unusual procedure? Oh, it is, Mr. Holmes. It is indeed. Yeah, but that's how we persuaded old Mr. Jeremy, the proprietor of the Elephant and Castle, to bring us his account. Mm. You see, the Elephant and Castle does its best business on Saturday night. <laughs> Not unusually, Holmes. Watson, Watson, quiet, quiet, please. It, old Mr. Jeremy is somewhat fidgety about having that much money lying around the place till the bank's open on Monday morning. He's been robbed twice, and it's made him rather nervous. Can't say I blame him. If so we arranged to have a bonded bank messenger uh, sent over every Saturday night after closing hours to gather up the money so old Jeremy could sleep in peace. Now, I, I wish we never made the offer. Uh, once the bank messenger has signed the receipt for the money, well, the bank is liable for any loss, uh, down to the last penny. By Jove, then you have had an expensive six weeks. Oh, expensive? So far, it's cost us close to 3,000 pounds. Mm. Tell me, Mr. Merriweather, when did the first of these robberies occur? It was seven weeks ago tonight. It was shortly after closing hours when the policeman on the beat heard a yelling and a shouting as he came down Hogarth Lane. The spring mist was rising off the river, and at first he could see nothing. Help! Help! For the love of heaven, help! Hello, what's up? Help! Help! Somebody help! Somebody calling, but I can't see a blessed soul. Hello, what's the trouble and where are you? In here, through the archway, in Boston Yard. And who are you? And what's the difficulty? I'm Paddy Donovan, caretaker of Hogarth House. There's a man lying, lying on the stones in bad need of help, I'm thinking. Well, it's black as the inside of my pocket in here. What's happened to the light of the elephant in Castle? Sure, it's been put out this half hour. The elephant is a law-abiding house. You'll never see old Jeremy serve a man a drink after all. <laughs> Unless he's paid double for it. Now, don't try to whitewash Jeremy. I know the old scallyway. Oh, 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 oh. Bring your lantern over here. You'd, you'd best see what can be done for this poor chap. He's in a bad way, I'm thinking. Uh, well, let's have a look at him. Oh, glory be to God. It's a bank messenger from the city in Suburban. A robbery, that's what it is, I warrant. When did it happen? Couldn't rightly say, officer. All I know is uh, I was locking up the front door of Hoggart's house previous to going to bed when suddenly I heard a scuffle here in the yard. 
and a man called out like he was in mortal agony. You uh, ran in the air at once? Oh, just so fast as ever me wooden leg would carry me. Uh, I'm not so spry as I once was, you know. But, but I was in time to see a great shadow of a man dressed all in black with a mask over his face. He was leaning over this poor fellow here. When I came into the yard through the archway, I says to myself, Aha! I've got you trapped, me bucko. Uh, of course. The archway is the only entrance to the yard. Or exit, either. Except you go through into the Elephant and Castle. Which I've been after telling you has been closed this half hour since. Uh, <clears throat> that's as may be. Well, at any rate, the man shoved past you and out the archway, eh? That, that he did not. I may not be so spry in my feet, but my fist is as good as ever. No man alive can come it over Paddy Donovan if he ventures within arm's reach. Oh. So he went in the Elephant and Castle. He did not. Then I suppose you'll be telling me he disappeared into thin air. He did something stranger than that, my lad. He skinned up the wall and over it like a cat. Whoop! Wow, that's impossible. That there wall is 12 feet high, and there's nothing for a foothold anywhere. Possible or not, that's what happened. Up he went and over, like a cat. A great black cat. Uh, give me the uh, creeps it did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, look at uh, this, this bloke's bleeding. Wait, it's the back of his head, I'm thinking. There's blood oozing out in the pavement from behind his ears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, help me turn him over. We'll have a look at the injury. <laughs> Lord, love us. Will you look at that? A nasty blow it must have been. Oh, but it's more than just an ordinary blow. Blimey, look here, look here. Great bloody gashes running right down into his neck. Like he'd been hit with a rake. Or clawed by a giant cat. I saw those wounds, Mr. Holmes. I promise you, that's what they look like. The claw marks of a gigantic cat. A cat man, eh? Who scales 12-foot walls and whose blow leaves deep gashes. Hmm. Interesting, Mr. Merriweather. Interesting and just a bit incredible. Well, there is no such creature, Mr. Holmes. There can't be. Oh, I don't know. I saw one once. It was in that French music hall. Remember, Holmes? The chap went up a smooth, tiled wall nearly 16 feet high... I believe he had some sort of suction device attached to his hands and feet. Oh, that could account for it, I suppose. It might account for the fellow's disappearance over the wall, but not for the gashes and other significant phenomena. That is what interests me, Watson, those gashes. Uh, this man with a wooden leg, uh, Donovan, I believe you said his name was, is he a reliable witness, Mr. Merriweather? Uh, why, yes, uh, at least I suppose so. He's been caretaker at Hogarth House for over 15 years. Hogarth House is where they have the famous collection of Hogarth drawings and the like. It's open to the public daily, except Sundays, for a small fee. I'm afraid Donovan isn't kept over busy with visitors. He spends much of his time at the Elephant and Castle. Oh, <laughs> that's it. He was drunk. Instead of seeing a pink elephant, he saw a man-sized black cat. Who was substantial enough to claw and rob a bank messenger. Oh, well, if you're going to be technical... Tell me, Mr. Merriweather... Were this fellow with a wooden leg and mine host of the Elephant and Castle on good terms? So Donovan and Jeremy have been cronies for years, Mr. Holmes. So then anything unusual that goes on at the Elephant and Castle would be known to both? Undoubtedly. Hmm. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, between them they'd cooked up a neat little scheme to, to do the bank out of a tidy sum of money. Of course, Holmes, I see it all. Incredible. Old Jeremy follows the messenger to me and has just handed the day's profits out into the courtyard bludgeons him, and retires quickly with the money into his own premises. Then along hobbles Mr. Donovan with a cock-and-bull story about seeing an incredible cat-like creature. Jeremy recovers his day's earnings and is reimbursed by the bank as well. Mm, whereupon he has to split the swag with Mr. Donovan and is consequently no better off than if he'd saved himself the trouble. I see your point, Mr. Holmes. Uh, but there are people, you know, who enjoy making a crooked sixpence more than a straight shilling. Mm. Oh, but good heavens, it's after 11. And I promised Jeremy I would be at the Elephant in Castle by closing time. You mean you're undertaking the job of bank messenger yourself tonight, Mr. Merriweather? Uh, uh, right, I, uh... 
Well, I, I, I'm not a particularly brave man, but uh, I don't feel I have the right to ask an employee to take a risk I wouldn't wish to assume myself. Oh, mm. uh, on the other hand, I'm not completely foolhardy. I, I think the danger would be considerably minimized if I were assisted by Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, uh, Dr. Watson. What do you say, Watson? Would you consider a possible encounter with a cat man who robs bank messengers a sufficient excuse for postponing tidying up my papers? <laughs> what do you think, Holmes? I'll go and fetch my service revolver. Heavens, there's a moon tonight and no fog. Well, here we are, gentlemen. Hogarth Lane takes its name, of course, from William Hogarth, whose country residence was here situated from 1749 who to... Who goes there? Good heavens, who? I, I mean, what was... Uh... Calm yourself, Watson. It's merely a police officer on duty, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, uh, they station an officer at either end of the lane uh, every Saturday night now. They've never caught anyone or prevented the numerous repetitions of the first crime. Mm, not so far. Well, tonight will be different because Scotland Yard has personally taken over. Well, well, if it isn't Inspector Lestrade, my favorite watchdog of the public safety. And what do you think you're doing here, El? Endeavoring to stop the robbings and bludgeonings, which the official minions of the law and order don't seem to be able to terminate. Well, you'll not go one step nearer to the scene of this crime. No one's allowed in Boston Yard tonight without a permit. Yeah, which I have duly obtained uh, for myself and bodyguard. Here it is. And you in thunder are you? Oh, allow me to introduce you, Lestrade. This is Mr. Merriweather, whose bank has suffered a considerable loss for six successive weeks. But the inefficiency of the police. Uh, you go to blazes. With pleasure. I'm sorry to have to rush off, Lestrade, but I'm afraid you're making Mr. Merriweather late for his appointment at the Elephant and Castle. Come along, Watson. Mm, not a very well-lighted thoroughfare, eh, Holmes? Well enough. I doubt that anything will escape my notice. Conceit? Pure conceit? Mm. Tell me, Mr. Merriweather, in the case of the succeeding Saturday night bank robberies, was the pattern of the crime similar to the first? Almost identical, Mr. Holmes. Except that policemen have been stationed at either end of this section of Hogarth Lane to make sure that no one could leave or enter without being seen. Well, the police are as skeptical as you about a cat man, Mr. Holmes. And yet, each week, a messenger has been clawed on the back of the head and robbed without uttering a sound or putting up a struggle. Oh, not without uttering a sound, Mr. Holmes. Each time the victim has cried out. But by the time that Donovan has reached the spot, the culprit uh, was vanishing over the wall. Then, in each case, Donovan was the first to reach the victim. Uh, why, yes, uh, that's right. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, but that's only natural. Donovan is in the habit of smoking his last pipe on the steps of Hogarth House, where, where he is the caretaker. Uh, you see, uh, over there, uh, Hogarth House is almost directly opposite the entrance to Boston Yard. And consequently, um, after the cry was heard... He was able to reach the scene of the crime ahead of the police, who had to run some distance. Oh, sounds reasonable enough, eh, Holmes? Mm. Oh, yes, that must be the old boy up ahead there. Sitting on the steps with one leg stuck out before him. Yes, he's noticed us. He's getting up. No. He's walking away in the other direction. Ah! Great Scott, what was that? A prelude to tonight's crime, confound it. But that's impossible, Mr. Merriweather is here with Don't us. Don't argue, Watson, run! There goes Donovan through the gate into, into the yard. I say he's a spry for a chap with only one good leg. Because he doesn't waste his breath as you do, Watson. Here's the entrance. Donovan, what happened? Oh, I warned him not to do it. I warned him, Mr. Merriweather, sir, that you were late and he wanted to get the money to the bank. Good thought. It's Jeremy. Well, the blackguard has bashed old Jeremy. But... The money's safe. And up this time, they didn't get it. I was waiting. I'm done for, but the money's safe. Mr. Jeremy, you know who hit you. I, 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 I suspect it for some time. Now I know. He's badly hurt, Holmes. He's going fast. He can't, not before he tells us. Mr. Jeremy... Who is the criminal? It's, uh, it's, uh, Peggy. Peggy? I, uh, 
Holmes. Holmes, he's gone. Jeremy, Jeremy, me poor old Jeremy. But who in thunder is Peggy? It, do you know, Donovan? Well, how should I know? The cat, it, it must have been a woman all the time. A woman dressed in men's clothes. A woman who could give a man a blow hard enough to kill him and then disappear over a 12-foot wall. You saw her do that, Donovan, before we came in the yard a minute after you got here? Well, well, that is no, maybe tonight I, I, I didn't see the killer. Maybe tonight I... Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I was that upset when I seen it was Jeremy. Hello, hello. What's, up? What's wrong here? Mr. Jeremy has been bludgeoned, Lestrade. He's dead. Oh, he is, eh? Right under Mr. Sherlock Holmes's nose, eh? Lestrade, whoever finished off old Jeremy is still here in this courtyard. We, he couldn't have scaled the wall this time. We'd have seen him. But it wasn't a he, Holmes. Mr. Jeremy said his assailant's name was Peggy. I don't care what his or her name was. If he or she is still here, I want him. Or her. You okay. fellas, search the yard. That's what we've been doing, Governor. And uh, I think we found something interesting here behind the rain barrel. What's that? Well, it's a man uh, lying like he was drunk. Somebody that was thrown out of the pub earlier in the evening, like as not. And who resented it and vowed to get even with Jeremy. There's motive and opportunity as well. Arrest him and take him off to jail. And you, Donovan, help him carry the body back into the elephant and castle. Yes, sir. This way, boys. Uh, carry him easy and with respect. My poor Jeremy. My poor, poor Jeremy. Well, Holmes, you can't say Scotland Yard has acted with dispatch and efficiency. And with its usual utter lack of intelligence and concern for truth and justice. If this man isn't guilty, I suppose you can tell us who he is. Quite. However, you wouldn't believe me. You see, I have no proof of my theory. It will take until next Saturday night to acquire that. <laughs> Feel dashed silly, Holmes. Dressed up in this bank messenger's outfit. What's the point to it all? Watson, we're dealing with a sly and devious criminal. The only way is to catch him red-handed. During your service in the Far East, I believe you've taken part in a tiger hunt. Oh, what of it? You know the procedure. The hunter tethers a kid or a lamb to a tree and then retires to a nearby blind to wait for the tiger to attack his prey. Only this time, it's not a tiger we're after. It's a cat. Named Piggy. And I'm the goat. Quite. Yes, I think you may start on your journey across Boston Yard, Watson. But it's raining tonight, lowers the visibility. However, perhaps that's just as well, or the killer might recognize you. Hmm. Well, I'll open the door and out you go. You've got the earnings of the elephant and castle safe in your pouch? Well, naturally, you put them there. Well, good luck, Watson. Don't be too nervous. Remember, Lestrade is hidden behind the rain barrel. Well, a fine lot of comfort that is. Well, let's get it over with. Now, chin up, old boy. And whatever you do, fall sideways when I call out. Into a mud puddle, probably. Don't argue. Do as I say. Your life may depend on it. Good Lord. What a night. Teeming cats and dogs. Cats. Never cared much for cats. Well, this isn't going to improve my... T What's that shadow slinking along the wall over there? Oh, confound this rain. I can't see a thing. Ah! What was that? Someone's coming this way. He's running through the gate. It's Donovan. Hey, Donovan, what's up? He stopped. He snatched up his wooden leg. He... What's in that? Now then, Donovan, I'll take that wooden leg, if you don't mind, one with which you bludgeon seven people. So it's you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Something told me this was my unlucky night. You can come out, Lestrade, and take the criminal in charge. You needn't cry, Holmes. I saw the old thing. Well, got your red handed this time, Donovan. Yes, you've got the criminal and his weapon. Notice the spikes in the upper end of this wooden leg. No wonder the victims looked as if they'd been clawed by a giant cat. Well... No use hanging about in this blasted rain. Come along, Donovan. You've slugged and robbed your last bank messenger. And it reminds me. Watson, where are you? 
flat on the ground in a puddle, of course. Look at me. Nice mess. <laughs> uh, I say, Holmes, I'm... I'm still perplexed, you know. Why? Well, who was the man who screamed just now? Why did Jeremy say the cat's name was Peggy? And when did you first suspect Donovan was the criminal? The answers to those questions can wait, Watson, until I get you safely home in a hot tub. That puddle has soaked you to the skin. And besides, this is Saturday night. <laughs> Back to Baker Street. We find Dr. Watson sitting firmly in the midst of an old fashioned tin tub to which Holmes is adding a tea kettle full of very hot water. No! That's enough! Do you want to scald me? Yes, you are beginning to look nicely parboiled. Mm. Yeah, I think you'll do. Then, uh, how about answering my questions? Oh, very well. One, the man who screamed was never the victim, Watson. It was old Donovan who was building himself an alibi. He screamed when he saw his victim cross the yard. Then he dashed in, took off his leg and bashed him while the police were running down the street in answer to his shouts for help. Two, Jeremy said the cat's name was Peggy because that's what he called Donovan. Many a peg-legged man is nicknamed Peggy, you know. And lastly, I knew Donovan was the criminal when Mr. Merriweather told us how distinctly he described the cat man who crawled over the fence on the night of the first robbery. But uh, why was that suspicious? <laughs> Elementary, my dear Watson. It was a dark, foggy night. He couldn't have seen the criminal in detail. Remember, it wasn't until the policeman had turned his dark lantern on the victim that he could tell he was a bank messenger. Q-E-D. I see. Well, it's all so remarkably simple, once you explain. It always is, Watson. It always is. Well, don't just stand there puffing yourself up. You, you might get busy and scrub my back, you know. Well, that was an interesting adventure, Dr. Watson. And what story are we to have uh, next week? Next week's story takes place in the Tower of London. It tells how Holmes and I rescued a damsel in distress and reformed a stony-hearted army officer and recovered a golden platter that should, by rights, have remained with the crown jewels. I call it the case of King Philip's Golden Salver. <laughs> Makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lockridge. City, the makers of Clippercraft clothes for men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of the Wooden Claw. Well, here we are again, sitting in front of Dr. Watson's house. The coals have burned low, and over the rosy glow, we face our favorite medico and storyteller. 
Uh, what's the nice adventure to be, Dr. Watson? Uh, suppose I tell the one Mr. Stark in which Holmes suggested I present myself as the next victim of the individual called the cat. Victim of a cat? <laughs> yes, Mr. Stark. The cat was an unpleasant person who went about bashing in the skulls of bank messengers in Boston Yard, which, as you know, gives on to Hogarth Lane, of course. Oh, naturally, naturally. Yes. A ruthless and cunning criminal, that cat, sometimes called Peggy. Aha! Uh-huh. So it wasn't a tomcat. <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go, Mr. Stark, jumping to conclusions. Just for that, I shan't tell you any more of the story until you say a word on behalf of our sponsor. Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Clippercraft welcomes comparison. Compare the style, compare the tailoring, compare the all-round quality of Clippercraft with any clothes anywhere near their modest prices. That's why today's demand for Clippercraft's amazing value is so great. Ask the fine local independent store that sells Clippercraft. A store you can trust, you know, makes Clippercraft available in your community. Clippercraft suits are only forty and forty-five dollars. Some Clippercraft aristocrats fifty dollars. Top coats and fine coverts and worsted gabardines are only forty and forty-five dollars, and sport jackets only twenty-six fifty. Only the Clippercraft plan can make values like these, including long-wearing worsted fabrics, possible. Concentrating the buying power of ten hundred thirty-six great stores across the country, creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. See what these savings mean to you. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now, Dr. Watson, will you go on with your story? With pleasure, Mr. Stark, with pleasure. It was late one Saturday evening in May. Holmes, who had been promising to get at it all day was finally sorting out certain odds and ends of notes and papers. He sat at his desk, the lamplight shining up into his eyes, looking rather like some gigantic bird of prey. I lay on the couch enjoying my faithful briar. You'd better put out your pipe if you're going to drop off to sleep. I wasn't, I, I wasn't sleeping. I was thinking. I always think better with my eyes closed. And when you're snoring, I suppose. I wasn't snoring? Perhaps not, but you were getting ready to. Nothing of the sort. Some people can't endure seeing anyone else relaxed and at ease while they have a job of work to do. May I point out, my dear Holmes, that if you had got at your labors at a decent hour, as I did, well, you would... For goodness sake, Watson, stop being so confounded smug. Hello, what's that? Well, the doorbell, of course. Oh, don't look so hopeful, Holmes. I don't imagine it's anything that will interrupt your labors. Probably a call for Mrs. Hudson or the greengrocer to leave his weekly bill. It's not the greengrocer, Watson. He rings once and slips the bill under the door. No, that is someone for us. Ha-ha! <laughs> Whatever brought him here is sufficiently urgent to necessitate my postponing sorting these papers, thank heaven. Come in, come in. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, it's Mr. Merriweather. You remember Mr. Merriweather, the chairman of the city and suburban bank around the corner from Saxe-Coburg Square. It was the trouble isn't there, but in the suburban branch this time, Dr. Watson. The Chiswick branch, to be exact. Chiswick? It was originally pronounced Chiswick, Watson, and it's still so spelled. It means cheese farm, I believe. However, I don't imagine Mr. Merriweather has dropped in to discuss the most frequently mispronounced of all means of communication, the English language. Good Lord, no. It... Mr. Holmes, something must be done to protect my bank messengers. I've had six in hospital with concussion of the brain, one a week for the last half dozen weeks. It's always on Saturday night it happens. Dear, dear, I was under the impression that Chiswick was a quiet, respectable suburb that rarely indulged in that sort of a Saturday night. No, but it doesn't. At least it never has, uh, well, up to six weeks ago. And now, every Saturday night regularly, one of my bank messengers has been attacked and robbed. Robbed of a considerable sum of money. Oh, now we come to the crux of the matter. What exactly were your bank messengers doing with large sums of money on Saturday night? They were carrying it from the Elephant and Castle, the famous old alehouse in Boston Yard, uh, to the bank to be deposited. Isn't that a rather unusual procedure? Uh, it is, Mr. Holmes. It is indeed. Yeah, but that's how we persuaded old Mr. Jeremy, the, the proprietor of the Elephant and Castle, to bring us his account. Hmm. 
You see, the elephant in castle does its best business on Saturday night. <laughs> Not unusually, Holmes. Watson, Watson, quiet, quiet, please. Uh, old Mr. Jeremy is somewhat fidgety about having that much money lying around the place till the bank's open on Monday morning. Well, he's been robbed twice, and it's made him rather nervous. Can't say I blame him. If so, we arranged to have a bonded bank messenger uh, sent over every Saturday night after closing hours to gather up the money so old Jeremy could sleep in peace. Now, I, I wish we never made the offer. Uh, once the bank messenger has signed the receipt for the money, well, the bank is liable for any loss, uh, down to the last penny. By Jove, then you have had an expensive six weeks. Not expensive. So far, it's cost us close to 3,000 pounds. Mm. Tell me, Mr. Merriweather, when did the first of these robberies occur? It was seven weeks ago tonight. It was shortly after closing hours when the policeman on the beat heard a yelling and a shouting as he came down Hogarth Lane. The spring mist was rising off the river. And at first, he could see nothing. What's the trouble and where are you? In here, through the archway. He's lost in yard. And who are you? And what's the difficulty? I'm Paddy Donovan, caretaker of Hogarth House. There's a man lying lying under stones in bad need of help, I'm thinking. Huh? Black as the inside of my pocket in here. What's happened to the light of the elephant in castle? Sure, it's been put out this half hour. The elephant is a law abiding house. You'll never see old Jeremy serve a man a drink after all. <laughs> Unless he's paid double for it. Now, don't try to whitewash Jeremy. I know the old scallyway. Oh, 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 oh. Bring your lantern over here. You'd, you'd best see what can be done for this poor chap. He's in a bad way, I'm thinking. Uh, well, let's have a look at it. Oh, glory be to God. It's a bank messenger from the city in suburban. A robbery, that's what it is, I warrant. When did it happen? I couldn't rightly say, officer. All I know is that I was locking up the front door of Hoggart's house, previous to going to bed, when suddenly I heard a scuffle here in the yard, and a man called out like he was in martial agony. You uh, ran in here at once? Just so fast as ever my wooden leg would carry me up. I'm not so spry as I once was, you know. But, but I was in time to see a great shadow of a man dressed tall in black, with a mask over his face. He was leaning over this poor fellow here. When I came into the yard through the archway, I said to myself, Aha, I've got you trapped, me bucko. Uh, of course. The archway is the only entrance to the yard. Or exit, either. Except you go through into the elephant in castle. Which I've been asked to tell you has been closed this half hour since. Uh, <clears throat> that says maybe. Well, at any rate, the man shoved past you and out the archway, eh? That, that he did not. I may not be so spry in the thief, but my fist is as good as ever. No man alive can come it over Paddy Donovan if he ventures within arm's reach. How? So he went in the elephant and castle. He did not. Then I suppose you'll be telling me he disappeared into thin air. He did something stranger than that, my lad. He skinned up the wall and over it like a cat. Whoop! Wow, that's impossible. That there wall is 12 feet high, and there's nothing for a foothold anywhere. Possibly or not, that's what happened. Up he went and over, like a cat. A great black cat. Uh, give me the uh, creeps, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Look, uh, look uh, this, this bloke's bleeding. Wait, it's the back of his head, I'm thinking. There's blood oozing out in the pavement from behind his ears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, help me turn him over. Uh, we'll have a look at the injury. Uh, 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 <laughs> Lord, love it. Will you look at that? A nasty blow it must have been. Cool. Well, it's more than just an ordinary blow. Blimey. Look here, look here. Great bloody gashes running right down into his neck. Like he'd been hit with a rake. Or clawed by a giant cat. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, 
I promise you, that's what they look like. The claw marks of a gigantic cat. A cat man, eh? Who scales 12-foot walls and whose blow leaves deep gashes. Hmm. Interesting, Mr. Merriweather. Interesting and just a bit incredible. Well, there is no such creature, Mr. Holmes. There can't be. Oh, I don't know. I saw one once. It was in that French music hall. Remember, Holmes? The church went up a smooth, tiled wall nearly 16 feet high. I believe he had some sort of suction device attached to his hands and feet. Well, that could account for it, I suppose. It might account for the fellow's disappearance over the wall, but not for the gashes and other significant phenomena. That is what interests me, Watson, those gashes. Uh, this man with a wooden leg, uh, Donovan, I believe you said his name was, is he a reliable witness, Mr. Merriweather? Uh, why, yes, uh, at least I suppose so. He's been caretaker at Hogarth House for over 15 years. Hogarth House is where they have the famous collection of Hogarth drawings and the like. It's open to the public daily, except Sundays, for a small fee. I'm afraid Donovan isn't kept over busy with visitors. He spends much of his time at the Elephant and Castle. Oh, <laughs> that's it. He was drunk. Instead of seeing a pink elephant, he saw a man-sized black cat who was substantial enough to claw and rob the bank messenger. Oh, well, if you're going to be technical. Tell me, Mr. Merriweather. Were this fellow with a wooden leg and mine host of the Elephant and Castle on good terms? So Donovan and Jeremy have been cronies for years, Mr. Holmes. So then anything unusual that goes on at the Elephant and Castle would be known to both? Undoubtedly. Hmm. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, between them they'd cooked up a neat little scheme to, to do the bank out of a tidy sum of money. Oh, of course, Holmes, I see it all. Incredible. Old Jeremy follows the messenger to me who has just handed the day's profits out into the courtyard. Bludgeons him and retires quickly with the money into his own premises. Then along hobbles Mr. Donovan with a cock and bull story about seeing an incredible cat like creature. Jeremy recovers his day's earnings and is reimbursed by the bank as well. Mm. Whereupon he has to split the swag with Mr. Donovan and is consequently no better off than if he'd saved himself the trouble. I see your point, Mr. Holmes. Uh, but there are people, you know, who enjoy making a crooked sixpence more than a straight shilling. Mm. Oh, but good heavens, it's after 11. And I promised Jeremy I would be at the Elephant and Castle by closing time. You mean you're undertaking the job of bank messenger yourself tonight, Mr. Merriweather? Uh, uh, right, I, uh... Well, I, I, I'm not a particularly brave man, but uh, I don't feel I have the right to ask an employee to take a risk I wouldn't wish to assume myself. Oh, well. Mm. But on the other hand, I'm not completely foolhardy. I, I think the danger would be considerably minimized if I were assisted by Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, uh, Dr. Watson. What do you say, Watson? Would you consider a possible encounter with a cat man who robs bank messengers a sufficient excuse for postponing tidying up my papers? <laughs> what do you think, Holmes? I'll go and fetch my service revolver. There's a moon tonight and no fog. But here we are, gentlemen. Hogarth Lane takes its name, of course, from William Hogarth, whose country residence was here situated from 1749 who to... Who there? Good heavens, who are... I mean, what was... Calm yourself, Watson. It's merely a police officer on duty, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, uh, they station an officer at either end of the lane every Saturday night now. They've never caught anyone or prevented the numerous repetitions of the first crime. Mm, not so far. Well, tonight it'll be different, because Scotland Yard has personally taken over. Well, well, if it isn't Inspector Lestrade, my favorite watchdog of the public safety. And what do you think you're doing here, Holmes? Endeavoring to stop the robbings and bludgeonings, which the official minions of the law and order don't seem to be able to terminate. Well, you'll not go one step nearer to the scene of this crime. No one's allowed in Boston Yard tonight without a permit. It, which I have duly obtained, uh, for myself and Bobby Bob. Here it is. And you in thunder, are you? Oh, allow me to introduce you, Lestrade. This is Mr. Merriweather, whose bank has suffered a considerable loss for six successive weeks due to the inefficiency of the police. Uh, you go to blazes. With pleasure. I'm sorry to have to rush off, Lestrade, but I'm afraid you're making Mr. Merriweather late for his appointment at the Elephant Castle. Come along, Watson. Mm, not a very well-lighted thoroughfare, eh, Holmes? Well enough. I doubt that anything will escape my notice. Conceit? Pure conceit? Mm. Tell me, Mr. Merriweather, in the case of the succeeding Saturday night bank robberies, was the pattern of the crime similar to the first? Almost identical, Mr. Holmes. Except that policemen have been stationed at either end of this section of Hogarth Lane to make sure that no one could leave or enter without being seen. 
Well, the police are as skeptical as you about the cat man, Mr. Holmes. And yet, each week, a messenger has been clawed on the back of the head and robbed without uttering a sound or putting up a struggle. Oh, not without uttering a sound, Mr. Holmes. Each time the victim has cried out. But by the time that Donovan has reached the spot, the culprit uh, was vanishing over the wall. Then, in each case, Donovan was the first to reach the victim. Uh, why, yes, uh, that's right. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, but that's only natural. Donovan is in the habit of smoking his last pipe on the steps of Hogarth's house, where, where he is the caretaker. Hey, you see, uh, over there, uh, Hogarth House is almost directly opposite the entrance to Boston Yard. And consequently, um, after the cry was heard, he was able to reach the scene of the crime ahead of the police, who had to run some distance. Oh, sounds reasonable enough, eh, Holmes? Mm. Oh, yes, that must be the old boy up ahead there. He's sitting on the steps with one leg stuck out before him. Yes, he's noticed us. He's getting up. No. He's walking away in the other direction. Oh! Great Scott, what was that? The prelude to the night's crime, confound it. But that's impossible, Mr. Merriweather is here. We don't argue, Watson, run. There goes. A gentleman through the gate into, into the yard. I say he's a spry for a chap with only one good leg. Because he doesn't waste his breath as you do, Watson. Here's the entrance. Gentlemen! What happened? Oh, I warned him not to do it. I warned him, Mr. Merriweather said. But you were late, and he wanted to get the money to the bank. Good Lord. It's Jeremy. What oh, a plague of the best old Jeremy. But the money's safe. And up this time, they didn't get it. I was waiting. I'm done for, but the money's safe. Uh, Jeremy, you know who hit you. I... I, I I suspect it for some time. Now I know. Gladly hurt, Holmes. He's going fast. He can't not before he tells us. Mr. Jeremy, who is the criminal? It's, uh, it's, uh, Peggy. Peggy? I, uh, Holmes, he's gone. Jeremy, Jeremy, my poor old Jeremy. But who in thunder is Peggy? It, do you know, Donovan? Oh, how should I know? The cat, it, it must have been a woman all the time. A woman dressed in men's clothes. A woman who could give a man a blow hard enough to kill him and then disappear over a 12-foot wall. You saw her do that, Donovan, before we came in the yard a minute after you got here? Oh, well, well, that is an enormous... Maybe tonight I, I, I didn't see the killer. Maybe tonight I... Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I was that upset when I seen it with Jeremy. Hello, hello. What's up? What's wrong here? Mr. Jeremy has been bludgeoned, Lestrade. He's dead. Oh, he is, eh? Right under Mr. Sherlock Holmes's nose, eh? Lestrade, whoever finished off old Jeremy is still here in this courtyard. We, he couldn't have scaled the wall this time. We'd have seen him. But it wasn't a he, Holmes. Mr. Jeremy said his assailant's name was Peggy. I don't care what his or her name was. If he or she is still here, I want him. Or her. You fellas, touch the yard. That's what we've been doing, Governor. And uh, I think we found something interesting here behind the rain barrel. What's that? Well, it's a man uh, lying like he was drunk. He's somebody that was thrown out of the pub earlier in the evening, like it's not. And who resented it and vowed to get even with Jeremy. There's motive and opportunity as well. Arrest him and take him off to jail. And you, Donovan, help him carry the body back into the elephant and castle. Yes, sir. This way, boy. Uh, carry him easy and with respect. My poor Jeremy. My poor, poor Jeremy. Well, Holmes, you can't say Scotland Yard hasn't acted with dispatch and efficiency. And with its usual lack of intelligence and concern for truth and justice. If this man isn't guilty, I suppose you can tell us who he is. Quite. However, you wouldn't believe me. You see, I have no proof of my theory. It will take until next Saturday night to acquire that. <laughs> I feel dashed silly, Holmes. Dressed up in this bang messenger outfit. Well, what's the point to it all? Watson, we're dealing with a sly and devious criminal. The only way is to catch him red-handed. 
During your service in the Far East, I believe you've taken part in a tiger hunt. Oh, what of it? You know the procedure. The hunter tethers a kid or a lamb to a tree and then retires to a nearby blind to wait for the tiger to attack his prey. Only this time, it's not a tiger we're after. It's a cat named Piggy. And I'm the goat. Quite. Yes, I think you may start on your journey across Boston Yard, Watson. See, it's raining tonight. Lowers the visibility. However, perhaps that's just as well, or the killer might recognize you. Hmm. Well, I'll open the door and out you go. You've got the earnings of the elephant and castle safe in your pouch? Well, naturally, you put them there. Well, good luck, Watson. Don't be too nervous. Remember, Lestrade is hidden behind the rain barrel. Well, a fine lot of comfort that is. Well, let's get it over with. Now, chin up, old boy. And whatever you do, fall sideways when I call out. Into a mud puddle, probably. Don't argue. Do as I say. Your life may depend on it. Good Lord. What a night. Teeming cats and dogs. Cats. Never cared much for cats. And this isn't going to improve my... What's that shadow slinking along the wall over there? Oh, confound this rain. I can't see a thing. Ah! What was that? Someone's coming this way. He's running through the gate. Donovan. Hey, Donovan, watch up. He stopped. He snatched up his wooden leg. He... What's in the dark? Now then, Donovan, I'll take that wooden leg if you don't mind. One with which you bludgeon seven people. So it's you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Something told me this was my unlucky night. You can come out to Strad and take criminal in charge. You needn't crow, Holmes. I saw the old thing. Well, got your head handed this time, Donovan. Yes, you've got the criminal and his weapon. Notice the spikes in the upper end of this wooden leg. The one of the victims looks as if they've been clawed by a giant cat. Well, no use hanging about in this blast of rain. Come along, Donovan. You've slugged and robbed your last best messenger. It reminds me. Watson, where are you? Flat on the ground in a puddle, of course. Look at me. Nice mess. <laughs> uh, I say, Holmes, I'm... I'm still perplexed, you know. Why? Well, who was the man who screamed just now? Why did Jeremy say the cat's name was Peggy? And uh, when did you first suspect Donovan was the criminal? The answers to those questions can wait, Watson, until I get you safely home in a hot tub. That's... Huddle has soaked you to the skin. And besides, this is Saturday night. Right now is the time to visit that good store in your community that sells Clippercraft clothes. Yes, right now. For despite advancing clothing prices, Clippercraft continues to give you the same fine quality at prices amazingly low. Smart styling, fine tailoring, and perfect fit. The values are unbelievable, that's all. But they didn't just happen. They're the result of the famous Clipper Craft plan. Concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. That's why even today, you can buy top coats and fine coverts and worsted gabardines for only $40 and $45, and sport jackets for only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. And remember, that store is one of the 1,036 leading retail stores across the nation where courtesy and friendly service are always yours. The store that is proud to add its fine name to that of Clipper Craft clothes in the label of your suit, Top coat, sport jacket, and overcoat. And remember also, not every pattern is always available in your size, but keep on trying. It'll pay you to wait for Clipper Craft clothes. And now back to Baker Street. We find Dr. Watson sitting firmly in the midst of an old-fashioned tin tub, to which Holmes is adding a tea kettle full of very hot water. Oh, that's enough, 
Do you want to scald me? Yes, you are beginning to look nicely parboiled. Mm. Yeah, I think you'll do. Then, uh, how about answering my questions? Oh, very well. One. The man who screamed was never the victim, Watson. It was old Donovan who was building himself an alibi. He screamed when he saw his victim cross the yard. Then he dashed in, took off his leg, and bashed him while the police were running down the street in answer to his shouts for help. Two. Jeremy said the cat's name was Peggy, because that's what he called Donovan. Many a peg-legged man is nicknamed Peggy, you know. And lastly, I knew Donovan was a criminal when Mr. Merriweather told us how distinctly he described the cat man who crawled over the fence on the night of the first robbery. But uh, why was that suspicious? <laughs> Elementary, my dear Watson. It was a dark, foggy night. He couldn't have seen the criminal in detail. Remember, it wasn't until the policeman had turned his dark lantern on the victim that he could tell he was a bank messenger. Q-E-D. I see. Well, it's all so remarkably simple, once you explain. It always is, Watson. It always is. Well, don't just stand there puffing yourself up. You, you might get busy and scrub my back, you know. Well, that was an interesting adventure, Dr. Watson. And what story are we to have uh, next week? Next week's story takes place in the Tower of London. It tells how Holmes and I rescued a damsel in distress and reformed a stony-hearted army officer and recovered a golden platter that should, by rights, have remained with a crown jewel. I call it the case of King Philip Golden Salver. Makers of Clipper Clap Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Loughran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft. 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of King Philip's Gold and Salver. <laughs> Charles Starr speaking for Clipper Class Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System. New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's adventure, the case of King Philip's Golden Salver. Well, well, if it isn't our old friend, Mr. Harris, returned from his vacation with a brand new coat of tan. Ah, <laughs> but still wearing my favorite Clippercraft suit, Doctor, and looking forward to a Sherlock Holmes adventure. What's it to be tonight, Doctor Watson? Well, Mr. Harris, it uh, concerns the strange disappearance of an elaborate golden platter sent to Queen Elizabeth by Philip of Spain. It was, of course, a priceless historical masterpiece that belonged by rights with the rest of the crown jewels in the Tower of London. The Tower of London, what a fabulous place that is, Doctor Watson. It is indeed, Mr. Harris, dating from William the Conqueror. It has been a citadel, a royal palace, a state prison, and a mint. 
It is still a fortress, an armory, and a treasury with a resident military garrison. Mm, quite a setup. It represents the most glorious as well as the most bloody pages of English history. And does tonight's story live up to the Tower's reputation, Doctor? Well, I suppose I answer that question after you've said a word or two in behalf of Tipper Crown. Hmm? Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Wherever you go in America, fine stores sell Clipper Craft clothes. Yes, proudly sell them. And recommend them to men who demand the most for their money. Now, that's because truly fine clothes, especially in these days of high prices, are nowhere else available at such modest prices. You see, it's the Clipper Craft plan that makes these amazing values possible. By concentrating the buying power of 1,036 fine stores from coast to coast, Tremendous savings are made in manufacturing and distribution costs. The savings go just one place, to you. At a friendly local independent store, you get superlatively fine Clippercraft suits at the incredibly low price of $40 and $45. Beautifully tailored top coats and fine coverts and worsted gabardine for only $40 and $45, and sport jackets for only $26.50. Compare them tomorrow with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to the Tower of London, Dr. Watson. Mm, yes, it was one glorious afternoon in early June. The late afternoon sunshine cast a glow of gold on Tower Green. To the right of us loomed the great original keep of William the Conqueror called the White Tower. Say, I've seen pictures of it. Part fortress, part dungeon. Uh, to the left was Beecham Tower. And directly ahead was the little chapel of St. Peter. Holmes was enjoying one of his favorite forms of relaxation, feeding raw beef to the ravens who still inhabit that spot. The same spot where once stood the scaffold on which was poured out the lifeblood of some of the greatest names in English history. Here, here, here. I'm not so greedy. You've had your share. Oh, great bloated, beastly birds with their evil yellow eyes. How can you endure the sight of them, Holmes? Think of the bodies their ancestors must have fed on. Don't be so squeamish, Watson. The scaffold which formerly stood on this site was used only for the beheadings of Queen's Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, the Countess of Salisbury, Viscountess Rockford, Lady Jane Grey, and the Earl of Essex. <coughs> no, no, no. You next. As a rule, the political prisoners incarcerated in the tower were beheaded on Tower Hill or hanged at Tyburn. There were, of course, exceptions. Oh, well, naturally. Archbishop Cranmer and Bishops Latimer and Ridley were burned at Oxford. Sir Walter Raleigh was executed in Old Palace Yard. Sir Thomas Overbury was poisoned. The two little princes, Edward V and the Duke of York, were strangled in the bloody tower. Then, of course, there was the Duke of Clarence who was drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. <laughs> I must say, if I had to be executed, that's the method I'd choose. Oh, go away, you shoo. Ow! Holmes, he bit me. <laughs> Serves you right for making sport of the tower's traditions. Hello. Who is the young lady coming across the parade ground? She looks vaguely familiar. She's holding her parasol so far over her face she can't pop. There, you see, she almost ran into that beef eater. Now she just missed the old lady with the ear trumpet. What's the matter with the girl? Can't you see where she's going? Probably not, Watson. She's trying desperately to keep from crying. Great Scottish Lady Cynthia, sister of that ass Bobby C. Simon and daughter of the Duke of Balmoral. Now, what do you suppose a pretty thing like that has to cry about? Life isn't all beer and skittles, Watson, even to those in Burke's peerage. Yes, and Miss, I'm very much mistaken. She's upset because her fiancé, young Lieutenant Ronald Backwater has been chucked in the guardhouse and threatened with court-martial and dismissal from the tower guards. Good Lord, whatever for? Stealing, Watson. He's accused of purloining a precious golden platter. Yes, I rather thought we might run into the Lady Cynthia if we visited the tower this afternoon. Holmes, you fraud, and I thought you came here to feed the ravens. Here she is. My dear Lady Cynthia, is there anything I can do? No, no, thank you. I, I'm quite all right. A cinder in my eye. There, there's nothing I... Wait a minute, you're Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service. Oh, I don't know what to say. Oh, dear, what did I do with my handkerchief? Oh, uh, allow me to offer mine, Lady Cynthia. Thank you. Oh, you must be Dr. Watson. Oh, you're both so kind to me. He didn't do it, you know. Ronnie isn't a thief. Of course not. It's all the fault of that dreadful old man. What old man? The Stafford Blodgett, the new mayor and governor of the tower. He's a dried-up old bachelor himself. 
Well over 40. <laughs> dear, dear. Practically senile. Hey, Watson? He doesn't want anyone in the guards to get married. Blodgett. Great Scott, that must be old blood and bullets Blodgett. Yes, I believe that's what Ronnie and Arthur call him. Arthur can't get married either because his fiancée hasn't any more money than I have. Oh, I hate that old Blodgett and I wish he were dead. You're not the first to make that statement, my dear. I served under him at my wand where he won his V.C. The entire regiment hated his gizzard. Well, he is a magnificent soldier and as cruel a man as ever ordered his native orderly beaten for forgetting to clean his boots. Oh, the beast. Why did he have to be put in charge of a tower? Oh, dear. I'm making a perfect spectacle of myself. What will everyone think? Now, it's the heat of the sun. Very, very trying. Suppose we just slip into the little chapel of St. Peter's up ahead there. Where it's... Quiet and dark and cool. We'll pick out a nice, comfortable pew, and you can tell Sherlock Holmes all about it. There we are, my dear. Suppose we take the third pew. Oh, thank you. Watson, you might offer the lady a whip of smelling salts oh, and a fresh handkerchief. I'm oh. sorry to be such a nuisance. I'll be all right in a minute. Quite. As you know, Watson, the premises known as the Tower of London are completely surrounded by the city of London. It's a self-ruled and regulated community. Its gates are locked at night, and its ancient moat, although it's drained to make a parade ground, is still capable of being flooded. Sounds fairly medieval. And the absolute ruler of the entire place, the individual whose word is law... Is the mayor and governor. In this case, old blood and bullets, alias uh, Stafford Blodgett. Correct. He resides on the premises, as do his officers and men. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, last night, Sir Stafford Blodgett invited five of the younger officers to his quarters for dinner. Uh, the ones who had petitioned to marry this June, you know. Good Lord, do they uh, have to get permission from him to do that, too? Oh, oh, no, not to get married, exactly. But he does say whether or not he considers the young ladies suitable, you know. And if he decides they're not... Oh, then the prospective bridegroom is advised to give up the whole idea or resign from the guards. How perfectly barbaric. Quite. So you can imagine how divvily the poor chaps were when it got round they'd been summoned to hear the verdict. Dinner was to be at eight, and promptly at three minutes past, they sat down at the Stafford Oak table in his sitting room in the Byward Tower. Byward Tower? But I thought the governor's quarters were always in King's House. And so they are. But that would be too cozy and cheerful for the old vulture... No, he's moved into Byward Tower because it's grimmer, I would bound. I wonder. It has other rather strategic advantages, you know. Byward Tower is a curious appellation, eh, Holmes? I wonder how it got the name. Byward was formerly a synonym for password, Watson. Byward Tower has always been the main entrance to the Tower of London. Of course. That's why he's moved there. So he could spy on his men as they went in and out. There could just possibly be another reason, you know. However, suppose you finish telling me about the dinner party. Oh, it was a very elegant dinner party. Properly chilled white wine with a turbot, an excellent burgundy with a roast. Not that anyone but old blood and bullets had much appetite. He eats like a, an anaconda. Well, finally they came to the suite. It was served on an enormous golden platter, which Sir Stafford had had specially brought in for the occasion. <laughs> that part of Chivers. I'll finish off that last bit of pudding. Yes, sir. I want these young hopefuls to have a good look at the design underneath. Yeah. Ah, oh, there. Huh. Clean as a whistle. Uh, pass it around. That's a good chap. Oh, very good, sir. But I say, Sir Stafford, isn't this that King Philip salver that's kept with the crown jewels? Right you are, my quarter. Presented by Philip of Spain to Elizabeth when he was courting the lady. Hence the rather a... Uh, Frank representation of the goddess Aphrodite and all the little cupids. Yes. <laughs> a historic piece. Rather appropriate to this occasion, eh, what? That's why I had it brought over. Of course, Philip never managed to marry the lady. We hope you lads have better luck. Oh, did he have to say that? That's bad taste. Easy, Ronnie. Don't get the wind up. I don't like the glint in the old buzzard's eye. He's up to something. And now as the port goes round, shall we proceed to the more agreeable portion of the evening's entertainment? Hmm, uh, yes. I have here a list of the young ladies on whom you have bestowed your affection for one reason or another. <laughs> That's not a joke, Backwater. Oh, sorry, sir. Personally, I've never believed that marriage was a help to any man's army career. However, there's, there's no ruling against it as far as I can do, I suppose. Yes, now, uh, let me see. 
Uh, Lieutenant Reginald Wentworth, you wish to marry the Honorable Nora Jennings? Uh, yes, sir. No objection. Oh, poor Reggie. I think he's going to faint with relief. Next, Lieutenant Herbert Woolsey, you desire to marry a Miss Ruby Reynolds. I understand she's an American. Most unsuitable. But she was educated in England, sir. I said most unsuitable. Next, Lieutenant Arthur Emerson. <clears throat> there I go. Has chosen a Miss Fanny Venable. No objection. Oh, thank you, sir. Good luck, Arthur. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Lieutenant uh, Buford Wellington intended his, uh, let me see, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Lady Daphne Marchbank. Sorry, Wellington, won't do. But, but uh, her father is the Earl of Battersby, sir. Her mother was a gaiety girl. Quite out of the question. Oh, what, Rod Arthur? I... Daphne's mother's first rate, accepted everywhere. Easy, Ronnie, don't get hot under the collar of your neck. Oh. At last, we come to Lieutenant Ronald Backwater, who wishes to marry Lady Cynthia St. Simon. Delightful young lady. Most suitable. Oh, that's a relief. Not that I expected trouble, but... You I have only one Arthur thing Backwater. more to say on this so subject. Well. During my tenure here in charge of the tower, I shall make one further ruling about young ladies who marry into the corps. What's that, sir? As you know, the officers in this outfit are a hand-picked lot. We've always boasted the best blood in the empire, even if we are only younger sons. My point! Exactly. Younger sons are so often not too well supplied with worldly goods. That's one of the reasons we chose the army, sir. Don't interrupt, confound it. Oh, sorry, sir. The pay of an officer in the Tower Guard is enough to keep him in proper style. If he is a bachelor. Now, what's he getting at? Right, Ronnie. It has, however, come to my attention that men with families sometimes have to scrape a bit. Don't tell me the old boy's going to get us a raise in pay. Oh, not old blood and bullets. The Tower Guard is called upon on appear on many occasions of state. During the last royal review, I was horrified to notice that the dress uniforms of two captains... Both of them, married men, showed signs of wear. One of them had a small down on the left sleeve. Oh, horrors, the empire is crumbling. <laughs> Consequently, I feel it incumbent upon me to make a new ruling. Any young lady wishing to marry an officer of the Tower Guard must bring with her a dowry of 5,000 pounds minimum. Why, oh, that's, that's outrageous, what? sir. It's impossible. The girls we want to marry, they're from good families, but they're not rich. Then I suggest you look around a bit further until you find some that are. But that's unfair, sir. It's rank tyranny. That's what I... Are you presuming to criticize your superior officer? Yes, by yes, heaven, Ronnie. By what right do you... Ronnie, have... shut up, you fool. Don't get the old boys back up. Ah. We'll get round him somehow. What's that? Oh, I was telling Lieutenant Backwater that you had only his own good at heart, sir. Hmm. Uh, yes, sir. Uh... I'm glad to see someone in this outfit has some appreciation of my point of view. And now, gentlemen, when Chief is clear of the table, I ex suggest I show you around my quarter. Uh, first of all, I'll demonstrate the portcullis. Oh, by the way, Chivers, put the gold platter on the table by the door. And don't take your eye off of it for a minute. I'll take it back to Wakefield Tower myself later on. Very good, sir. Right away, sir. And now the portcullis, gentlemen. The machinery that operates it is here in the hallway next to the bar. Wait. I'll demonstrate. I carry the key to the padlock myself. Don't want anyone else fooling with it. <laughs> you know, uh... Oh, here we are. Now then, if someone will warn them below, the bars of the portcullis are dashed heavy. Wouldn't want to impale anyone. I'll attend to it, sir. Look out below! We're lowering the portcullis. Ready, you eh? Here she goes. I say, sir, that is impressive. Yes. This portcullis here in Byward Tower and the one in the Bloody Tower are the only two in England still in working order. Must make you feel quite safe, sir. Once that's down, no one can get in. And no one can get out, either. <laughs> but come along, gentlemen. I'll show you my sleeping quarters. Now, this way. I only use three rooms. Kitchen, sitting room, and bedroom. Enough for an old soldier, you know. Now, here we are, gentlemen. My bedroom. I say, it's almost circular, built into the tower itself. 
And what a whopping big canopy bed. I never use it. Here's where I sleep. Here in this outfield. Don't believe any soldier worth his salt should sleep in a bed. My army cot here. Slept on it during all my campaigns. Sleep on it now and always will, confound it. <laughs> Probably die in it. Ah, a Spartan life. That's what the army needs. Discipline. Self-denial. What's the matter, Backwater? Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I feel a bit under the weather. If you'll excuse me a moment, sir. Is it typical? Typical of the younger generation. No intestinal fortitude. Can't even carry their liquor. Uh, come over here, gentlemen, and I'll let you see my decorations. Keep them in a box here in the top drawer. Cheevers. Cheevers, I'm sorry, but the bathroom door seems to be locked. Oh, yes, sir. The governor keeps the key in the sideboard. I'll fetch it for you. He's a very cautious cat, the governor is. He keeps everything locked up, even to the whiskey. Uh, which... Oh, yes, in the bottom drawer. Here, here it is. Here it is, sir. What? Well, what's the matter, sir? You look so stiff and funny. Like you was on parade. Well, oh, it's nothing, Cheevers. I've just had an idea. A perfectly brilliant idea. <laughs> the tour of the premises. Uh, it didn't take long, eh, what? Shivers. Yes, cigars and bring another decanter of port. Yes, sir. I say, what's become of Backwater? Here he comes, sir, across the hall. Hey there, Backwater. In here. Oh, sorry, sir. When I finished washing up, I went back into the bedroom to join you. Well, we're back in here. You missed seeing my medals. Oh, I say, sir, I am sorry. Uh, never mind, never mind. Major, oh, I mean, Governor. What up, uh, Chivers? How often must I tell you not to address me as Sir Stafford? Yes, sir. Well, sir, whoever you are, the platter's gone, sir. What? Yes, sir. Someone swiped Philip's golden platter. Women have an eye for value, so take a lady along when you select your new Clippercraft suit. For well, there isn't a test Clippercraft clothes can't pass. Note how comfortable you feel in a long-wearing Clippercraft worsted suit. Here's downright amazing value, and in the fine local independent store that sells Clippercraft clothes. These sensational values, in the face of today's high prices, are the result of the Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. That's why today you pay only forty and forty-five dollars for truly fine Clippercraft suits. Only forty and forty-five dollars for top coats, and only twenty-six fifty for sport jackets. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. And remember, that's one of the 1,036 leading retail stores across the nation where courtesy and friendly service are always yours. The store that is proud to add its fine name to that of Clipper Craft Clothes in the label of your suit, top coat, sport jacket, and overcoat. And remember also, not every pattern is always available in your size, but keep on trying. It will pay you to wait for Clipper Craft Clothes. <laughs> to our friends in St. Peter's Chapel. Lady Cynthia is just finishing her story. Well, you can imagine the commotion, Mr. Holmes. Quite. Oh, blood and bullets, blood pressure probably blew up and burst. Oh, it did, Dr. Watson, it did. He lost all sense of proportion. He immediately accused Ronnie of having taken the wretched platter, simply because he was the only one who was out of his sight for a moment. And also because he'd come back in the sitting room to speak to Cheevers, no doubt. Yes, but he couldn't have done it, Mr. Holmes. I, I mean, Ronnie wouldn't think of such a thing. My dear Lady Cynthia, I hope Ronnie insisted on being searched immediately. Oh, he did, Mr. Holmes. They didn't find a trace of anything, naturally. But even then, Sir Stafford wasn't satisfied. He said Ronnie had probably dropped it out of the window to an accomplice. <laughs> Sir Stafford's a fool. The presence of an accomplice would mean the theft was premeditated. I gather no one but Sir Stafford knew the platter was to be on the premises. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Then there's no possibility of an accomplice. Whoever stole King Philip Salva was present at the dinner party. Well, what's to prevent an outsider sneaking up the stairs when everyone was in the bedroom admiring Sir Stafford's medal? You forget, Watson. The portcullis had been lowered. No one could get in or out. No, the golden platter was undoubtedly still on the premises when it was found to be missing. But that's impossible. 
Martha and the rest insisted on being searched, too. And Sir Stafford Blodgett went over the rest of the premises himself. Very interesting, eh, Watson? And yet the platter must be there. It's probably still there, in the most obvious place. Why, Mr. Holmes, what do you mean by that? Ever read the purloined letter, Lady Cynthia? No, I can't say I have. If you had, you'd realize at once what probably happened to the platter. Yes, Watson, I suggest you and I go round to the guardhouse and have a chat with the incarcerated Lieutenant Ronald Backwater. But, Mr. Holmes, they won't let you see him. They won't let anyone see him. Endurance file, eh? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid the British Army doesn't always observe the rights of the individual set forth in our common law, especially when there's a blowhard like Sir Stafford Blodgett in charge. Oh, dear, then you can't do anything for Ronnie? On the contrary, Lady Cynthia. By tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I shall arrive at the guardhouse with a note that should get us by St. Peter himself. You mean Ronnie has to stay in that dreadful place another night? One more night should strengthen, not weaken his case. But be of good cheer, my dear. I think I can safely promise that within 24 hours, the platter will have been found, and Ronnie and all his brother officers shall have obtained full permission to marry the ladies of their respective choice. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you're wonderful. Quite. <laughs> My friend and I here have written permission to interview Lieutenant Ronald Backwater. And who gave it you? The rather august personage whose name is at the bottom of this pass. All right, let's have a look. It... Blimey, the old girl herself. And it says here, you're Sherlock Holmes. Well, I never. Mind if I kick this slip of paper? I mean, missus will never believe me when I tell her. As you like. Uh, oh, come in, come in, gentlemen. <laughs> Please to step inside. All right, this way. It's just a step down the corridor. And mind the floor, it's a bit uneven. Lieutenant Backwater, sir. Yes? There's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Thingamabob to see you, sir. Thingamabob? Oh, what's his name? Mr. Holmes, who sent for you? I am acting on behalf of your fiancée, the Lady Cynthia St. Simon. She still wants to marry you, it seems, in spite of everything. Oh, but she knows... She must know I didn't steal a silly platter. You did take it, however. Don't you think it's been missing long enough? The longer it's missing, the more of a fool he'll look when they find it. Oh, I'd like to see his face when it turns up. Maybe, may not be for months. <laughs> not at all. Watson and I are about to go across to the Bywood Tower and find it for him. Oh, good hunting, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Good hunting. <laughs> Chivers, your name is Chivers, I believe. Oh, yes, sir. Tell Sir Stafford that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have come to trace King Philip's missing trencher. Uh, oh, you can't do that, sir. Why not? Don't tell me it's already been found. Uh, oh, no, sir. Nobody's seen either or air of it since I put it over there on that table by the door the night before last. Oh, I guess it meant you couldn't see old blood and, uh, the governor because he's dressing for a view. Always puts his medals on for a view. Rules is rules with Sir Stafford. He don't never break any of them. Worse luck. Interesting. Very interesting. I'm afraid the illusions of the tower guards are about to be shattered, eh, Watson? I haven't the remotest idea what you're blithering about, Holmes. Uh-oh. Here comes old blood and bullets himself. What's all this commotion in here? Who in blazes are you? Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Hmm. Dr. Watson. Weren't you attached to my regiment in the Second Afghan War? I joined the boxes just before my wand. Then why did you stay with him? Because my shoulder was shattered by a Jezail bullet. And you needn't shout at me. I haven't been in the army for some years now, and it doesn't amuse me. <laughs> Bravo, Watson. Watson, who is this uncut individual? The most famous consulting detective in the entire world, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Never heard of him. Well, he's here to solve the mystery of King Philip's missing solver. Rats. I've looked everywhere. He has looked everywhere. Not here. Oh, but it must be. It couldn't be anywhere else. You probably don't know how to look. And I suppose you do. Oh, I don't have to look. I know where it is. You don't say. It's in the only place it could be, you know. Young Ronald Backwater did remove it from the table. He took it with him to the bathroom, and later, when the bedroom was clear, he hid it in your bed. But that's preposterous. Do you think I wouldn't have noticed it when I went to bed? Oh, you would have, if... You slept in the bed you claim you slept in every night since you joined the army. Shall we investigate your army cot, Sir Stafford? But, uh, I think we'll uh, let Chivers do it. Chivers, would you mind bringing me the platter that's hidden in Sir Stafford's army cot? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. 
Sir Stafford, I strongly suspect that you are neither a Spartan nor a celibate, as you claim to be. Why, you... Where in thunder did you get that idea? The next time you have a midnight visitor, I suggest you remind her not to leave her garter hanging on the samovar. Yes, the portcullis is a handy device to ensure privacy, isn't it? You won't... You won't give me away, Mr. Holmes. I'd be the laughing stock of the entire British Army. Think of my reputation. Think of the battles I've won. Think of the men you browbeaten and bullied. Think of the young ladies whose hearts you tried to break. But I'll change all that. I'll turn over a new leaf. I'll be kindness and consideration itself. Here it is, Mr. Holmes. The blinking pleasure. Just where you said it, Bill. You, you go to blazes. Now, Sir Stafford. I mean, uh, thank you, Chivers. Thank you very much. Dr. Watson, I never thought I'd hear of Sherlock Holmes playing Cupid. And very successfully, too, Mr. Harris. There were six weddings in the Tower Chapel that June. Six? But, Dr. Watson, I thought you said only five young officers wanted to get married. Five young officers, yes. But much to everyone's surprise, Sir Stafford decided to become a Benedict as well. <laughs> you never know what Sherlock Holmes will accomplish, do you? <laughs> you never do, <laughs> Mr. Harris. You never do. And now, Dr. Watson, what Sherlock Holmes adventure are you going to tell us next week? Let me see. Now, suppose I relate the rather grotesque case of the six identical plaster busts which were smashed one after another and how murder and a fabulous duel were involved. It is, of course, the adventure of the six Napoleons. <laughs> Makers of Clippercraft clothes at 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. The dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. This is Brotherhood Week. Let's make it work. Judge every man by his individual worth, not by some label. Don't spread any rumor against any race or religion. And don't listen to them either. Speak up against prejudice and for understanding. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Sixth Napoleon. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Holmes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations, the mutual broadcasting system. City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's adventure, the case of King Philip's Golden Salver. Well, well, if it isn't our old friend, Mr. Harris, returned from his vacation with a brand new coat of tan. Ah, oh, but still wearing my favorite Clippercraft suit, Doctor, and looking forward to a Sherlock Holmes adventure. What's it to be tonight, Dr. Watson? Well, Mr. Harris, it uh, concerns the strange disappearance of an elaborate golden platter sent to Queen Elizabeth by Philip of Spain. It was, of course, a priceless historical masterpiece that belonged by right to the rest of the crown jewels in the Tower of London. The Tower of London, what a fabulous place that is, Doctor. It is indeed, Mr. Harris, dating from William the Conqueror. It has been a citadel, a royal palace, a state prison, 
and a mist. It is still a fortress, an armory, a treasury with a resident military garrison. Mm, quite a setup. It represents the most glorious as well as the most bloody pages of English history. And does tonight's story live up to the tower's reputation, Doctor? Well, I suppose I answer that question after you've said a word or two in behalf of Kippercraft. Hmm? Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Wherever you go in America, find stores. They'll return to the Tower of London, Dr. Watson. Mm, yes. It was one glorious afternoon in early June. The late afternoon sunshine cut the globe of gold on Tower Green. To the right of us loomed the great original keep of William the Conqueror called the White Tower. There have been pictures of it, part fortress, part dungeon. Uh, to the left was Beacham Tower, and directly ahead was the little chapel of St. Peter. Holmes was enjoying one of his favorite forms of relaxation, feeding raw beef to the ravens who still inhabit that spot. The same spot where once stood the scaffold on which was poured out the life blood of some of the greatest names in English history. <laughs> Here, here, here. I'm not so greedy. You've had your share. Oh, great bloated, beastly birds with their evil yellow eyes. How can you endure the sight of them, Holmes? Think of the bodies their ancestors must have fed on. Don't be so squeamish, Watson. The scaffold which formerly stood on this site was used only for the beheadings of Queen's Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, the Countess of Salisbury, Viscountess Roxford, Lady Jane Grey, and the other Essex. No, no, no. You next. As a rule, the political prisoners incarcerated in the Tower were beheaded on Tower Hill or hanged at Tyburn. There were, of course, exceptions. Well, naturally. Archbishop Cranmer and Bishop Latimer and Ridley were burned at Oxford. Sir Walter Raleigh was executed in Old Palace Yard. Sir Thomas Overbury was poisoned. The two little princes, Edward V and the Duke of York, were strangled in the bloody Tower. Then, of course, there was the Duke of Clarence who was drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. <laughs> I must say, if I had to be executed, that's the method I'd do. Oh, go away, you shoo. Oh, she bit me. <laughs> Served your wife for making sport of the tower's traditions. Hello. Who is the young lady coming across the parade ground? She looks vaguely familiar. She's holding her parasol so far over her face she can't pot. Here, you see, she almost ran into that beef eater. Now she just missed the old lady with the ear trumpet. What's the matter with the girl? Can't you see where she's going? Probably not, Watson. She's trying desperately to keep from crying. Great Scottish lady Cynthia, sister of that ass Bobby St. Simon and daughter of the Duke of Balmoral. Now, what do you suppose a pretty thing like that has to cry about? Life isn't all beer and skittles, Watson, even to those in Burt Peerage. Yes, and if I'm very much mistaken, she's upset because her fiancé, young Lieutenant Ronald Backwater has been chucked in the guardhouse and threatened with court-martial and dismissal from the Tower Guard. Good Lord, whatever for? Stealing, Watson. He's accused of purloining a precious golden platter. Yes, I rather thought we might run into the Lady Cynthia if we visited the Tower this afternoon. Holmes, you fraud, and I thought you came here to feed the ravens. Yes, she is. My dear Lady Cynthia, is there anything I can do? No, no, thank you. I, I'm quite all right. A tumor in my eye. There, there's nothing I... Wait a minute... You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service. Oh, I don't know what to say. Oh, dear, what did I do with my handkerchief? Oh, allow me to offer mine, Lady Cynthia. Thank you. Oh, you must have got to watch me. Oh, you're both so kind to me. He didn't do it, you know. Really, isn't a thief. Of course not. It's all the fault of that dreadful old man. What old man? The Stafford Blodgett, the new mayor and governor of the tower. He's a dried up old bachelor himself. Well over 40. <laughs> Dear, dear, practically senile. Hey, Watson. He doesn't want anyone in the guards to get married. Blodgett. Great Scott, that must be old blood and bullet Blodgett. Yes, I believe that's what Ronnie and Arthur call him. Arthur can't get married either because his fiancée has any more money than I have. Oh, I hate that old Blodgett and I wish he were dead. You're not the first to make that statement, my dear. I served under him at my wand where he won his VC. The entire regiment hated his gizzard. Well, he is a magnificent soldier and as cruel a man as ever ordered his native order to be beaten for forgetting to clean his boots. Oh, the beast. Why did he have to be put in charge of a tower? Oh, dear. I'm making a perfect spectacle of myself. What will everyone think? Now, it's the heat of the sun. Very, very trying. Suppose we just slip into the little chapel of St. Peter's up ahead there. Where it's quiet and dark and cool. We'll pick out a nice, comfortable pew and you can tell Sherlock Holmes all about it. we are 
Now, my dear, suppose we take the third piece. Oh, thank you. Watson, you might offer the lady a whip of smelling salt oh, with a handkerchief. I'm sorry to be such a nuisance, but I'll be all right in a minute. Quite. As you know, Watson, the premises known as the Tower of London are completely surrounded by the city of London. It's a self-ruled and regulated community. Its gates are locked at night, and its ancient moat, although it's drained to make a parade ground, is still capable of being flooded. Sounds fairly medieval. And the absolute ruler of the entire place, the individual whose word is law, is the mayor and governor. In this case, old blood and bullets, alias uh, Stafford Rogers. Correct. He resides on the premises, as do his officers and men. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, last night, Sir Stafford Rogers invited five of the younger officers to his quarters for dinner. Uh, the ones who were petitioned to marry this June, you know. Good Lord, did he uh, have to get permission from him to do that, too? Oh, oh, no, not to get married, exactly. But he does say whether or not he considers the young ladies suitable, you know. And if he decides they're not? Oh, then the prospective bridegroom is advised to give up the whole idea or resign from but the guard. How perfectly barbaric. Quite so you can imagine how divvery the poor chaps were when he got round they'd been summoned to hear the verdict. Dinner was to be at eight, and promptly at three minutes past, they sat down at the Stafford Oak table in his sitting room in the Byward Tower. Byward Tower? But I thought the governor's quarters were always in King's House. Well, so they are. But that would be too cozy and cheerful for the old vulture. No, he's moved into Byward Tower because it's grimmer, I would bound. I wonder... It is rather, rather strategic advantages, you know. Byward Tower, a curious appellation, eh, Holmes? I wonder how it got the name. Byward was formerly a synonym for password, Watson. Byward Tower has always been the main entrance to the Tower of London. Of course. That's why he moved there. So he could spy on his men as they went in and out. There could just possibly be another reason, you know. However, suppose you finish telling me about the dinner party. Oh, it was a very elegant dinner party. Properly chilled white wine with a turbot, an excellent burgundy with a roast. Not that anyone but old blood and bullets had much appetite. He eats like a, an anaconda. Well, finally they came to the suite. It was served on an enormous golden platter, which Sir Stafford had had specially brought in for the occasion. <laughs> That powder, Chivers. I'll finish off that nice bit of pudding. Yes, sir. I want these young hopefuls to have a good look at the design underneath. Now, ah, there. Huh. Clean as a whistle. Uh, pass it around. That's good, Jeff. Oh, very good, sir. But I say, Sir Stafford, isn't this that King Philip Chalbert that's kept with the crown jewels? Right you are, my quarter. Presented by Philip of Spain to Elizabeth when he was courting the lady. Hence the rather a. Uh, Frank representation of the goddess Aphrodite and all the little cupids. Yes. <laughs> a historic piece. Rather appropriate to this occasion, eh, what? That's why I had it brought over. Of course, Philip never managed to marry the lady. We hope you lads have better luck. Oh, did he have to say that? That's bad taste. Easy, Ronnie. Don't get the wind up. I don't like the glint in the old buzzard's eye. He's up to something. And now as the port goes round, shall we proceed to the more agreeable portion of the evening's entertainment? Hmm, uh, yes. I have here a list of the young ladies on whom you have bestowed your affection for one reason or another. <laughs> That's not a joke, Blackwater. Oh, sorry, sir. Personally, I never believed that marriage was a help to any man's army career. However, there's, there's no ruling against it as far as life can do, I suppose. Yes, now, uh, let me see. Uh, Lieutenant Reginald Wentworth, you wish to marry the Honorable Nora Jennings? Uh, yes, sir. No objection. Oh, poor Reggie, I think he's going to faint with relief. Next, Lieutenant Herbert Woolsey. You desire to marry a Miss Ruby Reynolds. I understand she's an American. Most unsuitable. But she was educated in England, sir. I said most unsuitable. Next, Lieutenant Arthur Anderson. <clears throat> there I go. Has chosen a Miss Fanny Venable. No objection. Oh, thank you, sir. Good luck, Arthur. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Lieutenant uh, Buford Wellington intended his, uh, let me see, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Lady Daphne Marchbank. Sorry, Wellington, won't do. But, but uh, her father is the Earl of Baddesby, sir. Her mother was a gaiety girl. Quite out of the question. Oh, what, Arthur? Uh, Daphne's mother's first rate, accepted everywhere. Easy, Ronnie, don't get hot under the collar. You're mad. Oh. At last, we come to Lieutenant Ronald Backwater, who wishes to marry Lady Cynthia St. Simon. Delightful young lady. Most suitable. Oh, that's a relief. Not that I expected trouble, but... I have only one thing more to say on this subject. 
During my tenure here in charge of the tower, I shall make one further ruling about young ladies who marry into the corps. What's that, sir? As you know, the officers in this outfit are a hand-picked lot. We've always boasted the best blood in the empire, even if we are only younger sons. My point, exactly. Younger sons are so often not too well supplied with worldly goods. That's one of the reasons we chose the army, sir. Don't interrupt, confound it. Oh, sorry, sir. The pay of an officer in the Tower Guard is enough to keep him in proper style. If he is a bachelor... Now what are you giving out? Quiet, Ronnie. It has, however, come to my attention that men with families sometimes have to scrape a bit. Don't tell me the old boy's going to get us a raise and pay. Oh, not old blood and bullets. The Tower Guard has called upon on the on many occasions of state. During the last royal review, I was horrified to notice that the dress uniforms of two captains... Both of them, married men, showed signs of wear. One of them had a small down on the left sleeve. Oh, horrors, the empire is crumbling, <laughs> Mr. Ronnie. <laughs> Consequently, I feel it incumbent upon me to make a new ruling. Any young lady wishing to marry an officer of the Tower Guard must bring with her a dowry of 5,000 pounds minimum. Why, oh, that's, that's outrageous, what? sir. Oh. It's impossible. The girls we want to marry, they're from good families, but they're not rich. Then I suggest you look around a bit further until you find some that are. But that's unfair, sir. It's right killing me. That's what I... Are you presuming to criticize your superior officer? Yes, by heaven, Ronnie. By what right do you... Ronnie, Ronnie shut up, you fool. Don't get the old boy back up. Sir. We'll get down him somehow. What's that? Oh, I was telling Lieutenant Backwater that you had only his own good at heart, sir. Hmm. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm glad to see someone in this outfit has some appreciation of my point of view. And now, gentlemen, while Jeff is clear at the table, I suggest I show you around my quarter. Uh, first of all, I'll demonstrate the portcullis. Oh, by the way, Shivers, put the gold platter on the table by the door. And don't take your eye off of it for a minute. I'll take it back to Wakefield Tower myself later on. Very good, sir. Right away, sir. And uh, now the portcullis, gentlemen. The machinery that operates it is here in the hallway next to the bar. Wait. I'll demonstrate. I carry the key to the padlock myself. Don't want anyone else fooling with it. <laughs> you know, uh... Oh, here we are. Now then, if someone will warn them below, the bars of the portcullis are dashed heavy. Wouldn't want to entail anyone. I'll attend to it, sir. Look out below! We're lowering the port colors. Ready away. Here she goes. Hey, sir, that is impressive. Yes? This port colors here in Byward Tower, and the one in the bloody tower are the only two in England still in working order. Must make you feel quite safe, sir. Once that's down, no one can get in. And no one can get out. Either. <laughs> but come along, gentlemen. I'll show you my sleeping quarters. Now, this way. I, I only use three rooms. Kitchen, sitting room, and bedroom. Enough for an old soldier, you know. Now, here we are, gentlemen. My bedroom. I say, it's almost... Circular, built into the tower itself. And what a whopping big canopy bed. I never use it. Here's where I sleep. Here in this alcove. Don't believe any soldier worth his salt should sleep in a bed. My army cot here. Slept on it during all my campaigns. Sleep on it now and always will, confound it. <laughs> I will really die in it. Ah, a spot in life. That's what the army needs. Discipline. Self-denial. What's the matter, backwater? Why are you looking at me like that? I'm oh, sorry, sir. I, I feel a bit under the weather. Would you excuse me a moment, sir? Mm -hmm. Typical. Typical of the younger generation. No intestinal fortitude. Can't even carry their liquor. Uh, come over here, gentlemen, and I'll let you see my decorations. Keep them in a box here in the top drawer. Sheba. Sheba, I'm sorry, but the bathroom door seems to be locked. Oh, yes, sir. The governor keeps the key in the sideboard. I'll fetch it for you. He's a very cautious chap, the governor is. Keeps everything locked up, even to the whiskey. Uh, whiskey. Oh, yes, in the bottom drawer. Here, here it is. Here it is, sir. What? What's the matter, sir? You look so stiff and funny. Like you was on parade. 
Well, it's nothing, Jesus. I've just had an idea. A perfectly brilliant idea. <laughs> They then secure the premises. Uh, it didn't take long, eh, what? Cheevers. Cigars and bring another decanter of port. Yes, sir. I say, what's become of Backwater? Here he comes, sir, across the hall. Hey, there. Backwater. In here. Oh, sorry, sir. When I finished washing up, I went back into the bedroom to join you. Well, we're back in here. You missed seeing my medals. Oh, I say, sir, I am sorry. Uh, never mind, never mind. Major! Oh, I mean, Governor! What's up, Sir Chivers? How often did I tell you not to address me as Sir Stafford? Yes, sir. Well, sir, whoever you are, the platter's gone, sir. What? Yes, sir. Someone swiped Philip's golden platter. <laughs> have an eye for value, so take a lady along when you select your new clipper crack. Now back to our friends in St. Peter's Chapel. Lady Cynthia is just finishing her story. Well, you can imagine the commotion, Mr. Holmes. Quite. Oh, blood and bullets, blood pressure probably blew up and burst. Oh, it did, Dr. Watson, it did. He lost all sense of proportion. He immediately accused Ronnie of having taken the wretched platter, simply because he was the only one who was out of his sight for a moment. And also because he'd come back into the fitting room to speak to Cheevers, no doubt. Yes, but he couldn't have done it, Mr. Holmes. I mean, Ronnie wouldn't think of such a thing. My dear Lady Cynthia, I hope Ronnie insisted on being searched immediately. Oh, he did, Mr. Holmes. They didn't find a trace of anything, naturally. But even then, Sir Stafford wasn't satisfied. He said Ronnie had probably dropped it out of the window to an accomplice. <laughs> Sir Stafford's a fool. The presence of an accomplice would mean the test was premeditated. I gather no one but Sir Stafford knew the platter was to be on the premises. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Then there's no possibility of an accomplice. Whoever stole King Philip Salva was present at the dinner party. Well, what's to prevent an outsider sneaking up the stairs when everyone was in the bedroom admiring Sir Stafford's medal? You forget, Watson, the portcullis had been lowered. No one could get in or out. No, the golden platter was undoubtedly still on the premises when it was found to be missing. But that's impossible. Arthur and the rest insisted on being searched, too. And Sir Stafford Blodgett went over the rest of the premises himself. Very interesting. Hey, Watson? And yet the platter must have been there. It's probably still there, in the most obvious place. Why, Mr. Holmes, what do you mean by that? Ever read the purloined letter, Lady Cynthia? No, I can't say I have. If you had, you'd realize at once what probably happened to the platter. Yes, Watson, I suggest you and I go round to the guardhouse and have a chat with the incarcerated Lieutenant Ronald Backwater. But, Mr. Holmes, they won't let you see him. They won't let anyone see him. Endurance file, eh? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid the British Army doesn't always observe the rights of the individual set forth in our common law. Especially when there's a blowhard like Sir Stafford Blodgett in charge. Oh, dear, then you can't do anything for Ronnie? On the contrary, Lady Cynthia. By tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I shall arrive at the guardhouse with a note that should get us by St. Peter himself. You mean Ronnie has to stay in that dreadful place another night? One more night should strengthen, not weaken his case. But be of good cheer, my dear. I think I can safely promise that within 24 hours, the platter will have been found. And Ronnie and all his brother officers shall have obtained full permission to marry the ladies of their respective choice. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you're wonderful. Quite. My friend and I here have written permission to interview Lieutenant Ronald Backwater. And who gave it to the rather august personage whose name is at the bottom of this pass? All right, let's have a look. Oh, now, the old girl herself. And it says here, you're Sherlock Holmes. Well, I never. Mind if I keep this slip of paper? I mean, missus will never believe me when I tell her. As you like. Oh, uh, uh, come in, come in, gentlemen. Please to step inside. All right, this way. It's just a step down the corridor. And mind the floor, it's a bit uneven. Lieutenant Backwater, sir. Yes? There's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Singlebob to see you, sir. Singlebob? Oh, such his fame. Mr. Holmes, who sent for you? I'm acting on behalf of your fiancée, the Lady Cynthia St. Simon. She still wants to marry you, it seems, in spite of everything. Oh, but she knows. She must know I didn't steal a silly platter. You did take it, however. Don't you think it's been missing long enough? The longer it's missing, the more of a fool he'll look when they find it. Oh, I'd like to see his face when it turns up. 
Maybe it may not be for months. <laughs> not at all. Watson and I are about to go across to the Bywood Tower and find it for him. Oh, good hunting, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Good hunting. <laughs> Tevers, your name is Tevers, I believe. Oh, yes, sir. Tell Sir Stafford that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have come to trace King Philip's missing trencher. Uh, oh, you can't do that, sir. Why not? Don't tell me it's already been found. Oh, no, sir. Nobody's seen either nor air of it since I put it over there on that table by the door the night before last. Oh, it just means you couldn't see old blood and, uh, the governor because he's dressing for a view. Always put his medals on for a view. Rule is ruled with Sir Stafford. He don't never break any of them. Worth that. Interesting. Very interesting. I'm afraid the illusions of the power guards are about to be shattered. Eh, Watson? I haven't the remotest idea what you're blithering about, Holmes. Uh-oh. Here comes old blood and bullets himself. What's all this commotion in here? Who in blazes are you? Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Hmm. Dr. Watson. Weren't you attached to my regiment in the Second Afghan War? I joined the box just before my wand. Then why did you stay with him? Because my shoulder was shattered by a Jezail bullet. You needn't shout at me. I haven't been in the army for some years now, and it doesn't amuse me. <laughs> Bravo, Watson. Watson, who is this uncrossed individual? The most famous consulting detective in the entire world, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Never heard of him. Well, he's here to solve the mystery of King Philip's missing solver. Right. I've looked everywhere. Even has looked everywhere. Not here. Oh, but it must be. It couldn't be anywhere else. You probably don't know how to look. And I suppose you do. Oh, I don't have to look. I know what it is. You don't say. It's in the only place it could be, you know. Young Ronald Backwater did remove it from the table. He took it put into the bathroom, and later, when the bedroom was clear, he hid it in your bed. But that's the master. Do you think I wouldn't have noticed it when I went to bed? Oh, you would have, if... You slept in the bed you claim you slept in every night since you joined the army. Wait, Mom. Shall we investigate your army cot, Sir Stafford? But, uh, I uh, think we'll uh, let Cheevers do it. Cheevers, would you mind bringing me the platter that's hidden in Sir Stafford's army cot? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Sir Stafford, I strongly suspect that you are neither a Spartan nor a celibate, as you claim to be. Why, you... Why, you insanity to get that idea? The next time you have a midnight visitor... I suggest you remind her not to leave her garter hanging on the samovar. Yes, a portcullis is a handy device to ensure privacy, isn't it? You won't, you won't give me away, Mr. Holmes. I'd be the laughing stock of the entire British Army. Think of my reputation. Think of the battles I've won. Think of the men you've browbeaten and bullied. Think of the young ladies whose hearts you've tried to break. But I've changed all that. I'll turn over a new leaf. I'll be kindness and consideration itself. Here it is, Mr. Holmes. The blinking pleasure. Just where you said it was. Oh, you go to places. Now, Sir Stafford. I mean, uh, thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Dr. Watson, I never thought I'd hear of Sherlock Holmes playing Cupid. And very successfully, too, Mr. Harris. There were six weddings in the Tower Chapel that June. Six? But, Dr. Watson, I thought you said only five young officers wanted to get married. Five young officers, yes. But much to everyone's surprise, Sir Stafford decided to become a Benedict as well. <laughs> you never know what Sherlock Holmes will accomplish, do you? <laughs> you never <laughs> do, <laughs> Mr. Harris. You never do. And now, Dr. Watson, what Sherlock Holmes adventure are you going to tell us next week? Let me see. Now, suppose I relate the rather grotesque case of the six identical plaster busts, which were smashed one after another, and how murder and a fabulous duel were involved. It is, of course... The Adventure of the Six Napoleons. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of the Six Napoleons.
Come in, Mr. Harris, Thank and you, take your usual chair there on the other side of the fireplace. Now, before we become further involved in the adventure which had to do with six Napoleons and a rather gory murder, suppose you say a few well-chosen words on a subject on which you have become almost as much of an authority as I am on the subject of the exploits of Sherlock Holmes. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's almost as much of a pleasure to recommend clipper craft clothes as it is to wear them. Say, are you in the market for a new suit of clothes? Well, Clipper Craft believes you're entitled to the very most for your money, even today in this era of high prices. That's good business for you, naturally, and it's good business for us, too. We've planned it that way by applying scientific American production methods to the fine old craft of clothes making. It's the great Clipper Craft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs, and delivering the savings to you. That's why, at a friendly, independent store in your community, you get beautifully tailored, fine-fitting, expensive-looking Clippercraft suits for only $40 and $45. Top coats, too, in fine coverts and worsted gabardines for only $40 and $45, and sport jackets at only $26.50. The values are downright amazing. Compare them tomorrow with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to return to your specialty, the adventures of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Yes, I must say it's an enthusiasm I seem to share with a great many friends and critics. As you probably know, there is a collection of erudite gentlemen all over the United States of America who are ardent Sherlock Holmes admirers, and who call themselves the Baker Street Irregulars. Why, would you believe it, they even argue with me about the accuracy of some of my stories. <laughs> Do they ever win the arguments, Dr. Watson? <laughs> you know, Holmes always said I had a weakness for embroidering a tale. But that's neither here nor there. So here's tonight's adventure... The Six Napoleons. Six Napoleons? Why, good grief, Doctor. I should think one gentleman of that caliber was all the world could stand at a time. Or is it the name of an acrobatic troupe? No, Mr. Harris, it's something even more unusual. As you may have gathered, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard was a frequent visitor of ours in the old Baker Street days. Between him and Sherlock Holmes, there was a friendly rivalry. His calls were welcome because they enabled us to keep in touch with things at Scotland Yard. In return for this news, Holmes was sometimes able, with or without any active interference, to give some valuable hint on the solution of a crime. Uh, the word isn't sometimes, Dr. Watson. It's frequently. <laughs> Possibly. On the particular evening I'm referring to, Lestrade had come in wearing a preoccupied look. He spoke casually of the weather and the newspapers. Then he fell silent, puffing thoughtfully on one of his uh, atrocious cigars. Holmes looked at him keenly. Nothing remarkable on hand, I suppose, Lestrade? Hmm? No, no, nothing in particular. Then tell me about it. Why, uh, <laughs> well, Holmes, there's no use denying there is something on my mind. Fancy that. Quiet, Watson. Well, to start out with it, has the Bank of England been threatened or has someone stolen the doormat at Scotland Yard? Well, as a matter of fact, the business is so absurd that I hesitate to bother you about it. On the other hand, though trivial, it is undoubtedly queer, and I know you have a taste for anything that's out of the common. Mm. In my humble opinion, it comes more in Dr. Watson's line than in ours. Oh, you mean disease? Well, madness, anyway, and a queer sort of madness, too. You'd hardly think anyone living in this day and age would have such a hatred of Napoleon that he felt compelled to break any image of him that he saw. Is that all? That sort of nonsense is no business of mine. Exactly. That's just what I said. But when the man commits burglary in order to satisfy his craving for breaking images, that takes it out of the doctor's province and into ours. Burglary, eh? That's more interesting. Give us the details. That's a good chap. Well, <clears throat> so far there have been four cases. Numbers one and two were reported four days ago. It was at the shop of Morse Hudson, who sells pictures and statues in the Kennington Road. The assistant had left the shop for a few moments when he heard a loud crash, hurried back and found two plaster busts of Napoleon lying shivered into fragments. 
He rushed out into the road but couldn't find the culprit, although several passers-by declared they had noticed a man run out of the shop. How much were the busts worth? Only a few shillings. Well, I thought you said there was a robbery. That's just one of those senseless acts of hooliganism which are becoming more and more prevalent. The third and fourth cases were more serious. Yes? Yes. They occurred only last night. In Kennington Road, and within a few hundred yards of Morse Hudson's shop, lives Dr. Barnicot, a well-known medical practitioner. By Jove, yes, I've heard of him. He has one of the largest practices on the south side of the Thames. Don't interrupt, Watson. Uh. Well, his residence and principal consulting rooms are in Kennington Road, but he has a branch surgery at Lower Buxton Road, two miles away. Dr. Barnicot's an enthusiastic admirer of Napoleon and had recently purchased from Moss Hudson two duplicate plaster casts of the famous head of Napoleon by the French sculptor Devine. One of these he placed in his home and one in the surgery in Buxton Road. Well, well, when Dr. Barnicot came down to breakfast this morning, he was astonished to find that the house had been broken into during the night and still more astonished to discover that the only thing taken was the plaster head of Napoleon. It had been carried out and shattered against the garden wall. This is beginning to be interesting. And the fourth case? At 12 o'clock, when Dr. Barnicot arrived at his surgery, he found the window broken and fragments of the fourth bust strewn all over the room. And there's no clue as to the criminal's identity. Hmm. Those are the facts, Mr. Oates. Hmm. Singular, not to say grotesque. Were the two busts smashed in Dr. Barnicot's rooms exact duplicates of the ones destroyed in Morse Hudson's shop? They were taken from the same mold. That's a coincidence, eh, Holmes? Yes, and it tells against the theory that the man who breaks these busts is influenced by a general hatred of Napoleon. How do you make that out, Mr. Holmes? Considering how many hundreds of statues of the great emperor must exist in London, it's too much to suppose that a promiscuous iconoclast would chance to begin with four specimens from the same mold. Mm, I thought that way myself at first, but... But on the other hand, this Morris Hudson's the only purveyor of busts in that part of London, and these four were the only ones of Napoleon that have been in his shop for years. Therefore, it seems logical that a local fanatic would begin with them. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Watson? Well, there are no limits to the possibilities of monomania, Lestrade. For example, there is the condition which the French psychologists call the idée fixe. It may be trifling in character and accompanied by complete sanity in every other way. A man who had read deeply about Napoleon might conceivably form such a needy fix and, under its influence, be capable of any fantastic outrage. No, it won't do, my dear Watson. It won't do. Oh, why not? No idée fix would enable your interesting monomaniac to find out where these busts are situated. Oh, all right, then. How do you explain it? I don't attempt to do so. Yet. But one thing is obvious. There's nothing abnormal about this bust smasher. There's too much method in his eccentric proceedings for that. In what way? But consider... In the Barnicott house, where any sound might arouse the family, the bust was taken outside before being broken. Whereas in the surgery, where there was less danger of an alarm, it was smashed where it stood. The affair seems absurdly trifling, and yet some of my most classic cases have had the least promising beginnings. You'll remember, Watson, how the dreadful business of the Abernethy family was first brought to my notice by the depth which the parsley had sunk into the butter on a hot day. I can't afford to smile at your broken bust, Lestrade. On the contrary, I... Hello, what's that? The front doorbell, of course. For a great detective, you do have your obtuse moments, Holmes. Naturally, I know it's the front doorbell. What I want to know is why it's ringing in the middle of the night. Come in. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. What's the matter? A policeman downstairs, sir, says Mr. Lestrade is wanted right away. What's up now? He said as how I was to tell you there'd been another bust busted. He said you'd know what he meant. It's becoming an epidemic. Confounded, why couldn't they have waited till morning to rout me out? He says you're to come right away, because this time there's a murder. Well, Mr. Harris, naturally, Holmes and I threw on our hats. I picked up my service revolver. And we dashed down the stairs with Lestrade panting behind us. Fortunately, a policeman had a cab waiting. We piled in hurriedly and drove off to Pitt Street, the scene of the crime. Holmes, Lestrade and I dismissed our cab at the corner of the street. It was obvious that news of the murder had got around. Here we are, Holmes, number 131 Pitt Street. That must be the house where the crime was committed. Yes, and a first-class murder it must have been. Nothing less would draw such a crowd in the middle of the night. 
Notice the look of horrified delight in that messenger boy's face. Here, let us through. Let us through, I say. We are from Scotland Yard. Oh, it's the yes, police. Yes, yes. Come in, gentlemen, come in. Ah, Mr. Lestrade, thank heaven you got here at last. Well, if it isn't Mr. Oris Arker of the Central Press Syndicate. It's an extraordinary thing, Lestrade. All my life I've been collecting other people's news. And now that a real piece of news has come my own way, I'm so confused and bothered that I can't put two words together. If I'd come in here as a journalist, I should have interviewed myself and had two columns in every evening paper. Uh, Mr. Arco... Uh, you we... remember when the stand fell in Doncaster? Well, I was the only journalist in the stand, and my journal was the only one that had no account of it, for I was too shaken to write it. And now I'll be too late again with a terrible murder done on my own doorstep. Uh, uh, you'd better tell us just what happened. Uh, wait a minute, I'll call my wife. She was with me. Minnie! Minnie! The police have come. Oh, God be praised. What a night we've had. I was just saying to Horace, this is what comes of staying up late. If we'd been safe in our beds, we never should have heard the commotion. Uh, Mrs. And then... Arker, Mr. Arker, may I present my friends, Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes. Uh, how, how, do do? how do you do? Sherlock Holmes? Dear me, is it as bad as all that? You see, Horace, I told you. Next thing you know, he'll be suspecting you of the murder. Now, nah, now, nah, Mother. I assure you, Mr. Harker, I am only here unofficially. Inspector Lestrade has charge of this case. Well, that's a relief anyway. Oh, well, I mean... Well, you see, Mr. Lestrade knows Horace, and that's something. I mean, well, you understand. That is... Of course. As a matter of fact, the thing that interests me most of all isn't the murder. No? No. It's the broken bust of Napoleon. Yes, that's it. It all started with that bust. I never did like the man, Napoleon, I mean. And why Horace wanted a bust of him sitting in the living room, we I'll never... We know, Mother. Uh, but perhaps I'd better tell the gentleman just what did happen. Yes, I suppose that would be a good uh, well, idea. As uh, Minnie was saying, it all seems to center around that bust of Napoleon that I bought for this very room about four months ago. Where did you purchase it, Mr. Harker? Uh, from uh, Morse Hudson's shop, Mr. Holmes, in Kennington Road. Uh-huh. Well, as you may know, gentlemen, a great deal of a journalist's work is done at night. I often write until the early morning. Just ruining his health. Now, Mother. Well, tonight I was sitting in my den, which is at the top of the house at the back. I'd almost finished my work, and Minnie was trying to get me to come to bed. Just a few minutes, Mother. I'm almost through. But here it is after twelve again. What must the neighbors think, seeing your light burning all hours of the night? What does it matter what they think? Besides, you'll ruin your eyes. Now, Mother. What is it you've got to sit up for this time? <laughs> it's a new column we're running, Mother. Advice to the Lovelorn by Gwendolyn Desmond. Advice to the Lovelorn? Well, that, that's indecent. A man writing things like that. I know, Mother, but uh, better a married man than a single man. Oh. If I don't do it, they probably get that young whis- whippersnapper Jones, and Lord only knows the things he'd think up with. What is... What's that? Burglars. I know it's burglars. Ah, nonsense, Mother. It's probably just the cat. She's knocked something off the mantelpiece. No, I'm sure it's burglars. Very well. I'll go down and see. Horace Parker, you're not going down there. Well, how else can I find out if it's the cat or burglars that made that noise? But they'll kill you. Nonsense. Give me the poker. Oh, dear, I wish you wouldn't. Now, you you, you stay here. I'll be right back. Stay here? By myself? No, sir, I'm coming too. All right, Mother, but let go my coattails. I I can't. My knees are all of a tremble. Don't go so fast, Horace. Shh. Mother, don't talk so loud. If it is burglars, you'll scare them off. That's just what I'm trying to do. Well, here we are. You see? It's just something that fell off the mantelpiece. Oh, the hand-painted bonbon dish that Aunt Susie gave us for a wedding present. Smashed to bits. (laughs) You see? Look. Horace, look. What's the matter? The window's open. And that bust of Napoleon, it's gone. What? Ah! Horace. Horace, did you hear that? Sounded like someone falling against the front door. Oh, it's horrible. 
Oh, Horace, don't go. Yeah, I've got to find out. Just a minute till I get the door open. Hello, there's something heavy pressing against it. Heaven protect us. Uh, that's it. It's a man lying on the doorstep. And his throat is slit from ear to ear. <gasps> Comfortable, is it correctly styled? Clippercraft clothes answer these questions emphatically by delivering even today in this era of high prices the most amazing values you've ever seen. You'll wonder how it's done. Well, it's the great Clippercraft plan which concentrates the buying power of 1036 stores from coast to coast and delivers to you these beautifully styled, beautifully tailored clothes, including long wearing worsteds, at a friendly local store you can trust. Fine Clippercraft suits that look much more costly are only forty and forty-five dollars. Top coats and fine coverts and worsted gabardine are only forty and forty-five dollars, and sport jackets are only twenty-six fifty. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now, suppose we return to the house of Horace Harker, where Holmes is helping Inspector Lestrade to solve a bloodthirsty murder. Did you know the murdered man, Mr. Harker? No, Mr. Holmes, I did not. They've taken the body to the mortuary. What did he look like? Tall, dark, and powerfully built. Fully dressed, but he didn't have the hands of a laborer. A horn handle and knife was lying in a pool of blood beside him. But whether it was his or whether it was the knife that did the deed, I don't know. Anything in his pockets? Uh, no card or letters of identification, if that's what you mean. Just an apple, some string, a shilling, a map of London, and a photograph. Uh, here it is. Excellent. Mm, a rather simian countenance, eh, Watson? Ugly-looking brute. And vicious, too, I should say. Yes, but look here, Holmes. What's become of the bust? Ah, the bust. Yes, of course, the bust. He wouldn't dare carry it very far. Someone might see him and identify him. Are there any empty houses around here, Mr. Harker? Uh, there's one right next door. No, that wouldn't do. Too dark. He had to have light. Dr. Barnicott's statue was found smashed in the passageway where the light from his front door illuminated it. There's uh, just one other vacant house in this block, Mr. Holmes. Uh, fifth to the right under the street light. Excellent. That must be the one. Come, Watson. Let's see what we can find. Wait a minute. I'm coming, too. Oh, very well. Oh, but you must come back, Mr. Holmes. All of you. You must be famished. Dear me, where's my sense of hospitality? I'll go and put the kettle on right away. Splendid. We'll be back before he's had a chance to come to a boil. Fifth to the right under the streetlight. That was what Harker said, wasn't it? Yes, but I must say, Holmes, I don't see what you can expect to find. It seems to me... Just that as we... I thought. Just as I thought. There's the fifth bust lying shattered in shards upon the grass. Ah. Destructive brute. I'd give a great deal to know if he found what he was looking for. What do you mean? I can't explain now, but suppose we all meet at Baker Street tomorrow night directly after dinner, and I think I can promise you an exciting evening. You're, you're on the murderer's trail? Quite. In the meantime, you, Lestrade, see if you can discover the dead man's identity while I inquire into the manufacturing of those busts and see if I can trail the ruffian in the photograph. Oh, that's right. Pick the most exciting chore for yourself. And the most dangerous. Don't forget that, Miss Strong. Watson, don't quibble. We have a long way to go, and yet we've discovered some rather significant facts tonight. Let's see. I don't see anything particularly significant. In the first place, breaking the bust was not the sole object of tonight's criminal. Well, how do you know? If it had been, he'd have broken it inside the house or immediately outside. In the second place, the possession of this trifling bust was worth more in his eyes than a human life. Yes, I think I'm beginning to understand what he was after. Well, 
Well, Lestrade, how about another cup of coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Two cups is enough for any man. I'm not the coffee addict you are. Mm, what a pity. It might stimulate the brain. Uh, now, look here, Holmes. You may think you see your way clear in this matter, but I have my own ideas. Yes? Yes. The dead man was Pietro Venucci. They knew him down at the yard, all right. He was one of the greatest cutthroats in London, a member of an Italian black hand society, too. How reprehensible. A society that punishes its offending members by death. Well, this chap in the photograph was probably a member, too. The whole thing's just one of those Italian feuds. How simple. But um, where do the busts come in? And was it just a coincidence that the murdered man was working in the shop of Morse Hudson? I don't see why the busts have to be brought into the question of the murder. Oh, but they do, Lestrade. Those busts contain the motive for the murder. Oh, that sounds like plain newness, if you ask me. No, it's really quite simple. I found this morning at Mr. Morse Hudson's shop that the murdered man had been an employee of his for the last six months, previous to which time he'd worked for the firm of Gelder and Company, the firm which molded those busts of Napoleon, which someone had been so avidly smashing. Yes, but Gelder and Company are an old firm. They must have made thousands of busts of Napoleon. Quite, but it's only the six of this particular batch with which we're concerned. I must say, I still don't see... Naturally. Well, one afternoon over a year ago, the very afternoon those six busts had come from the mold, and while they were still wet, in fact, Beppo, another employee, was chased into the workshop by the police. It seems he'd tried to knife Pietro in a street brawl. Beppo? But who was Beppo? Oh, didn't I tell you? No. Hear me how absent-minded of me. Beppo was the man in the photograph. The man he tried to knife that day, as you know, is the same fellow found dead on Harker's doorstep last night. You see, I told you it was a feud. The most curious part of the incident is that Beppo was holding something very carefully in his hand when he ran into the workroom. And yet, when the police overtook him, they discovered nothing of any interest on him. Beppo was taken off to prison, of course, and was released two weeks ago. The day before the first two busts were smashed. Yes, but Holmes, look here. You said there were six busts in that particular batch. So far, only five have been smashed. Where's the other one? The sales book of Mr. Morse Hudson shows that it was sold over a month ago to Mr. Joseph Brown of Laburnum Lodge, Chiswick. And now, suppose we pay that worthy gentleman a visit. If luck's with us, it should be an interesting evening. Yes, but Holmes, isn't it a bit late to go calling? Uh, perhaps Mr. Brown's gone to bed. I hope so, Watson. I sincerely hope so. <laughs> Holmes is going to storm any minute. Can't we come back some other time? No, Watson. The gentleman we're after is not to be put off by a little unpleasant weather. He must finish his quest as soon as possible. He doesn't dare delay for fear the police will be on his trail. I only hope he hasn't been successful already. Here we are. This gate says Laburnum Lodge. This is the house. No lights. Mr. Brown has gone to bed. I knew it. Good. We won't rouse him. Suppose we confine ourselves to an inspection of his shrubbery. Yes, but look here, I... Shh. Someone's coming along the road. Quick, get behind this hedge. But I believe... Shh. Yes, he's opened the gate. He's coming in here. Possibly Mr. Brown coming home from the lodge meeting. No, Mr. Brown's probably accustomed to using the front door. You're right. He's trying to get in a window. By Jove, it's a burglar. And a very expert one, too. He broke the lock like a veteran. He's going in. Hadn't we better follow him? No. We'll get him on his way out after he's found what he's after. That storm's going to break any minute now. Here he comes. He's got something white under his arm. Get ready. Allow me to present Beppo, one of Italy's master criminals. So you did want the sixth Napoleon, eh? Don't want to talk? Very well. Oh, this is the man who committed last night's murder, eh? Yes, this is the murderer and the bust smasher. Well, now that you've got the sixth Napoleon, what are you going to do with it? Lend me your top coat and I'll show you. Uh, oh, very well. Oh, but first come over to the street light. Come along, you. You know what's good for you. Come along. No, no, fatto nulla. Non so niente. 
Now, first, I wrap the bust in Watson's coat so we won't lose any of the splinters. Then I follow Beppo's procedure and smash it against the lamppost. So... Oh, oh, dear, that's my best top coat. You'll ruin it. Now, look at it. we spread the coat on the ground and look among the fragments. Safamente. No, benedizione no, la perla è mia. La perla nera è mia, è mia, è mia. Our friend Beppo seems to be rather excited. Davila. Keep him at a distance for a start. I don't want him to no, do any no. snatching. Stand back no, now, you. Come along. Now. Now, let me see. No. No. Yes, by Joe, here it is. Oh, shut up, What? Why is it's a tremendous black pearl. Yes, black Watson. Pearl. The famous black pearl of the Borgia, stolen from a museum in Florence two years ago. Devilishly beautiful, isn't it? Well, that was an exciting discovery, Dr. Watson. But look, there are one or two points I don't understand. How did Pietro figure in the story? Why did they quarrel? How did the pearl get into the bust of Napoleon? That pearl had been stolen by Beppo and Pietro. They quarreled and Beppo tried to kill the other chap. He had the pearl in his hand when the police broke up their fight. He ran into the workroom and buried the pearl in one of the soft busts of Napoleon standing on the workroom table. From that time, the feud was on. The Strad was right there. Each one was determined to get the pearl. Pietro didn't know where the pearl was hidden and Beppo was in jail, so... The odds were fairly even until Beppo got out. Pietro knew his only chance was to shadow Beppo, which he did, and met his death. And that disposed of both of them very neatly. And now, Dr. Watson, do you think you'd like to give us an idea about next week's story? I think I could be persuaded, Mr. Harris. I think I could <laughs> be persuaded. And let me see. Uh, next week, I think I'll take you down to the Port of London, where... Holmes and I discovered a fantastic East Indian temple among the wharves and warehouses. There, in front of a hideous idol, we ran into our old friend, Professor Moriarty. I call it the adventure of the serpent god. <laughs> My hair, what's still left of it, stands on end when I remember it. The makers of Clipper Craft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Adventure of the Serpent God. <laughs> Guy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and digital broadcasting systems. From New York City, the makers of Clippercraft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. story, The Adventure of the Serpent God. And so here we are once again in Dr. Watson's cheerful book line study. But let's not keep our Sherlock Holmes fans waiting. What's tonight's adventure to be, Doctor? Tonight I think I'll tell you how Holmes prevented a bloodthirsty Hindu uprising. It all occurred because we unearthed the meeting place of an East Indian cult who worshipped the Serpent God. Hmm, sounds promising. Yes, it was a weird and unearthly sitting for one of our most hair-raising encounters with that arch-criminal, 
the notorious Professor Moriarty. Ah, Professor Moriarty. Sherlock Holmes always got a run for his money when he matched wits with Professor Moriarty. And that reminds me, if any of our friends and listeners are thinking of investing in a new spring suit or overcoat, I think we can safely promise them more than a run for their money if they'll take a look at the clothes that Clippercraft is now showing in their favorite local store. Right you are, Mr. Harris. And you know, you'll get something else very important from the great Clippercraft plan besides remarkable quality and downright sensational value. You get uniformity. The assurance that every Clippercraft suit, top coat, or sport jacket you buy is equal to all the others in smart appearance and performance. As you know, the Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Its operation is year round, resulting in tremendous economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. And that's how you get fine fitting, beautifully tailored, Expensive looking Clippercraft suits for only forty and forty five dollars. Outstanding top coats in fine coverts and worsted gabardine for only forty and forty five dollars, and smart sport jackets for only twenty six fifty. Take a look around. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Now, Dr. Watson, back to Professor Moriarty and the adventure of the Serpent God. Mm, yes, Mr. Harris. It was latish one May evening in the early 1900s. I had been out on an emergency case and was returning in the soft spring twilight. As I reached 221B Baker Street, I looked up to see a light in the windows of our sitting room. Holmes' long, lank silhouette was pacing back and forth in the lamplight. From the nervous vitality of his movements, I gathered he was working on a new case. I let myself in the front door and bounded up the steps. <clears throat> uh, you what, Doctor? <clears throat> well, I, I hurried upstairs. Uh, evening, Holmes. What's up? A case, Watson. I'm expecting word from our latest client. Now, don't remove your hat and gloves. From his note, I gather he'll want us to go to him at once. Oh, then it's urgent. I suspect it's more than urgent, Watson. The stability of the Empire may well depend on our efforts tonight. Oh, now, really, ho. Oh. I'm not exaggerating, Watson. I leave that to you. However, I don't think anyone will underrate the unrest that's seething in India these days. The slightest spark may set off an explosion. Well, granted, but how does that affect us? As a matter of fact, my friend Hockey, you remember young Wells Hockrider of the Foreign Office? Oh, naturally. He's the one who always looked as if he'd just swallowed his monocle. Don't let that air of fatuous imbecility fool you, Watson. Hiding behind that simple facade is one of the most alert brains in England. Not counting my own, of course. Oh, conceit. That's why he's been assigned to the Maharaja. Well, he'll have his hands full. Those East Indian potentates are a slippery lot. I wouldn't trust one around a corner with my second best stethoscope. Prejudice, Watson. Pure prejudice. I met this one several years ago at the Royal Garden Party. Rather decent sort. We've corresponded ever since. Holmes, you're wonderful. You know everything and everybody. Tell me about your Rajo. Which one is he? He's the Maharaja of Banjoram, a small, warlike mountain kingdom in the north of India. Sounds vaguely familiar. Well, you've undoubtedly heard of the Banjoram stables. The Maharaja is interested in racehorses and higher education. He leads a rather quiet life in his villa outside of Paris, where the famous professors from the Sorbonne come to give him advanced lectures in private. Sounds placid enough. Quite. His life, I may say, was completely serene and uninteresting until his heir came to visit him. Well, nothing abnormal about that. Sons frequently upset the even tenor of their father's ways. No, but Prince Jinnah is not the Maharaja's son. He's his half-brother. Different mothers and all that, you know. No. It wasn't until it became apparent that the Maharaja would never have a son of his own that anyone took any interest in this boy at all. I don't believe the Maharaja had even met him until he sent for him last autumn. He suddenly decided it was high time the land became exposed to a British education. Oh, poor devil. Imagine being suddenly chucked into the midst of an English public school after being pampered darling of a high-caste Indian household. The Maharaja of Banjoram has some sense, Watson. He did not chuck him into a school, as you so inelegantly express it. He decided to break the boy in with a good tutor. Upon explaining his position to the Foreign Office... They decided the situation was sufficiently important to assign young Wells Harkrider to the post. Hmm. As the twig is bent. Exactly. The Maharaja of Banjoram has always been quite well disposed toward our government. Unfortunately, that's more than can be said for some of the gentlemen who have managed to ease their way into high positions in his country. How did the Maharaja and his young half-brother get along? Very well indeed. That is, until three weeks ago. 
when Hawk Rider and the young prince had their first encounter with the dark-faced man with burning eyes. It was shortly after tea time. Harky and the prince were just emerging from the strand entrance of the Savoy Hotel, where they had a suite of rooms. Suddenly, a strange, ragged-looking man seized the prince and pressed his forehead to the back of the boy's hand. Salutations, O true son of the father of all lizards. You followers await you. For you the god will speak. Do not fail him. Do not fail. Who is that man, Gina? I do not know, Mr. Harkrider. But you saw his eyes and his head. It moved from side to side like a great snake. What? What's the matter, boy? You're trembling. Your hands are as cold as ice. Your, your hand. What is that mark on the back of your hand? I. It is the sign. Ever since then, Watson, the boy's been a nervous wreck. Mark Ryder says he looks positively haunted. Then, the night after the boy's encounter with a strange derelict, Hark Rider woke in the night and found him missing from his bed. Why not ask for police protection? The Maharaja forbids it. Hark Rider drew him the design he'd seen on the back of the boy's hand. The Maharaja apparently recognized its significance, but will tell Hark Rider nothing. He says calling in the British authorities might very well cause another black hole of Calcutta. Good Lord, Holmes, then it is serious. That, my dear Watson, is the impression I've been trying to convey for the last half hour. Did the Hark Rider's message explain what the symbol on the boy's hand looked like? Yes. It's drawn here at the bottom of his letter. Hmm. A simple bit of cocography. Looks rather like the eye part of the large hook and eye. It's not as innocent as that, Watson. It's the same mark that appears on the hood of the King Cobra. In India, that's the symbol of the serpent god. By Jove, I see what you mean, Holmes. Then you think the boy may be mixed up in some diabolical East Indian cult. I fancy the mystery is even uglier than that. You remember the description of the beggar who left the symbol on the boy's hand? Mm -hmm. The burning eyes, the head that oscillated slowly from side to side. Good heavens, that could be a description of Professor Moriarty. Oh, but you said uh, his skin was dark. <laughs> there are many stains, Watson, that can be used to color a man's skin. But why have they waited till now to call you in on the case? What makes you think Hark Rider will be around tonight? This little figurine. Beautifully carved, isn't it? Well, oh, what a fascinating bit of ugliness. The body of a man and the head of a cobra. The cobra god again. It seems this carving was found on Prince Gina's bed when he returned from his afternoon's walk. Hark Rider said the boy fainted dead away when he saw it. Sounds sinister, eh, Holmes? Hark Rider told the Maharaja about the occurrence, of course. The Maharaja seems to think this figure is some sort of summons. He believes the boy will try to disappear again tonight. Consequently, Hark Rider's sending a cab for us as soon as the boy retires. We're to pick him up at the embankment exit of the Savoy. Yes, I, I hear a carriage driving up to our curb. Don't forget your revolver, Watson. Mm. Aha! The game's afoot. The chase begins. Holmes, we've been sitting out here in this blasted cab for over an hour. What's happened to Hark Rider? What if the boy slipped out to the other, uh, the other entrance? Calm yourself, Watson. Hark Rider's stationed behind some potted palms in the lobby inside where he can watch both doors. And what if the boy decides to stay quietly in his little bed? I say, Holmes, that's the third time that policeman has flashed his lantern at us. First thing you know, he'll be asking some embarrassing questions. Well, don't answer them. Just pretend we're gentlemen in from the country who've had a bit of a celebration and are sitting in the cab because we like horses. Oh, Holmes, you're the most angry. Hello. There's a slight figure coming through the doorway now. Yes, it must be the young prince. He's hailing a cab. Get ready, driver. There goes his cab, Holmes. But well, what are we waiting for? For hockey, confound him. Here he comes on the run. Open the door, Watson. We'll pick him up as we go. Follow that cab driver. There's a fiver in it for you if you don't let him out of your sight. Oh, 
found this fog. It's getting so thick we can't see the cab up ahead. Calm yourself, Hawk Rider. They can't go any faster than we can. As long as we can hear their horses' hooves, they can't get away from us. We must be near the river, Holmes. Hear those fog horns? Yes, we've just passed London docks, to be exact, my dear Watson. How do you know? Don't tell me you can see any further through this piece super than I can. Possibly not, Watson, but I can smell. The warehouses here contain the most varied and fascinating cargoes in the whole port. Wines, hides, rubber, drugs, iodine, coffee, spices, cocoa, quicksilver. To mention just a handful. And on our left, we should be approaching whopping old stairs. If you listen carefully, you can hear the lapping of the water. Not with that thing blatting away, you can't. I say, what do you suppose that boy is headed for in this district? Has it ever occurred to you, Harkrider, how many Laskers and Hindus are employed in the docks in this part of London? Oh, funny, I'd forgotten that. As a matter of fact, I'd almost forgotten London had a port. Most Londoners do. Ask the average Englishman what's the largest port in the United Kingdom, and chances are he'll answer Liverpool or Plymouth or Southampton. Well, aren't they? My dear Watson, the exports and imports of the Port of London more than equal in value any two of them combined. What's up? We're stopping. Well, we're going on. We've turned into Tunnel Pier Road. Well, how can you tell that? By the rumbling of the trains going through the tunnel. I can't hear a blasted thing. Neither can I, but I can feel them. So could you if your senses were properly developed. Yes, near here used to be the site of Execution Dock, where Captain Kidd and other pirates were hanged in chains at low water and left for three times. Holmes, if you must give us a cook's tour of the district, couldn't you pick some cheerful items to lecture about? The carriage ahead stopped. Wait here, driver. Out you go, Watson. Mm -hmm. You too, Hawk Rider. Right ho. Yes. There's the boy up ahead. He's feeling his way along the wall. He stopped. He is tapping out some kind of signal on the wall. By Jove. I see the wall is opening. I saw no sign of a doorway. Now it's closing after him. But it works mechanically. What, Watson? Don't let it shut. It's our one chance to follow the boy. Stick your foot in the crack. Hurry! Oh! Ooh. Now what? Oh, I did as you told me. The blasted door's yes. killing me. Hark, Rider. Take the cab and go back to the Savoy and get the Maharaja of Banjorum. Bring him here. Shall I fetch a platoon of police as well, just in case? I don't imagine he'll let you. Here. Make a mark on the wall so you can find the door again. Done. Now then, Watson, slip inside the door. Right. Quick, before the guard finds it's not closed. Hurry back, Hawk Rider. Chin up, Holmes. Be back in a jiffy. Seems to be some sort of courtyard with carved walls. Weird, grotesque carvings. Holmes, they look horrible in the light of that flickering lantern up ahead. Those carvings represent East Indian deities. As you say, Watson, they are not nice. Look, Holmes. A tall man in a fierce beard and wearing a turban has stepped into the light of the lantern. Yes. He'll be a Sikh. A very warlike tribe, Watson. I imagine he's on sentry duty. There must be an entrance through that archway. But what of it? We'll never get by him. I only hope he doesn't discover us. Right. I don't think he'd hesitate to use that large knife he has sticking in his belt. I say, what's that? Another customer's arrived at the door in the wall, I imagine. Yes. Here comes a sentry to let him in. But what can we do? He'll find us. No, there's an empty niche above our heads. Step on my hands, Watson. Right. Here go. Uh, now, give me your hand. Heave ho! Uh, but won't he see us up here? I don't think so. It's a well-established fact that a man seldom looks above his head. Yes. Here he comes. Pretend to be a statue. Huh? Look grotesque. It shouldn't be too difficult. Phew. He's gone on by. I didn't dare breathe. Here's our chance to find out what's beyond the archway. Quick. We'll have to run for it while he's still busy at the outer door. <laughs> And so, while our two friends are trying to sneak past the guard, let's discuss your spring wardrobe. Will it be comfortable? Will it wear? Is it good-looking? 
Well, naturally, these questions are on your mind when you buy a new suit or top coat. The same questions Clippercraft asked themselves long ago and answered by bringing you the finest values you've ever seen at an outstanding local independent store. Clippercraft invented the unique Clippercraft plan that concentrates the buying power of 1036 stores across the nation. Now, the plan's the reason for those amazing values which are yours, even in this era of high prices. Clippercraft suits that look much more costly for only 40 and 45 dollars. Top coats and fine coverts and worsted gabardine at only 40 and 45 dollars, and sport jackets at only 2650. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th, and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, who have managed to sneak inside the unguarded doorway. Holmes, it's a great heathen temple in the heart of London. The incense is almost as thick as the fog outside. There must be hundreds of people in here, all bowing before that horrible idol. More than horrible, Watson. It's the serpent god, servant of Shiva, the destroyer. Now what? I don't know. Here, hide behind this wall curtain. Holmes... Here comes the priest or magician or whatever they call him. He's even uglier than the statue of the god. That is the guru, Watson. It's a mask he's wearing. Aha! Notice how his head moves from side to side. We shall soon know, Watson. We shall soon know. Look. There's the boy. He's approaching the priest. Holmes, what's wrong with him? He... He walks as if he'd been hypnotized. Quiet, Watson. The guru is going to speak. Son of sons, you've done well to come. I speak for the great one, our lord of the cobras. I say to you that you are doomed. That's Mariotti's voice right enough. Your youth will fade. Your limbs wither. Your mind shrivel and decay and your soul be damned to eternal torment unless you heed my words. Heed and obey. You are to kill. No, no. It is so decreed. Tonight you shall hear what you must do from the great one himself. You are honored above all men. The Lord of Serpents will speak to you. Bow down and listen. Holmes. He's going to make the idol talk. Jinnah is chosen. But first the throne must be purified. He will kill the Maharaja, his brother, and rule in his place. The temples of the god have been profaned. They can be cleansed only with blood. Rivers of blood, the blood of all white people who live in Banjora. Holmes, this is outrageous. How do they make the idols say such horrible things? It's Moriarty. When he bows to the ground, he puts his mouth to a sort of grill work. Unless I'm very much mistaken, it hides a speaking tube. But what does he expect to gain by all this hocus-pocus? Quiet, Watson. He's getting ready to speak again in his own voice. When you are on the throne, O son of the serpent, you will need advice and wise counsel. The god of the cobras has spoken to me in the night. He has appointed me to be your advisor. Ah, now we come to the point of the argument. Holmes, we must warn the Maharaja. We can't leave now, Watson. We shall have to wait until everyone else is gone. (laughs) 
What's that for? Now let the music call the great ones. The cobras, let them come from their hiding places. They shall dance for their new king. Holmes, they have cobras, live cobras in this place. Look, they're coming out of those little windows along the wall near the floor. How perfectly vile. Look at them writhing and swaying to the music. Steady, Watson, steady. Holmes, we are standing in front of one of those little windows. There's something crawling over my foot. Can't touch the silver move. It's turned. It's raising its head. It's your nerve, Watson. Got it! Sorry to split their head off. Who's there? That are spies! Behind that curtain, capture them! We're in for it this time, Watson. Give me your revolver. I'll stand them off as long as possible. Holmes, where are you? Over here, Watson. Tied, hand and foot. It's black as pitch in here. If only Harkrider would get back, he might be able to help us. Seems as if he's been gone for hours. Holmes, you don't suppose he's lost his way in the fog? That, my dear Watson, is an unfortunate possibility. Ah, seems we're about to have a visitor, Watson. We meet for the last time, Sherlock Holmes. Once more you have been foolish enough to meddle in my plans. This time, I think, will be the last. <laughs> Such a pity, Moriarty. You're going to miss our little passages at arms. Possibly, but you have made too great a nuisance of yourself lately, my dear adversary. In a very little while, I shall leave you and take my place again before the image of the serpent god, which is just above this little room. Then four slaves will come. They will carry you before the altar for the final rites. It will soon be over. First, Dr. Watson shall be sacrificed to the image... You shall watch him die, Holmes, and then... You devil, you inhuman fiend, you... <laughs> you do not approve my plans. So sorry. Listen. Here come the men to carry you to the temple. First, the fat one. Place him on the ground. Now, now bring the box of cobras. It's all my fault, Holmes. Chin up, Watson. Holmes! Holmes! Something's happening to the door. They're breaking it down. Where are the guards? Who dares to enter here? Give way, you fool. Give way for his highness, the Maharaja. Holmes is Hawk Rider and the old boy himself. Even the Maharaja does not dare interfere with the servants of the serpent god. You are wrong, oh father of unclean lizards. If you were a real serpent of your cobra gods, you'd know that I am the earthly arm, the voice and the will of the god who rules your gods, the most terrible of all. See here his ring on my hand. I am the earthly representative of Shiva, the destroyer. Oh. Get up from your faces, you fools. Release those two men. And seize this other, who is no holy man of India. Seize her his skin while I tear away his garment. Oh, he is a white man and a criminal. You think I have no way of escape? Then what? Moriarty, he's gone. He had a secret door in the base of the idol. After him, all of you. I say... Do you think they'll catch him? Oh, possibly not, but I must say I'm tremendously grateful that you've shown the faker up and demonstrated to Jinnah here how easily one can be led astray by superstition and ignorance. But enough of that. Park Rider, get out your pocket knife and help me to free our friend. Right ho. <laughs> you have to forgive me, Watson, old boy, but trussed up like that, you remind me of that night of our first year at school when the boys in the upper form decided to have a bit of a rag. Good <laughs> Lord, you're not... But of course you are. Hmm. Banjo. <laughs> Dear old Banjo. Well, I, I mean your highness. Oh, not to my friends, Johnny. Tell me, uh, Banjorum, are you really the arm of Shiva and all that sort of thing? Or, 
Or was that just plain swank? Not at all, my dear Watson. In His Highness's kingdom in India, his people are convinced he's partially supernatural. Oh, it's rather tedious, you know, and quite frequently lonely. That's why I sent for this young scallywag to come and visit me. Come along now, Jenner. There's no need to be frightened now, you know. Oh, I was not going to kill you, sir. No matter what they did to me. Really, I wasn't. Of course you weren't. Come along home. It's way past your bedtime. That's right. Pleasant dreams, Prince Jenner. I fancy it'll be the first good night's sleep you've had for some time. It will indeed, sir. I've been under a bit of a strain, but it was worth it to meet the famous Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Wow, that was a narrow squeak, Dr. Watson. My, my hair fairly stood on end. Good for you, Mr. Harris. Uh, glad I held your interest. You did that. And now, how about just a hint about next week's story, Dr. Watson? Next week, I think I'll tell how I learned a great deal about the ancient sport of archery. In it, Holmes solved a murder in which the weapon was a rather unusual golden arrow. He solved it, I may say, by catching the murderer literally red-handed. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes... And 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockren, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Once again, it's your privilege to aid in the increasing fight against suffering, disease, and disaster. Once again, your American Red Cross confidently appeals to American generosity to support its humane work. This year, then, give a little more, because the need is greater. Be sure to listen next Sunday to Sherlock Holmes in Death is a Golden Arrow. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's adventure, Death is a Golden Arrow. And so here we are, as usual, in front of Dr. Watson's cheerful fireplace. There's a hint of spring in the softness of the air, but a fire still feels mighty comfortable after sundown, eh, Dr. Watson? Right, Mr. Harris. It's rather like a man who wants to show off his new spring suit, uh, but still hasn't managed to do without his overcoat. <laughs> well, if they're both clipper crap. Chances are one is as impressive as the other, Dr. Watson. Right you are. And next Sunday is Easter. And because Clippercraft prices are so low, this week's a good time to buy your Clippercraft suit and topcoat. These low prices, you know, are the result of the unique Clippercraft plan that concentrates the buying power of 1,036 of the finest stores across the nation. It's a year-round operation that results in substantial economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. It puts money in your pocket even in these days of high prices, through the tremendous savings that result. And this is important, too. At a friendly local independent store, a store you can trust. Fresh new assortments of spring Clipper Craft clothes, including long-wearing worsteds, are ready now at your Clipper Craft dealers. Beautifully tailored, finely styled, expensive-looking suits at only $40 and $45. 
top coats in fine coverts and worsted gabardine at only forty and forty-five dollars, and sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. Seeing is believing. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, what about tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure? Mm, yes, it concerns the weekend Holmes and I spent at Bowman's Knock among the Toxophilites. Uh, the, uh, what Olites? Toxophilites, Mr. Harris, are gentlemen addicted to the not-so-gentle sport of archery. Oh, you mean the boys who play around with bows and arrows. <laughs> I suppose you might express it that way. Bowman's Knock was the country home of Sir Timothy Fletcher, who was at that time president of the Royal Toxophilite Society. The Prince of Wales, of course, was its patron. Oh, naturally. However, he wasn't present at this particular house party. Besides Holmes and myself, there were only four other guests. Major and Mrs. Cheltenham, Professor Phil Potts, and a South American millionaire, Senor Juan Rendrigo. Oh, little did I think when I first made their acquaintance on Sir Timothy's shooting green that before the next sunrise I should see one of them... Dead as a doornail. Oh, it sounds as if your taxophy, whatever you call them, took their sport seriously, Dr. Watson. <laughs> yes, a bit too seriously, Mr. Harris. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon in early spring when Holmes and I alighted from our train at Helmsley on Wilton, which is the station for Bowman's Knock. Sir Timothy Fletcher had come to meet us in a dog cart drawn by a handsome cob. Uh, Doctor, I thought a cob was a male swan. In sporting circles, Mr. Harris, a cob generally refers to a small, stocky horse having a high, stylish leg action. Well, then, a dog cart is, is not drawn by dogs. Certainly not. A dog cart's a very, well, um, uh, as you'd say, a snappy two-wheel conveyance with seats placed back to back. Mm, doesn't sound particularly comfortable to me. Oh, this mechanized age. It wasn't supposed to be comfortable. It was dashing. Oh. Well, as I was saying before being certain uh, interruptions, uh... Our host piled us and our somewhat battered assortment of luggage into the cart, and off we started. The birds were singing, the sun was warm and gentle, the trees were covered with tender green foliage. Only Sir Timothy seemed at odds with nature. Found it, Holmes. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. There's something brewing, something nasty. We might have known, Watson, that Sir Timothy hadn't invited us merely for a bucolic weekend. Holmes, you know dashed well. If you had nothing but the ordinary country house party to look forward to, you wouldn't have accepted my invitation. Got you that time, Holmes. Yes, I gathered from your notes, Sir Timothy, that things don't seem to be entirely placid at Bowman's Knock. Seems to be the difficulty. It's uh, that confounded Spaniard, Juan Vendrigo. We should never have invited that bloated millionaire to join the Royal Toxophilite Society. Why did you? We needed new equipment. It's expensive, and he's filthy rich and a dash good shot besides him. Blast him. However, he insists on shooting for high sticks, worse luck. We're all heavily indebted to him. Well, sounds to me as if it had been cheaper to buy your own equipment in the first place. Uh, it undoubtedly would, Dr. Watson. Oh, most of us haven't lost more than we can afford, I suppose, but unfortunately, Major Cheltenham has gone off the deep end. He's the crack shot of the woodman of Arden. Oh, I see. A rival society of archers. Exactly. He'd never been beaten until Senor Vendrigo came along. They're uh, fairly evenly matched. Vendrigo has better direction, although the Major has more pull than this. Well, it seems that last Monday, Senor Vendrigo went down to Meriden, where the woodmen hold their meetings. In the course of an afternoon shooting, Major Cheltenham managed to lose a large sum of money, which he could ill afford. And I suppose he insisted on a return match. He did, the numbskull. Senor Vendrigo invited him to a return match at our shooting grounds, which, as you know, are situated in Regent's Park. Mm. Professor Phil Potts was invited to keep score. Oh, you don't mean Professor Winsgate Phil Potts, the eminent physicist? I do indeed. He's an exceptionally fine shot. His aim is practically infallible. If it went for the poor fellow's hunched back and his consequent inability to draw to a point over 38 pounds, well... He'd be the greatest archer in Europe. Oh, here, here. You must uh, forgive Watson if he looks slightly confused, Sir Timothy. His trusty service revolver is the only lethal weapon he understands. And you, I suppose, know what Sir Timothy is talking about. Hmm? Quite. The power to draw an arrow to the point means the measure of pull necessary to draw the bowstring to the position from which the arrow is released is measured in pounds. The power required to draw an ordinary bow for a man ranges from 40 to 60 pounds. 
Women's bows, of course, can be drawn by a powder from 24 to 32 pounds. Oh, that means, I suppose, that the ladies can't shoot as great a distance as the men. Brilliant deduction, my dear Watson. You're coming along. Pretty soon I shall have to look to my laurels. Oh, go to blazes. As I was saying, Professor Philpotts was chosen as scorer for the match. As a president of the club, I was naturally on hand to see that everything went off without a hitch. These uh, grudge matches are often quite tricky, you know. Grudge match? Oh, yes. Didn't I mention that Senor Vendrigo had been rather obviously attentive to Mrs. Cheltenham? And the Major doesn't like it. Hmm. Interesting, eh, Watson? Uh, that rather depends upon Mrs. Cheltenham, I should say. <laughs> She's a charming little thing. I can't say I blame her for being flattered by the Senor. Her husband treats her abominably. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. It was agreed that the match should consist of a York round. Yes, for gentlemen, Watson, the York round consists of six dozen arrows at 100 yards, four dozen at 80 yards, and two dozen at 50 yards. By Jove, and each time the would-be Robin Hood shoots his silly little arrow, he has to use from 40 to 50 pounds pressure. I say that's quite a bit of exercise. Contrary to the common belief, Watson, archery is a rather rugged sport. But uh, go on with the story, Sir Timothy. It was a glorious afternoon for the match. Sun not too bright, the air as still as a mill pot. Phil Potts and I were arranging the arrows close to the south hedge, when suddenly from the other side of the bushes we heard two voices raised in a rather, well, nasty argument. My advice to you, my dear Major, is to, uh, what you say, cut down on the consumption of alcohol, or you will not be able to see the target let alone hit the goal. Mind your own business, you dirty... Gently, little... Major, gently. Do not make me to lose my temper, or I shall refuse to shoot the match. Go ahead. What's it to me? Only this. If you do not win back what you have lost to me, you must pay what you already owe. But that you cannot do. You would have to go into bankruptcy. And if you go into bankruptcy, you will be obliged to resign from the army in disgrace. No. Why, you dirty yellow... You have a... said that once already. To me, the repetition is offensive. It is only from the goodness of my heart, remember, that I give you the opportunity to win back your losses. What can I gain from the match? What do you mean? You have no money to wager. You have already lost that. You have no property you can mortgage. There is only one thing that still belongs to you of any value whatsoever. What's that? Your charming wife, of course. Leave my wife out of this. Oh, do not be alarmed, my dear Major. I do not wish to marry the lady. In my country, we do not believe in divorce. No, we will make other arrangements. What are you getting at? I suggest, uh, merely suggest, mind you, that should you lose the match... Which isn't likely. There's no wind today. I never miss when it's still. I say, should you lose, you will arrange to neglect your wife Sometime this weekend, when we are all guests at Bowman's Knock. Do you think I'd stand by and see any man make advances to my wife? Oh, heaven forbid. I merely suggest I shall, uh, shall we say, visit Mrs. Cheltenham? Uh, surely, if you have confidence in your wife and your ability as an archer, what can you possibly lose? <laughs> Outrageous, say Holmes. Of course, I suppose the Major refused to go on with the match. How could he, Watson? I had a good mind to call off the match myself, Mr. Holmes, until Professor Philpotts pointed out that if we took any cognizance of the matter, everyone would know we'd been eavesdropping, which would have been embarrassing all around, don't you know? Very. Moreover, the Major and Senor Vendrigo would have probably gone off and shot the match somewhere else without proper supervision. Unthinkable. What happened? The match was nip and tuck all the way. The Senor Vendrigo had a slight advantage at the beginning. Uh, do you know that the Major's use of spiritous liquors? Quite, but by and by, as he became more sober, his aim became absolutely deadly. Moreover, as the afternoon wore on, Senor Vendrigo began to tire. And the Major didn't? The Major, my dear Holmes, is an ox. Well, believe it or not, when it came to the final shot, the score was absolutely even. Vendrigo shot first and hit the gold. The gold? That's a bullseye, Watson. Uh. Did the Major equal the shot? Uh, they were now shooting at 50 yards. It shouldn't have been too difficult. 
I, I, I tell you, my heart was in my mouth, and I could see the sweat pouring down Pilpot's face. But just as the Major drew his arrow home, Senor Vendrigo sneezed. Dashed unsporting. Well, of course, the arrow went wide of the mark. No, Dr. Watson. If it had done so, I should have insisted the Major take the shot over. Had he hit a red? Vendrigo claimed the Major had already released the arrow when he sneezed. Otherwise, the shot must have gone much wider off the mark. No. No, we were obliged to give Vendrigo the match. He won by a single point. Under doubtful circumstances. Is the Major a man to take things lying down? Why do you think I asked you down to Bowman's knock, Mr. Holmes? I'm expecting an explosion. And I think I can promise... It won't be nice. Suppose we alight here, gentlemen, and let the gatekeeper drive the luggage up to the house. Here you are, Rogers. Yes, sir. Uh, tell Parsons the bags go in the tower bedroom. Yes, sir. Get up, you but. Now then, we'll walk across the park, Holmes. I want you and Dr. Watson to meet the rest of the house party. I left them clout shooting on the South Green. Clout? What sort of bird or animal is a clout? It's neither, Watson. A clout is a small white target placed near the ground. Right. Clout shooting is an informal variety of archery. Don't hold with it myself. But it gives Major Cheltenham a chance to show off his confounded Norman bow. It's an atrocity, if you ask me. Nearly six and a half feet long. And would you believe it, it takes over 70 pounds to draw the silly thing? It's been in the Cheltenham family for years. The Major claims it goes back to the Norman invasion and probably belonged to William the Conqueror. Yes, I believe he was supposed to have had a bow that no one else could draw. Well, it couldn't be the same bow, Holmes, not after all these years. Quite. Don't, I beg you, don't say that to the Major. It would be sacrilege. Tell me, Sir Timothy. How is your party getting on? Any signs of violence so far? None whatever. They arrived in a group by the early morning train. Apparently, the trip down had been completely amicable. Well, maybe the storm has blown over. I doubt it. The Major's neck is puffed up like a poisoned pup, and Senor Vendrigo keeps tapping incessantly with the fingers of his left hand. Both, I take it, danger signals. Right. They're nearly there. Just around the next hedge. Ah! Duck, Watson. But I say... <laughs> oh, confounded! Someone shot my hat off. Look, there, there it is, an arrow straight through it. <laughs> Lucky you were wearing your top hat, Watson. Fast is a call of warning. The golfer shouts four, the archer calls fast. Confound it, no one had any business to shoot in this direction. What silly... Oh, pool. dear. Oh, dear, I do hope no one's hurt. I tried to stop the Major, but I, I'm afraid he's been drinking again. <laughs> and like a small boy with a snowball, he just couldn't resist a top hat. <laughs> Holmes, that's not very funny. I might have been killed. Oh, no. No, I don't think so. My husband is really an excellent shot. Then you, I gather, are Mrs. Cheltenham. Oh, yes. oh, sorry. Where are my manners? Mrs. Cheltenham, may I present Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson? Uh, how do you do? Oh, not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I'm afraid so, Mrs. Cheltenham. But it's nothing to be alarmed about, madam. He's really quite harmless, you know. To anyone who stays on the right side of the law. Ah, here come the others. Good Lord. I made a hash of your hat, old man. Sorry. Yes. But you'll admit it did fly through the air like an eagle. <laughs> a golden eagle. <laughs> At least this time it is not the Latin exuberance which is to blame, Sir Timothy. No uh, British lack of judgment, I'm afraid. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, Major Cheltenham, Senor Vendrigo. How do and, you do? Uh, oh, oh, yes, uh, Professor Philpott. As usual, I am the postscript. Which uh, so frequently carries the gist of the communication, Professor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. My ego could do with a bit of bolstering. Uh, these two have been putting it over me all afternoon. I can't hope to equal their archery scores, you know. Why don't you give up, Phil Potts, and oh. uh, shoot with the women? Arthur. Major, really? Oh, do not feel badly, Professor. Even I cannot draw that great hulking bow he so brags about. Uh. It is fit for nothing but to kill cows. That's about enough. Oh, Shatha, please. Huh? Oh, well. I can't blame you chaps for being jealous, I suppose. Here, have a look at this bow, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Ever seen its equal? Hmm, it is rather remarkable, Major Cheltenham. I've certainly never seen a self-bow this size. Yes, it consists of a single piece of you, as flexible as the day it was made. Uh, if you have the strength to draw it, of course. Which you apparently have, Major. That's right, I have. What's more, I'm the only one that has. Oh, but uh, here, 
I'd best retrieve my arrow out of the doctor's hat. Here, I say, you've torn my hat to shreds. I'm you... sorry, but uh, these arrows are valuable, you know. Can't use ordinary arrows with this bow. As you can see, these arrows are painted gold. The shaft is extra long and tipped with eagle feathers, and the cock feather is from a golden eagle. Oh, well, we best return to our mutton, Vendrigo, or we shall never finish our round by tea time. Absolutely. It gives me not much time to prove, my dear Major, that there is more to archery than brute strength. Come along, Phil Fox. At least you can keep accurate score. Holmes, I don't like those people. Not even Mrs. Cheltenham and the Professor? Oh, I dare say they're harmless enough. I wonder, Watson. I wonder... want to do a friend a real favor, simply tell him to hurry to the store in your community that sells clipper craft clothes. Where else can he find such remarkable quality at prices so exceptionally modest? He'll wonder how in these days of high prices such values, including beautifully tailored, long-wearing worsteds, are possible. The answer is the famous clipper craft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. The plan's the reason you get these wonderful, really costly-looking Clippercraft suits at only $40 and $45. Spring top coats in fine coverts and worsted gabardine at only $40 and $45. And sport jackets at only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clipper Craft in your suits, top coats, and sport jackets. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to our story. Night has fallen. It is past midnight. Holmes and Watson are hiding in an upstairs closet. I say, Holmes, why are we sitting here in this darkened linen closet? It's past midnight and my legs are getting cramped. If you must wait for an accident to happen, why not go back to our room where we can be at least comfortable? Impossible, Watson. This closet has a much better view of Mrs. Cheltenham's door and the two corridors which approach it at right angles. Uh, just what you think is going to happen. I don't know, confound it. Wait a minute. I hear steps on the front stairs. Sounds like the Major. Because his steps are unsteady and you know he's been drinking. It doesn't take a genius to deduce that, Holmes. I didn't say it did. Quiet. He's turned the corner. Here he comes. He's stopped at his wife's door. His hand's on the knob. No. He's changed his mind. He's gone on down the back corridor. Holmes, did you notice that bulge in his pocket? It could have been a revolver, you know. Or a bottle. Now everyone's turned in except the South American. The professor went upstairs directly after dinner. Mrs. Cheltenham and our host retired after we finished the third rubber of whist. Well, that was nearly two hours ago. What arouses my curiosity, Watson, is why the major retired down the back corridor. Well, maybe he's gone to visit Professor Philpotts or Sir Timothy. They both have rooms somewhere along there. Maybe he felt hungry and slipped down the back stairs to the larder. Well, I could do with a bit of cold chicken myself, come to think of it. Is that uh, half past twelve or one o'clock, do you suppose? What difference does it make? Hello. Someone else is sneaking up the front stairs. I can't hear a thing. He's tiptoeing. Yes. Here he comes. It's Senor Vendrigo. Holmes. I don't like the look on his face. There's something evil, like a prowling beast. Yes. He's stopping at Mrs. Cheltenham's door. 
He's looking up and down both corridors. Now he's taken hold of the doorknob. <laughs> Great Scott, Holmes, what happened? Bindley goes pinned to the door, something sticking out of his back. It's a golden arrow. Shut up, Watson, and come along. What's happened? What's happened? Someone shot Vendrigo with one of the Major's arrows. He's dead. Killed instantly. The arrow is embedded over two inches in the solid oak of the door. Uh, could only have been my bow that made that shot. Clean through the man and into the door. <laughs> only an arrow from my bow has that strong a flight. It's gone home. The arrow's gone home. Hee <laughs> hee. Stop that laughing, you fool. You're drunk. That is not laughing, Dr. Watson. It's the word of call of all archers from time immemorial. He-he! Better let Dr. Watson give you another cup of coffee, Mrs. Cheltenham. I don't need it. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'm glad my husband shot that brute. I knew he wouldn't let him come into my room. Now, now, my dear, we all realize there are extenuating circumstances. I'm sure the law won't punish him too severely. I I hope you understand. I, uh, that is, I, I had to give him in charge. I understand. All the same, Sir Timothy, I think you were just a bit hasty in handing him over to that fool of a constable. What do you mean? It should have been obvious to a child of four that Major Cheltenham was too drunk to have made that need a shot. Straight through the heart, wasn't it, Watson? But uh, it was his bow that was used. We found it at the end of the corridor. He's the only one that has the strength to draw it. Besides, he didn't deny he'd killed Vendrigo. Again, he probably was too hazy to realize exactly what did happen. Oh, but here comes Phil Potts. His cane sounds unusually staccato this morning. Good morning, Professor. You don't look as though you'd had too good a night. I must admit that I didn't shut my eyes after I awakened and was informed what happened. But you did manage to sleep through the murder. Yes. Can't explain it. Usually such a light sleeper. Probably all that sun and fresh air yesterday. No, I won't have an egg, thank you. Just coffee. Can't face an egg this morning. Yes. Committing a murder does take away the appetite. Doesn't it, Professor? I... What do you mean? I'm suggesting that you were the man who shot Senor Vendrigo at five minutes past one last night. With the Major's famous bow? I believe it's agreed that that was the weapon used, Mr. Holmes. Indubitably. Then don't you see how ridiculous your statement is? That bow requires 70 pounds to draw it. I'm physically incapable of more than 45 pounds. Using the ordinary or manual method, yes. However, there are other ways of exerting pressure besides pulling. What are you suggesting? It doesn't take an expert physicist like yourself to understand the value of leverage. Well, what good would that do? I suggest that the professor's cane would make an excellent lever. He has a very handy small crook at the upper end. By hooking that through the string and using, shall we say, the back of a chair or even the handle of your bedroom door as a fulcrum, all the professor had to do was press the weight of his body down against the cane and the arrow could easily be drawn to the point and shot through a partly open door. A very interesting theory, my dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes. But it takes more than theory to hang a man. It takes evidence. I think I can provide that as well, Professor. You see, I noticed the drops of blood trickling down onto your left wrist when the constable was questioning you last night. Nasty gash, isn't it? Don't you think you'd be wise to let Dr. Watson dress it? Uh, what's all this about, Holmes? I, I admit I don't understand a word you're saying. Professor Philpott's does, however... Grab his arm, Watson, his bow arm. Right here. No, 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 you don't. Oh! Sorry. Orders. There you are, Holmes. Old jiu-jitsu comes in handy now and then. Now, hmm. if you'll roll up your left sleeve. Oh, no sooner, no sooner said than... By but... Jove, I see. That is a nasty gash. Yes. Professor Philpott's made only one mistake in his little plan to get rid of the two men he hated most in the world. The senior to whom he owed money and the Major, who was always bully-ragging him. His mistake was that last night he forgot to put on a leather arm guard to shield his left arm from the stroke of a string after the discharge of the arrow. Any bow as powerful as the Major's has a particularly vicious backlash, don't you know. Well, 
Dr. Watson. That was certainly an exciting and instructive adventure. You know, I feel I know almost as much about archery as Robin Hood. Well, that's not so vital, Mr. Harris. The important thing is you know all about clipper craft clothes. Well, thank you, Dr. Watson. I hope you profit as much from my dissertations on that subject as I do from yours. <laughs> Wait till you see me next week in my new Easter suit. I, I think you'll agree I'm your prized pupil. And now, Dr. Watson, how about a word about next week's story? With pleasure, Mr. Harris. Next week, I'm going to tell you how I chased all over Europe trying to find a wealthy and lovely lady who had mysteriously disappeared, and how Holmes stepped in at the last moment and prevented a double funeral. We always call the story the disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. The dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't...